Chapter 1 of The History of the Church of Christ, Century 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Church of Christ, Century 3, by Joseph Milner. Irenaeus. Before we proceed to the orderly course of events in this century, it may be convenient to continue the account of authors belonging to the last, whose deaths happened within this. We meet with four celebrated men of this description, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Pantinus, and Clement of Alexandria. Of Irenaeus it were to be wished we had a more copious account. The place of his birth is quite uncertain. His name, however, points him out to be a Grecian. His instructors in Christianity were Papias, Bishop of Hierapolis, and the renowned Polycarp. The former is generally allowed to have been a man of real sanctity, but of slender capacity. He, as well as Polycarp, had been a disciple of St. John, and with all the imbecility of judgment which is ascribed to him, might, under God, have been of signal service to Irenaeus. But the instructions of Polycarp seem to have made the deepest impressions on his mind from early life. The Church of Lyon, as we have seen, was a daughter of the Church of Smyrna, or of the other neighbouring churches. Pothinus must have been a Greek, as well as Irenaeus, who, as presbyter, assisted the venerable prelate in his old age. His concern in writing the account of the martyrdoms of Lyon has been already mentioned. After the death of Pothinus, about the year 169, he succeeded him. Never was any pastor more severely tried by a tempestuous scene. Violent persecution without and subtle heresies within called for the exertion at once of consummate dexterity and of magnanimous resolution. Irenaeus was favoured with a large measure of both and weathered out the storm. But heresy proved a more constant enemy than persecution. The multiplication of it in endless refinements induced him to write his books against heresies, which must have been at that time a very seasonable work. His vigour and charity also in composing the insignificant disputes about Easter have been noted. The beginning of the third century was marked with the persecution under Septimus Severus, the successor of Julian. He himself had most probably directed the persecution at Lyon, in which Pothinus suffered, and when he began to persecute as emperor, he would naturally recall the idea of Lyon and of the persecution in which he had so large a share. Gregory of Tours and the ancient martyrologists inform us that after several torments Irenaeus was put to death, and together with him almost all the Christians of that populous city, whose numbers could not be reckoned, so that the streets of Lyon flowed with the blood of Christians. We may easily allow that this is a rhetorical exaggeration, yet I see no reason with some to deny the truth of this second persecution at Lyon, and of Irenaeus suffering martyrdom under it. Gregory of Tours is not the best authority, but there is no circumstance of improbability here. The silence of Eusebius affords no argument to the contrary, because he is far from relating the deaths of all celebrated Christians. Of those in the West, particularly, he is by no means copious in his narrative, and the natural cruelty of Severus, added to his former connection with Lyon, gives to the fact a strong degree of credibility. The labours of Irenaeus in Gaul were doubtless of the most solid utility, nor is it a small instance of the humility and charity of this great man, accurately versed as he was in Grecian literature, that he took pains to learn the barbarous dialect of Gaul, conformed himself to the rustic manners of an illiterate people, and renounced the politeness and elegant traits of his own country for the love of souls. Rare fruit of Christian charity, and highly worthy the attention of pastors in an age like this, in which so many undertake to preach Christianity, and yet distinguish themselves in anything rather than in what peculiarly belongs to their office. His book of heresies is nearly the whole of his writings that have escaped the injuries of time. His assiduity and penetration are equally remarkable in analysing and dissecting all the fanciful schemes with which heretics had disgraced the Christian name. It is easy to see that his views of the gospel are in the same style as those of Justin, whom he quotes, and with whose works he appears to have been acquainted. Like him, he is silent, or nearly so, on the election of grace, which, from the instructors of his early age, he must often have heard, and like him, he defends the Arminian notion of free will, and by similar arguments. 
His philosophy seems to have had the same influence on his mind, to darken some truths of scripture and to mix the doctrine of Christ with some human inventions. There is not much of pathetic, practical, or experimental religion in the work. The author's plan, which led him to keep up a constant attention to speculative errors, did not admit it. Yet there is everywhere so serious and grave a spirit, and now and then such displays of godliness as show him very capable of writing what might have been singularly useful to the church in all ages. He makes a strong use of the argument of tradition in support of the apostolical doctrine against the novel heresies. His acquaintance with primitive Christians gave him a great right to press this argument, and the force of it in a certain degree is obvious. The papists have perverted these declarations of his into an argument in favour of their church. But what may not men pervert and abuse? The reasonable use of tradition, as a collateral proof of Christian doctrines, is not hence invalidated. What he observes here concerning the barbarous nations is remarkable. Quote, if there was any doubt concerning the least article, ought we not to have recourse to the most ancient churches where the apostles lived? But what would it signify if the apostles had left us no writings? Ought we not to follow the tradition which they left to those with whom they committed the care of the churches? It is what several barbarous nations observe, who believe in Jesus without paper or ink, having the doctrine of salvation written on their hearts by the Holy Ghost, and faithfully keeping up to ancient tradition concerning one God the Creator and His Son Jesus Christ. Those who have received this faith without Scripture are barbarians as to their manner of speaking compared with us, but as to their sentiments and behaviour they are very wise and very agreeable to God, persevering in the practice of justice and charity. And if anyone should preach to them in their language what the heretics have invented, they would immediately stop their ears and flee far off, and would not even hear those blasphemies. End quote. Thus it appears that, to the illiterate barbarians, tradition, though a poor substitute, supplied the place of the written word. We may not, however, suppose that their faith was blind and implicit. Our author gives a strong testimony of their godliness, and those of them who were taught indeed of God would have in themselves the strongest and most reasonable of all proofs of the divinity of their religion, of the Holy Spirit's influences, and of the native energy of divine truth on the hearts and lives of very illiterate men, we seem to have here a very valuable testimony. There is no new thing under the sun. The artifices of the Valentinians in alluring men to their communion are specimens of the wiles of heretics in all ages. Quote, in public they use alluring discourses because of the common Christians, as they call those who wear the Christian name in general, and to entice them to come often, they pretend to preach like us, and complain that, though their doctrine be the same as ours, we abstain from their communion and call them heretics. When they have seduced any from the faith by their disputes, and made them willing to comply with them, they begin to open their mysteries. End quote. He doubtless agrees with all the primitive Christians in the doctrine of the Trinity, and makes use of the 45th Psalm particularly to prove the deity of Jesus Christ. He is no less clear and sound in his views of the Incarnation, and in general, notwithstanding some philosophical adulterations, he certainly maintained all the essentials of the Gospel. The use of the mystic union between the Godhead and manhood of Christ in the work of redemption, and in general the fall and the recovery, are scarce held out more instructively by any writer of antiquity. The learned reader, who has a taste for what is peculiarly Christian, will not be displeased to see a few quotations. Quote, he united man to God, for if man had not overcome the adversary of man, the enemy could not have been legally conquered. And again, if God had not granted salvation, we should not have been put into firm possession of it. And if man had not been united to God, he could not have been a partaker of immortality. It behoved then the mediator between God and man, by his affinity with both, to bring both into agreement with each other. The all-powerful word of God, and perfect in righteousness, justly set himself against the apostasy, redeeming his own property from him, Satan, not by violence, as he bore rule over us from the beginning, insatiably making repine of what was not his own, but the Lord redeeming us with his own blood, and giving his life for our life, and his flesh for our flesh, effected our salvation. End quote. He beautifully expresses our recovery by a recapitulation in Christ. Quote, 
Our Lord would not have gathered up these things in himself, had he not been made flesh and blood according to the original creation of man, saving in himself in the end what had perished in the beginning of Adam. He therefore had flesh and blood not of another kind, but, gathering into himself the very original creation of the Father, he sought that which was lost. End quote. Undoubtedly, the intelligent scriptural reader will recollect the divine reasoning of the author to the Hebrews very similar to all this, and those who see how well the views of Irenaeus are supported by him will know how to judge of the opinions of those who call this scholastic theology, will see how accurately the primitive fathers understood and maintained the doctrines now deemed fanatical, and will observe the propriety of being zealous for Christian peculiarities. One short quotation shall conclude this account of the book of heresies. Quote, the word of God, Jesus Christ, on account of his immense love, became what we are, that he might make us what he is. End quote. Book 5, Preface. Of the few fragments of this author, there is nothing that seems to deserve any particular attention except that of an epistle to Florinus, whom he had known in early life, and of whom he had hoped better things than those into which he was afterwards seduced. Quote, These doctrines, says he, those who were presbyters before us, those who had walked with the apostles, did not deliver to you. For I saw you, when I was a boy, in the lower Asia, with Polycarp, carrying a very splendid appearance in the emperor's service, and desirous of being approved of by him. For I choose rather to mention things that happened at that time than facts of a later date, for the instructions of our childhood, growing with our youth, adhere to us most closely, so that I can mention the very spot in which Polycarp sat and expounded, and his coming in and going out, and the very manner of his life and the figure of his body, and the sermons which he preached to the multitude, and how he described to us his converse with John, and with the rest of those who had seen the Lord, how he related to us their expressions, and what things he had heard from them of the Lord, and of his miracles and of his doctrine." As Polycarp had received from the eyewitnesses of the word of life, he told us all things agreeable to the scriptures. These things then, through the mercy of God visiting me, I heard with seriousness, writing them not on paper but on my heart, and ever since, through the grace of God, I have a genuine remembrance of them, and I can witness before God that, if that blessed apostolical presbyter had heard any such thing, he would have cried out and stopped his ears, and, in his usual manner, have said, O oh, good God! To what times hast thou reserved me that I should endure these things? And he would immediately have fled from the place in which he had heard such doctrines. End quote. How superficially numbers in this, which calls itself an enlightened age, are content to think, appears from the satisfaction with which two confused lines of a poet, great indeed as a poet but very ill informed in religion, are constantly quoted. For modes of faith let graceless zealots fight. His can't be wrong whose life is in the right. Those to whom these lines appear full of oracular wisdom may call Irenaeus a graceless zealot if they please, but those in every age to whom evangelical truth appears of real importance will regret that so little of this zeal, in earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered to the saints, appears in our times because they think it absolutely necessary to preserve even practical Christianity in the world. End of chapter 1。This whole region, once the scene of Carthaginian greatness, abounded with Christians in the second century, though of the manner of the introduction of the gospel and of the proceedings of its first planters we have no account. In the latter part of the second and in the former part of the third century, there flourished at Carthage the famous Tertullian, the first Latin writer of the church whose works are come down to us. Yet, were it not for some light which he throws on the state of Christianity in his own times, he would not deserve to be distinctly noticed. I have seldom seen so large a collection of treatises, all professedly on Christian subjects, containing so little matter of useful instruction. The very first tract in the volume, that De Palio, shows the littleness of his views. The dress of the Roman toga offended him. He exhorted Christians to wear the palium, 
a more vulgar and rusty kind of garment, as more worthy of their religion. All his writings betray the same sour, monastic, harsh, and severe turn of mind. Touch not, taste not, handle not, might seem to have been the maxims of his religious conduct. The apostle there warns Christians against will-worship and voluntary humility, and shows that while the flesh outwardly appears to be humbled, it is inwardly puffed up by these things, and induced to forsake the head, Christ Jesus. The subtle spirit of self-righteousness may, in all likelihood, in Tertullian's time, have very much overspread the African church, or his writings would scarce have rendered him so celebrated amongst them. All his religious ideas seem tinged deeply with the same train of thinking. His treatise of repentance is meagre and dismal throughout, and while it enlarges on outward things and recommends the rolling of our bodies before the priests, is very slight on the essential spirit of repentance itself. A Christian soldier had refused to wear a crown of laurel which his commander had given him with the rest of the regiment, was punished for it and blamed by the Christians of those times because his conduct had a tendency to irritate needlessly the reigning powers. I am apt to think that he might have worn it as innocently as St. Paul committed himself to a ship whose sign was Castor and Pollux. It was a merely military ornament, and could no more be said to have any connection with idolatry than almost every custom of civil life must have had at the time. The apostle, I think, would have accused the soldier of disobedience to his lawful superiors, and might have referred Christians to his own determination in the case of eating things sacrificed to idols. Eat of such things as are set before you, asking no questions for conscience' sake. But Tertullian decides on the other side of the question, and applauds the disobedience of the soldier. His reasons are dishonourable to his understanding. He owns that there is no scripture to be found against compliance in this case. Tradition, he thinks, a sufficient reason for contumacy, and then mentions some traditional customs maintained in the African churches, among which the very frequent signing of themselves with the sign of the cross is one. Superstition had made, it seems, deep inroads into Africa. It was rather an unpolished region, and much inferior to Italy in point of civilization. Satan's temptations are suited to tempers and situations, but surely it was not by superstitious practices that the glad tidings of salvation had been first introduced into Africa. There must have been a deep decline. One of the strongest proofs that the comparative value of the Christian religion in countries is not to be estimated by their distance from the apostolic age is deducible from the times of Tertullian. If I be spared to proceed, we shall see Africa exhibit a much more pleasing spectacle. All this man's casuistical determinations savour of the same asperity. He approved not of flight in persecution, in direct contradiction to our Saviour's determination. He takes notice of a martyr named Rutilius, who, having fled several times from place to place to avoid persecution, and saved himself by money, was suddenly seized and carried before the governor when he thought himself secure, and finished his martyrdom by fire, having undergone several torments. I had much rather quote Tertullian as an historian than as a reasoner. We may make useful reflections on this fact, without concerning ourselves with his inferences. He disapproved also, at least after his separation from the church, of second marriages, and called them adultery. For as he does not appear to have been much acquainted with the depravity, misery, and imbecility of human nature, most of his precepts carry rather a stoical than a Christian appearance. He was, in his own nature, doubtless a man of great natural fortitude, and most probably of great strength of body, as he lived to an advanced age. He seems not to have had anything of that sympathy with the weak which forms so beautiful a part of the Christian character. The church in general was not severe enough according to his ideas of discipline, yet, it must be confessed, they were by no means wanting in that respect. In our licentious times, when sloth and dissipation, the very opposite extremes to those which pleased the genius of Tertullian, abound, all who love the ways of Christ regret that discipline is at so low an ebb. The Montanists, whose austerities were extreme and whose enthusiasm was real, seduced at length our severe African, and he not only joined them, but wrote in their defence, and treated the body of Christians from whom he separated with much contempt. I have the satisfaction as yet to find that the largest body of Christians, so called, was the soundest. Tertullian, we are told, resented some treatment which he met with from some Roman Christians. 
but of this I know no particulars, only this was said to have influenced his secession from the church. Error, however, is very inconstant. He, in a great measure, left the Montanists afterwards and formed a sect of his own called Tertullianists, who continued in Africa till Augustine's time, by whose labours their existence as a sect was brought to a close. The character of Tertullian was very strongly delineated by himself in his own writings. Had there been anything peculiarly Christian which he had learnt from the Montanists, his works would have shown it. But they are all of the same uniformly sable complexion, nor does he seem to have improved in anything but in severity. It is but an unpleasing picture which truth has obliged me to draw of this man. One agreeable circumstance attending his history is this, that it was not on account of any fundamental error in principle that he left the church. The faith of Christ and the practice of real godliness was in it, beyond doubt, to a much greater degree than in the heretics of those times, if it be allowed and hoped, as it ought to be, that some good persons might be amongst them. The abilities of Tertullian as an orator and a scholar are far from being contemptible, and have doubtless given him a reputation to which his theological knowledge by no means entitles him. Yet the man seems always in good earnest, and therefore much more estimable than thousands who would take a pleasure in despising him, while they themselves are covered with profaneness. It is not for us to condemn, after all, a man who certainly honoured Christ, defended several fundamental Christian doctrines, took large pains in supporting what he took to be true religion, and ever meant to serve God. He might even, in his latter days, if not before, be favoured with that humbling and transforming knowledge of Christ, which might fit him for the enjoyment of the kingdom of heaven. Superstition and enthusiasm are compatible with real godliness. Profaneness is not so. It were to be wished that those who are most interested in this remark were more disposed to attend to it than they generally are. In his treatise against Praxius, he appears to have very clear and sound views of the doctrine of the Trinity. He speaks of the Trinity in unity, quote, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, yet one God, end quote. He speaks of the Lord Jesus as both God and man, Son of man and Son of God, and called Jesus Christ. He speaks also of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Sanctifier of the faith of those who believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He observes that this rule of faith had obtained from the beginning of the Gospel, antecedent to any former heretics, much more to Praxius, who was of yesterday. To those who know the primitive times, I need not say that Tertullian's own heresy lessens not the credibility of his testimony to these things. His Montanism altered not in the least his view of the Trinity. The heresy of Praxius consisted in making the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all one and the same. The distinction of persons in the Godhead was denied by him. This is no other than what has since been better known by the name of Sabellianism. No doubt the mystery of the Trinity is this way removed. But then what becomes of the divine revelation itself? All attempts to subvert the faith of Scripture on this subject labour under the same error, a desire to accommodate divine truths which require the submission of our reason to our narrow faculties, and to strip the Almighty of his attribute of incomprehensible. Tertullian informs us that Praxius first brought this evil from Asia into the Roman world and seduced many, but at last was confuted and silenced by, quote, an instrument whom God pleased to make use of, end quote, a modest periphrasis, I apprehend, for himself, and the evil seemed eradicated. Even Praxius himself had the ingenuousness to retract his mistake, and his handwriting still remains among the natural men, so Tertullian calls the Christians in general form from whom he had separated, and he no more revived his heresy. Others revived it afterwards, which occasioned the treatise whence I have extracted this brief account. In his Apology, the eloquence and argumentative powers of our author appear most conspicuous. He refutes in the usual manner the stale, heathen calumnies of Christians feeding on infants. The remarkable power of Christians over demons he states in the same manner as various of the fathers have done. He appeals to the consciences of mankind, and a common practice even among idolaters founded on it as a proof of the unity of the Godhead. His description is remarkably striking. Quote, what God hath given, end quote, was an universal mode of speaking. In appealing to God to say, quote, God sees it, and I recommend to God, and God will restore to me, O testimony of the soul, naturally in favour of Christianity, when men seriously pronounce these words, they look not to the capital, but to heaven. 
for the soul knows the seat of the living God whence it had its own origin. End quote. I scarce remember a finer observation made by any author in favour both of the natural voice of conscience and of the patriarchal tradition of true religion, for both may fairly be supposed concerned in the support of this practice. It shows how difficult it was for Satan to eradicate entirely every vestige of truth, and every classical reader may observe how common it is for the pagan writers to speak of God as one when they are most serious, and instantly to slide into the vulgar polytheism when they begin to trifle. It is a beautiful view of the manners and spirit of the Christians of his time which this apology exhibits. A few quotations may illustrate the subject and serve to show what real Christianity does for men. Quote, we pray, says he, for the safety of the emperors to the eternal God, the true and living God, whom emperors themselves would desire to be propitious to them above all others who are called gods. We, looking up to heaven with outstretched hands, because they are harmless, with naked head, because we are not ashamed, without a prompter, because we pray from the heart, constantly pray for all emperors, that they may have a long life, a secure empire, a safe house, strong armies, a faithful senate, a well-moralized people, a quiet state of the world, whatever Caesar would wish for himself in his public and private capacity. I cannot solicit these things from any other than from him from whom I know I shall obtain them, because he alone can do these things, and I am he who may expect them of him, being his servant, who worship him alone, and lose my life for his service. Thus then let the hooves pierce us, while our hands are stretched out to God, let crosses suspend us, let fires consume us, let swords pierce our breasts, let wild beasts trample on us, a praying Christian is in a frame for enduring anything. Act in this manner, ye generous rulers, kill the soul who supplicates God for the emperor. Were we disposed to return evil for evil, it were easy for us to revenge the injuries which we sustain. But God forbid that his people should vindicate themselves by human fire, or be reluctant to endure that by which their sincerity is evinced. Were we disposed to act the part, I will not say of secret assassins, but of open enemies, should we want forces and numbers? Are we not dispersed throughout the world? It is true we are but of yesterday, and yet we have filled all your places, cities, islands, castles, boroughs, councils, camps, courts, palaces, senate, and forum. We leave you only your temples. To what war should we not be ready and well prepared, even though unequal in numbers, we who die with so much pleasure, were it not that our religion requires us rather to suffer death than to inflict it? Were we to make a general secession from your dominions, you would be astonished at your solicitude. We are dead to all ideas of honour and dignity. Nothing is more foreign to us than political concerns. The whole world is our republic. We are a body united in one bond of religion, discipline and hope. We meet in our assemblies for prayer. We are compelled to have recourse to the divine oracles for caution and recollection on all occasions. We nourish our faith by the word of God, we erect our hope, we fix our confidence, we strengthen our discipline by repeatedly inculcating precepts, exhortations, corrections, and excommunication when it is needful. This last, as being in the sight of God, is of great weight, and is a strong prejudice of the future judgment, if any behave in so scandalous a manner as to be debarred from holy communion. Those who preside among us are elderly persons, not distinguished for opulence but worthy of character. Everyone pays into the public chest once a month, or when he pleases, and according to his ability and inclination, for there is no compulsion. These are, as it were, the deposits of piety. Hence we relieve and bury the needy, support orphans and decrepit persons, those who have suffered shipwreck, and those who, for the word of God, are condemned to the mines or imprisonment. This very charity of ours has caused us to be noted by some. See, say they, how they love one another. End quote. He afterwards takes notice of the extreme readiness with which Christians paid the taxes to government in opposition to the spirit of fraud and deceit with which so many acted in these matters. But I must not enlarge. The reader may form an idea of the purity, integrity, heavenly mindedness and passiveness under injuries for which the first Christians were so justly renowned. The effect of that glorious effusion of the divine spirit in external things was the production of this meek and charitable conduct, and every evidence that can be desired is given to evince the truth of this account. The confession of enemies unites here with the relations of friends. 
I shall close the account of Tertullian with a few facts taken from his address to Scapula, the persecuting governor, without any remarks. Quote, Claudius Herminianus, in Cappadocia, vexed because his wife was become a Christian, cruelly treated the Christians. Being eaten with worms, let no one, says he, know it, lest the Christians rejoice. Afterwards, knowing his error, because he had, by force of torments, caused some to abjure Christianity, he died almost a Christian himself. Senecius Severus, at Thistrum, himself taught Christians how to answer so as to obtain their dismission. Asper, having moderately tortured a person, and brought him to submit, would not compel him to sacrifice, having before declared among the advocates that he was vexed that he had anything to do with such a cause. The Emperor Severus himself was in one part of his life kind to the Christians. Proculus, a Christian, had cured him of a disorder by the use of oil, and he kept him in his palace to his death, a person well known to Caracalla, the successor of Severus, whose nurse was a Christian. Even persons of the highest quality of both sexes Severus protected and commended openly against the raging populace. Arius Antoninus, in Asia, persecuting vehemently all the Christians of the state, presented himself in a body, and he, leading a few to death, dismissed the rest, saying, If you want to die, wretched men, you may find precipices and halters. End, quote. End of chapter 2《三十六》的《历史》，《教会》的《基督》，《历史》，由约瑟夫·米勒。这《历史》的发行是公开的。潘蒂纳斯，一个著名的城市，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心，位于城市的中心
appear to me much more substantial proofs of his godliness than his catechetical employments at Alexandria could be. The former would oblige him to attend chiefly to Christian fundamentals and could afford little opportunity of indulging the philosophic spirit. We are told he found in India the Gospel of St. Matthew, which had been carried thither by the Apostle Bartholomew, who had first preached amongst them. I mention this, but much doubt the truth of it. Of the particular success of his labours we have no account, but he lived to return to Alexandria and resumed his catechetical office. He died not long after the commencement of the third century. He used to instruct more by word than by writing. Some commentaries on the scriptures are all that are mentioned as his, and of them not a fragment remains. Candor, I think, requires us to look on him as a sincere Christian, whose fruitfulness was yet very much checked by that very philosophy for which Eusebius so highly commends him. A blasting wind it surely was, but it did not entirely destroy Christian vegetation in all whom it infected. Behold now his disciple, from whom we may see more clearly what the master was, because we have more evidence concerning him. But the Christian reader is prepared to expect a declension in divine things in the state of the church before us. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of the History of the Church of Christ by Isaac Milner, Century Three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Clemens Alexandrinus. He was, by his own confession, a scholar of Pantinus and of the same philosophical cast of mind. He was of the eclectic sect. It is sincerely to be regretted that Clemens had any acquaintance with them. So far as he mixed Christianity with their notions, so far he tarnished it, and by his zeal, activity, learning, and reputation, at the same time that he taught many, he clouded the light of the gospel among them, who yet in fundamentals were profited by his instruction. Hear how he describes himself. Quote, I espouse not this or that philosophy, not the Stoic, nor the Platonic, nor the Epicurean, nor that of Aristotle, but whatever any of these sects had said, that was fit and just, that taught righteousness with a divine and religious knowledge, selecting all this I call it philosophy. End quote. It is evident from hence that from the time that this philosophizing spirit had entered into the church, through Justin, it had procured to itself a respect to which its merit no way entitled it. What is there even of good ethics in all the philosophers which Clement might not have learnt in the New Testament, and much more perfectly and without the danger of pernicious adulterations? Doubtless many valuable purposes are answered by an acquaintance with these writers, but to dictate to us in religion, Clement should have known, was no part of their business, that the world by wisdom knew not God, and beware of philosophy. The Christian world was now gradually learning to neglect these cautions, and divine knowledge is certainly much too high a term for any human doctrine whatever. He succeeded his master Pantinus in the catechetical school, and under him were bred the famous Origen, Alexander, Bishop of Jerusalem, and other eminent men. I am sorry to hear him say that, as the husbandman first waters the soil and then casts in his seed, the Egyptian ideas of agriculture are plainly before him, so the notions he derived out of the writings of the Gentiles served first to water and soften the earthy parts of the soul, that the spiritual seed might be the better cast in and take vital root in the minds of men. This certainly is not a Christian dialect, nor did the apostles place Gentile philosophy in the foundation, nor believe at all that it would assist in raising the superstructure of Christianity. On the contrary, they looked on philosophical religion as so much rubbish, but in all ages the blandishments of mere reason deceive us. Vain man would be wise." Besides the office of catechist, he was made presbyter in the Church of Alexandria. During the persecution under Severus, most probably, he visited the East and had a peculiar intimacy with Alexander, Bishop of Jerusalem. He appears to have been a holy man and suffered imprisonment for the faith, and in that situation he wrote a letter to the Church of Antioch, which was carried by Clemens. Something of the spirit of Christianity appears in the fragment of this letter. Quote, Alexander a servant of God and a prisoner of Jesus Christ, to the blessed church at Antioch, in the Lord, greeting. Our Lord has made my bonds in this time of my imprisonment, 
light and easy to me, while I understood that Asclepiades, a person admirably qualified by his eminency in the faith, was by divine providence become bishop of your holy church at Antioch. These letters, brethren, I have sent by Clements, the blessed presbyter, a man of approved integrity, whom ye both do already and shall still further know, who, having been here with us according to the good will of God, hath much established and augmented the church of Christ. End quote. From Jerusalem, Clements went to Antioch and afterwards returned to his charge at Alexandria. The time of his death is uncertain. The philosophy to which he was so much addicted would naturally darken his views of some of the most precious truths of the gospel, particularly the doctrine of justification by faith in Jesus Christ will always suffer from this connection, the philosophers knowing no righteousness but what is infused. There is doubtless good proof of the solid piety of this learned man. Little is known of his life, but a more complete idea may be formed of his religious taste and spirit by a few quotations. His Exhortations to the Gentiles is a discourse written to convert the pagans from their religion and persuade them to embrace that of Jesus Christ. In the beginning of it he shows what difference there is between the design of Jesus Christ and that of Orpheus and those ancient musicians who were the first authors of idolatry by telling us that these drew in men by their singing and the sweetness of their music to render them miserable slaves to idols and to make them like the very beasts and stocks and stones whom they adored. Quote, Whereas Jesus Christ, who from all eternity was the word of God, always had a compassionate tenderness for men, and at last took their nature upon him to free them from the slavery of demons, to open the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf, to guide their paths in the way of righteousness, to deliver them from death and hell, and to bestow on them everlasting life, and to put them into a capacity of living an heavenly life here upon earth, and lastly that God made himself man to teach man to be like unto God. End quote. He shows them that eternal salvation cannot otherwise be expected, and that eternal torments cannot otherwise be avoided but by believing in Jesus Christ, and by living conformably to his laws. Quote, if you were permitted, says he, to purchase eternal salvation, what would you not give for it? And now you may obtain it by faith and love. There is nothing can hinder you from acquiring it, neither poverty nor misery nor old age nor any state of life. Believe, therefore, in one God, who is God and man, and receive eternal salvation for a recompense. Seek God, and you shall live forever. End quote. The candid Christian sees that the fundamentals of the gospel are here laid down, as one might expect in a discourse of this nature, though not in the clearest and happiest manner. In his pedagogue, he describes the word incarnate as the instructor of men, that he performs his functions by forgiving our sins as he is God and by instructing us as he is man with great sweetness and love, though he equally instructs all sorts because all are children in one sense. Yet we must not look on Christian doctrines as childish and contemptible. On the contrary, the equality of children which they receive in baptism renders them perfect in the knowledge of divine things by delivering them from sins by grace and enlightening them with the illumination of faith, so that we are at the same time both children and men, and the milk with which we are nourished, being both the word and will of God, is very solid and substantial nourishment. Here seem to be some of his best ideas of Christianity. In his Stramata he speaks with his usual partiality in favour of philosophy, and shows the effect his regard for it had on his own mind by saying that faith is God's gift, but so as to depend on our own free will. His account of the perfect Christian, whom he calls Gnosticus, is sullied by stoical rhapsodies. Quote, he is never angry, and nothing affects him, because he always loves God. He will look upon that time as lost, which he is obliged to spend in receiving nourishment, he is employed in continual and mental prayer. He is mild, affable, patient, but at the same time so rigid as not to be tempted, neither giving way to pleasure nor pain. End quote. But enough of these views. Pseudo religionists have since his time dealt largely in these reveries, so inconsistent with that humbling sense of imbecility and that sincere conflict against the sin of our nature, which is peculiarly Christian. In truth, if his knowledge of Christian doctrine was defective anywhere, it lay in the point of original sin. Of this his philosophers knew nothing aright, and it must be owned he speaks of it in a confused manner at least. 
On the whole, such is the baneful effect of mixing things which will not incorporate human inventions with Christian truth, that this writer, learned, laborious, and ingenious as he was, in the subject of real Christian knowledge, and in the experience of divine things, according to the light of Scripture, may seem to be far exceeded by many obscure and illiterate persons of this day. His being a truly pious person, in the main, is no objection to this account. It only demonstrates, in a stronger manner, the danger of admitting the pestilent spirit of human self-sufficiency to dictate in Christian religion. End of chapter 4《Church of Christ: Century Three》Chapter Five of the History of the Church of Christ, Century Three by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The affairs of the Church during the reigns of Severus and Caracalla. The lives of the four persons we have reviewed seem proper to be prefixed to the general history of the third century, partly because they were studious men, not very much connected with the public state of Christianity. And partly because their views and taste in religion being known may prepare the reader to expect that unhappy mixture of philosophical self-righteousness and superstition, which much clouded the light of the gospel in this century. Severus, though in his younger days it should seem a bitter persecutor of Christians at Lyon, was yet, through the influence of the kindness which he received from Proculus, favorably disposed towards the Christians. It was not till about the tenth year of his reign, which falls in with the year two hundred and two, that his native ferocity of temper break out afresh in kindling a very severe persecution against the Christians. He was just returned victorious from the east against Niger, and the pride of prosperity induced him to forbid the propagation of the gospel. Christians still thought it right to obey God rather than man. Severus would be obeyed and exercised the usual cruelties. The persecution raged everywhere, but particularly at Alexandria. From various parts of Egypt, the Christians were brought thither to suffer and expired in torments. Of this number was Leonidas, father of the famous Origen. He was beheaded and left his son very young. Our author selects from the letters and narrations of his friends some account of him. Which it will be proper to take from his own narrative, Laetus was at that time governor of Alexandria and the rest of Egypt, and Demetrius was just elected bishop of the Christians in that city. Great numbers now suffered martyrdom. Young Origen panted for the honor, and needlessly exposed himself to danger. His mother checked his imprudent zeal at first by earnest entreaties, but perceiving that he still was bent on suffering with his father, who at that time was closely confined. She very properly exercised her motherly authority by confining him to the house and hiding from him all his apparel. The vehement spirit of Origen prompted him, when he could do nothing else, to write a letter to his father, in which he thus exhorted him: "Father, faint not, and do not be concerned on our account." He had been carefully trained in the study of the scriptures under the inspection of his pious father, who, together with the study of the liberal arts, had particularly superintended this most important part of education. Even before he suffered him to be exercised in profane learning, he instructed him in scripture and gave him daily a certain task out of it to repeat. The penetrating genius of Origen led him, in the course of his employment, to investigate the sense of scripture and to ask his father questions beyond his ability to solve. The father checked his curiosity, reminded him of his imbecility, and admonished him to be content with the plain grammatical sense of Scripture, which obviously offered itself. But inwardly rejoiced, it seems, that God had given him such a son. And it would not have been amiss had he rejoiced with trembling. Perhaps he did so. And Origen's early loss of such a father, who probably was more simple in Christian faith and piety than he himself ever was, might be an extreme disadvantage to him. Youths of great and uncommon parts, accompanied, as is generally the case, with much ambition and boundless curiosity, have often been the instruments of Satan in perverting divine truth, and it is not so much attended to as it ought to be by many truly pious and humble souls that the superior eminence of youths, whom they respect, in parts and good sense, is by no means a prognostic of the like superiority in real spiritual knowledge and discernment in divine things. Men of genius, if they meet with encouragement, will be sure to distinguish themselves in whatever line of life they move. 
but persons even of remarkable endowments, though sincere in Christianity, may not only in the practice but even in the perception of gospel truths be far outstripped by others who are naturally much their inferiors, because the latter are by no means so exposed to the crafts of Satan, are so liable to be warped in their judgments from Christian simplicity, are more apt to look for understanding from above, and are less disposed to lean to an arm of flesh. We seem to discover in the very beginning of Origen the foundation of that presumptuous spirit which led him afterwards to philosophize so dangerously in Christian religion, never to content himself with plain truth, but to hunt after something singular and extraordinary, though it must be acknowledged his sincere desire of serving God appeared from early life, nor does it ever seem to have forsaken him, so that he may be considered as having been a child of God from early years. His father dying a martyr, he was left an orphan, age seventeen years, with his mother and other children, six in number. His father's substance being confiscated by the emperor, the family was reduced to great distress. But providence gave him a friend in a rich and godly matron, who yet supported in her house a certain person of Antioch, who was noted for heresy. We cannot at this distance assign her motives for this, but Origen, though obliged to be in his company, could not be prevailed on to join in prayer with him. He now vigorously applied himself to the improvement of his understanding, and having no more work at school, it seems, because he soon acquired all the learning his master could give him, and finding that the business of catechizing was deserted at Alexandria because of the persecution, he undertook the work himself, and several Gentiles came to hear him and became his disciples. He was now in his eighteenth year, and in the heat of the persecution distinguished himself by his attachment to the martyrs, not only those of his acquaintance, but in general those who suffered for Christianity. He visited such of them as were fettered in deep dungeons and close imprisonment, and was present with them even after their condemnation, boldly attending them to the place of execution, to the great peril of his own life, openly embracing and saluting them, and was once in imminent danger of being stoned to death on this account. This danger of his was often repeated, insomuch that soldiers were commanded to watch about his house because of the multitudes that crowded thither for instruction. As the persecution daily prevailed, it seemed, however, impossible, humanly speaking, for him to escape. He could no longer pass safely through the streets of Alexandria, but often changing lodgings he was everywhere pursued, yet his instructions had great effect, and his zeal incited numbers to attend to Christianity. The charge of the school was now, by Demetrius the bishop, committed to him alone, and he converted it wholly into a school of religious instruction, maintaining himself by the sale of the profane books which he had been wont to study. Thus he lived many years, an amazing monument at once of industry and self-denial. Not only the day, but the greater part of the night was devoted to religious study, and he practised with literal conscientiousness our Lord's rules of not having two coats, nor shoes, nor providing for futurity. He was familiar with cold, nakedness, and poverty, offended many by his unwillingness to receive their gratuities, and lived many years without the use of shoes, abstained from wine, and lived so abstemiously as to endanger his life. Many imitated his excessive austerities. They were at that time honoured with the name of philosophers, and some of his followers patiently suffered martyrdom. I state facts as I find them, a strong spirit of self-righteousness, meeting with a secret ambition, too subtle to be perceived by him who is the dupe of it, and supported by natural fortitude of mind, and the active exertion of great talents, hath enabled many in external things to seem superior in piety to men of real humility and self-diffidence, who, penetrating more happily into the genius of the gospel by the exercise of faith in the Son of God, and that genuine charity which is its fruit, are led into a course of conduct less dazzling indeed, but much more agreeable to the gospel. One cannot form an high idea of the solid judgment of these Alexandrian Christians. Were there none of the elder and more experienced Christians there, who were capable, with meekness of wisdom, to correct the exuberances of this zealous youth, and to have shown him that, by refusing the comforts of life, he affected a superiority to Paul himself, who gratefully received the alms of the Philippians? But this excess must have been attended with great defects in inward vital godliness. The reader is again referred to the second of Colossians for a comment on the conduct of Origen. How much better had it been for him to have continued a scholar for some time before his pride was feasted by being appointed a teacher. But the lively flow of genius seems to have been mistaken for great growth in Christian knowledge and piety. 
one of his scholars called Plutarch, was led to martyrdom. Origen accompanied him to the place of execution, the odium of the scholar's sufferings reflected on the master, and it was not without a peculiar providence that he escaped the vengeance of the citizens. After him suffered Serenus by fire, the third martyr was Heraclides, the fourth Heron. The former had not yet been baptized, being only what was then called a catechumen. The latter had been lately baptized, but both were beheaded. A second Serenus of the same school, having sustained great torments and much pain, was beheaded. A woman also, called Reus, as yet a catechumen, suffered death. Potamiena, a young woman remarkable for beauty, purity of mind, and firmness in the faith of Christ, suffered very dreadful torments. She was scourged very sorely by the order of Aquila the judge, who threatened to deliver her to be abused by the basest characters. But remaining still unmoved, she was led to the fire and burnt together with her mother, Marcella. The heart of Basiliades, a soldier who presided at her execution, was softened. He pitied her, treated her courteously, and protected her, so far as he durst, from the insolence of the mob. She acknowledged his kindness, thanked him, and promised that, after her departure, she would entreat the Lord for him. Scalding pitch was poured on her whole body, which she sustained in much patience. Some time after, Basilides, being required of his fellow soldiers to swear on some occasion, he refused, confessing himself a Christian. They disbelieved him at first, but finding him serious, carried him before the judge, who remanded him to prison. The Christians visited him, and asking him the cause of this sudden change, he declared that Pontamiena had, three days after her martyrdom, appeared to him by night, informing him that she had performed her promise, and that he should shortly die. After this he suffered martyrdom. The reader will think this an extraordinary story, yet it would be rash to reject it altogether. Eusebius lived not long after the time of Origen, had made accurate inquiries after him and his followers in Alexandria, and observed that the fame of Pontamiana was, in his time, very great in that province. Her martyrdom and that of the soldier seem sufficiently authentic. Her promise to pray for him after her departure only shows the gradual prevalence of fanatical philosophy, will-worship and the like, and if the reader is not prepared by a sufficient degree of candour to admit the truth of Christian narratives and the reality of Christian grace, though pitiably stained in many instances with such superstition, he will find little satisfaction for the evidences of Christian piety for many ages. But we are slaves to habit. We make in our times great allowances for the love of the world in Christians, We are not so easily disposed to make allowances for superstitions. Yet many wrong sentiments and views may be found where the heart is devoted, in faith and love, to God and his Christ. The only difficulty remaining is, how can we apprehend that God should sanctify superstition by sending Potamiana to appear to Basiliades? I apprehend that God, being at work with his soul, the idea of the woman would naturally make a strong impression on his mind, and he might dream what he mentioned." On the whole, the story seems tinged with the superstition of the times, and yet is too remarkable in Christian annals to deserve to be forgotten. End of chapter 5「Six of the History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christian Affairs During the Reigns of Macrinus Heliogabalus, Alexander, Maximinus, Pupianus, Gordian, and Philip. Macrinus reigned not quite a year and was succeeded by Heliogabalus, who was slain after he had swayed the scepter three years and nine months. He died in the year 222. His follies and vices are infamous, but he perished at the age of eighteen. The Church of God suffered nothing from him, nor does he appear to have conceived any particular prejudices against it. On the contrary, he expressed a desire of removing the rites of Christian worship to Rome. It is not worth while to attempt an explanation of the views of so senseless and foolish a prince. He was succeeded by his cousin Alexander, who was as yet in the sixteenth year of his age, and was one of the best moral characters in profane history. His mother, Mamia, is called by Eusebius a woman most godly and religious. I am at a loss how to vindicate the expression. It does not appear that she received the faith of Christ, but neither she nor her son persecuted. They rather approved and countenanced the Christians. Persons of candour and probity themselves, they saw that, in ethics at least, 
the people of God concurred with their own views. Their conduct was laudable, but see the mischief of uniting Christianity with philosophy. How cheap and common is the term godly grown in the eye of Eusebius. The providence of God not only secured his church from suffering, but procured it a favourable patron in this princess and her son. The emperor had a domestic chapel, where he every morning worshipped those princes who had been placed among the gods, whose characters were most esteemed, among whom he placed Apollonius of Tyana, Jesus Christ, Abraham, and Orpheus. He had a desire to erect a temple to Christ and to receive him into the number of the gods. Take another instance of his candor towards the Christians. A dispute was brought before him concerning the property of a piece of ground which was claimed by certain tavern-keepers, and which, having been common, the Christians had occupied for a place of worship. It is fitter, said Alexander, that God should be served there in any manner whatever, rather than a tavern should be made of it. He frequently used this Christian sentence, do as you would be done by. He obliged a crier to repeat it when he punished any person, and was so fond of it that he caused it to be written in his palace and in the public buildings. When he was going to appoint governors of provinces or other officers, he proposed their names in public, giving the people notice that if they had any crime to accuse them of, they should convict them of it. It would be a shame, says he, not to do that with respect to governors who are entrusted with men's properties and lives, which is done by Jews and Christians when they publish the names of those whom they mean to ordain priests. And indeed, by Origen's account, the Christians were very careful in the choice of their pastors, and civil magistrates were by no means to be compared with them in probity and sound morality. This prince had, it seems, too much gravity and virtue for the times in which he lived, and some in derision called him Archi Synagogus. It seems to have been his plan to encourage everything that carried the appearance of religion and virtue, and to discountenance whatever was openly immoral and profane. His historian tells us that he favoured astrologers and permitted them to teach publicly, that he himself was well skilled in the vain science of the auspices, and was a master of that of the augurs in a high degree. In the year 229, Alexander was obliged to go to the east and to reside at Antioch. His mother, Mamia, went with him, and having heard of the fame of Origen and being very curious to hear new things, she sent him a guard and caused him to come to her. All the account we have of this interview is that he continued there a while and published many things to the glory of God and concerning the power of the heavenly doctrine, and then returned to his school at Alexandria. What Origen taught this princess we are not told. What he ought to have taught her, the Acts of the Apostles, would have amply informed him. A plain and artless declaration of the vanity and wickedness of all the reigning idolatries and philosophical sects, and what is still more of the corruption, helplessness, and misery of man, and a faithful information concerning the only way of salvation by Jesus Christ, the great duty of believing on him, confessing him, and admitting the sanctifying operations of his spirit. These things a perfectly sound preacher would have shown her, and his exhortations would have been entirely founded on these doctrines, nor would he have found any occasion to aid his message by the authority of Plato or any other philosopher. It does not appear that any remarkable effect attended the ministry of Origen on this occasion. That he spake what he believed, and what he thought most wise and expedient, I doubt not. It is only to be lamented that his own taste and views were too similar to those of Mamia and her son, to enable him to represent Christianity to them in the clearest and most striking manner. In truth, it is to be feared that a number of Christians so-called, and Alexander himself, were much of the same religion at this time. He seems to have learnt in some measure the doctrine of the unity of the Godhead, and by the help of the eclectic philosophy to have consolidated all religions into one mass. But things that accompany salvation will not incorporate with this plan. The liberality of his friend Ambrose enabled Origen to prosecute his scriptural studies with vast rapidity. Ambrose himself was a deacon of the church, and by his faithfulness under persecution obtained the name of confessor. At this time Noetus of Smyrna propagated the same heresy in the East, which Praxius had done in the West, that there was no distinction between the divine persons. 
The pastors of the church of Ephesus, to which he belonged, summoned him before them, and asked whether he really maintained this opinion. At first he denied it, but afterwards, having formed a party, he became more bold, and publicly taught his heresy. Being again interrogated by the pastors, he said, What harm have I done? I glory none but one God. I know none besides him who hath been begotten, who suffered and died. He evidently in this way confounded the persons of the Father and the Son together, and being obstinate in his views, was ejected out of the church with his disciples. We have here an additional proof of the jealousy of the primitive Christians in support of the fundamental articles of Christianity, and the connection indissolubly preserved between heretical pravity and pride of heart appeared also in this man. He called himself Moses and his brother Aaron. Origen was now sent for to Athens to assist the churches, who were there disturbed with several heresies. From thence he went to Palestine. At Caesarea, Theoctetus the bishop and Alexander, bishop of Jerusalem, ordained him a priest at the age of forty-five, about the year 230. Demetrius, his own bishop, was offended, and at length divulged what had hitherto been kept very secret, the indiscreet mutilation which Origen had committed in his youth. Alexander defended himself in what he had done by the encomium which Demetrius had given of Origen in his letter. The latter, on his return to Alexandria, found his bishop quite incensed against him, who procured him to be even ejected from the church by a council of pastors on account of some errors that appeared in his works. What judgment is to be formed of these errors I shall have a future occasion to consider. Banished from Egypt, this great man lived now in Palestine, with his friends Theoctistus and Alexander, still followed by many disciples and particularly respected by Familian of Cappadocia, who looked upon it as a happiness to enjoy his instructions. Here also the famous Gregory Thaumaturgus attended his theological lectures, which were still delivered in Origen's usual manner. Demetrius, bishop of Alexandria, died after having held that office forty-three years. A long space, but our informations are too indistinct to enable us to know his real character. His treatment of Origen needed, surely, a very upright conscience towards God in things of essential moment to justify it. Origen's assistant, Heraclus, succeeded him. In the year 235, Alexander was murdered together with his mother, and Maximin, the murderer, obtained the empire. His malice against the house of Alexander disposed him to persecute the Christians, and he gave orders to put to death the pastors of churches. Nor was the persecution confined to them. Others suffered with them, and it seems by Familian's letter to Cyprian of Carthage that the flame extended to Cappadocia. Ambrose, the friend of Origen, and Protoctetus, minister of Caesarea, suffered much in the course of it, and to them Origen dedicated his Book of Martyrs. He himself was obliged to retire, but the tyrant's reign lasted only three years, in which time it must be confessed that the rest of the world had tasted of his ferocity as much as the Christians. His persecution of them had been local, and his cruelties to all mankind insatiable. Pupienus and Balbinus, the successors of Maximin, were slain in the year 238, and Gordian reigned for six years and was then supplanted by the usual military turbulence to make way for his murderer, Philip the Arabian. Origen, in a letter to his scholar Gregory Thaumaturgus, lays down a rule for studying the scriptures which shows that his philosophy had not obliterated his Christianity. He exhorts him to apply himself chiefly to the Holy Scripture, to read it very attentively, not to speak or judge of it lightly, but with unshaken faith and prayer, which, he says, is absolutely necessary for understanding it. A fresh attempt was now made to pervert the doctrine of the person of Christ. Berillus, bishop of Bostra in Arabia, affirmed that our Saviour before his incarnation had no proper divinity, but only his Father's divinity dwelling in him. Thus Eusebius states the matter. It is not easy to form any clear ideas at all of his sentiments. They seem, however, to annihilate the divine personality of the eternal word. The man, it seems, was not obstinate, he listened to sound scriptural argument, and was therefore reclaimed by means of origin. He even loved his instructor ever after, and was sincerely thankful to him, a circumstance which reflects an amiable light on the character of Berillus. Philip began to reign in the year 244. Eusebius tells us that he was a Christian and desirous of being received into the church as such, 
but was obliged by the bishop to join himself to those who, for their sins, were examined and put into the room of penitence. But what bishop? Babylus of Antioch is mentioned by Chrysostom long after, but Eusebius mentions the whole story only as a report, it is void of proper authenticity. That he was a Christian by profession seems well attested by the concurrent voice of antiquity, though most probably he ranked only at his death as a catechumen. But that he could conduct the secular games, full of idolatry as they were, which took place in the fourth year of his reign, and in the year of Christ 247, showed that he was not disposed to give up anything for the sake of Christ. There is not the least appearance that he was cordial in his profession of the gospel. In the meantime, its progress in the world must have been very great to induce a worldly-minded man like Philip to countenance it. To him also, and to his wife Severa, Origen wrote an epistle which was extant in Eusebius's time. By Origen's account in one of his homilies, it appears that the long peace which the church, with only the short interruption of Maximin's persecution, had enjoyed, had brought on a great degree of lukewarmness and even much religious indecorum among them. Let the reader only observe the difference between the scenes he here describes and the conduct of the Christians both in the first and second century, and he will feel the greatness of the declension. Quote, Several, says he, come to church only on solemn festivals, and then not so much for instruction as for diversion. Some go out again as soon as they have heard the lecture, without conferring or asking the pastors any questions. Others stay not till the lecture is ended, and others know not whether there is any such thing, but entertain themselves in a corner of the church. If anything under God can conquer this careless spirit, it must be the faithful dispensation of the peculiar truths of the gospel in a practical, soul-searching manner. But the ability for this was much declined, in the eastern part of the church especially. He complains elsewhere of the ambitious and haughty manners of pastors, and of the wrong steps which took some to obtain preferments. This great man was now once more employed in confuting another error in Arabia. It was of those who denied the intermediate state of souls, and this he managed with his usual good success. Philip enjoyed the fruits of his crimes five years, and was then slain, and succeeded by Decius. A little before his death, in the year 248, Cyprian was chosen bishop of Carthage. But in naming him, a star of the first magnitude in these days has been mentioned, and after the fatigue of hunting out a little of Christian goodness with much difficulty, it will not be amiss to recreate ourselves with the contemplation of a character partaking indeed of the declensions of these times, but far superior in real simplicity and piety, I apprehend, to those in the East which we have reviewed. End of chapter 6「The History of the Church of Christ, Century 3, by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Conversion of Cyprian. The life of this man was written by Pontius, his deacon. It is to be regretted that one who must have known him so well should have written in so incompetent a manner. Very little distinct information is to be gathered from him, but his own letters are extant, and from these I shall endeavour to exhibit whatever is of the greatest moment. They are, in truth, a valuable treasure of ecclesiastical history. The spirit, taste, discipline, and habits of the times, among Christians, are strongly delineated. Nor have we, in all this century, any account to be compared with them. He was a professor of oratory in the city of Carthage, and a man of wealth, quality, and dignity. Cecilius, a Carthaginian presbyter, had the felicity under God to conduct him to the knowledge of Christ, and in his gratitude Cyprian afterwards assumed the prenomen of Cecilius. His conversion was about the year 246, two years before he was chosen bishop of Carthage. About thirteen years was the whole scene of his Christian life. But God can do great things in a little time, or to speak more nervously with the sacred writer, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. He did not proceed by slow, painful steps of argumentation, but seems to have been led on with vast rapidity by the effectual operation of the Divine Spirit, and happily, in a great measure at least, to have escaped the shoals and quicksands of false learning and self-conceit, which we have seen so much to tarnish the character of his Eastern brethren. 
faith and love seem in native simplicity to have possessed him when an early convert he saw with pity the poor of the flock and he knew no method so proper of employing the unrighteous mammon as to relieve their distress he sold whole estates for their benefit it was an excellent rule of the apostles concerning ordination not a novice lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil there appeared however in cyprian a spirit at once so simple so zealous and so intelligent that in about two years after his conversion he was chosen presbyter and then bishop of carthage it was no feigned virtue that advanced him thus in the eyes of the people the love of christ evidently preponderated in him above all secular considerations his wife opposed his christian spirit of liberality in vain the widow the orphan and the poor found in him a sympathizing benefactor continually the presbyter cecilius must have beheld with much delight the growing virtues of his pupil and dying recommended to his care his wife and children it was with much reluctance that cyprian observed the designs of the people to choose him for their bishop he retired to avoid their solicitations his house was besieged and his retreat rendered impossible he yielded at length to accept of the painful preeminence for so he soon found it yet five presbyters were enemies to his exaltation his lenity patience and benevolence towards them was remarked by all pontius tells us that he did many things before he was chosen bishop indeed a spirit active like his must be employed but he does not oblige us with the communication of any of his works his letter to donatus may safely be placed within this period as st austin tells us it was his first work part of this as it will illustrate his conversion and show the spirit of a man penetrated with divine love and lately recovered from the idolatry of the world well deserves to be translated Quote, i find your whole care and concern at present is for conversion you look at me and expect from me in your affection what i am afraid i cannot by any means answer small fruits must be expected from my meanness yet i will attempt for the subject matter is on my side let plausible arts of ambition be used in courts but when we speak of the lord god plainness and sincerity not the powers of eloquence should be used here then things not eloquent but strong not courtly but rude yet proper to celebrate the divine goodness here then what is felt before it is learnt and is not collected by a long course of speculation but is imbibed by the soul by the compendium of grace ripening her as at once while i lay in darkness and in the night of paganism and when i fluctuated uncertain and dubious with wandering steps in the sea of a tempestuous age ignorant of my own life alienated from light and truth it appeared to me a harsh and difficult thing as my manners then were to obtain what divine grace had promised that a man should be born again and that being animated with the love of regeneration by a new life he should strip himself of what he was before and though the body remained the same he should in his mind become altogether a new creature footnote an instance we have here of the powerful effects of regeneration attending baptism in those days End footnote. how can so great a change be possible said i that a man should suddenly and at once put off what nature and habit have confirmed in him these evils are deeply and closely fixed in us how shall he learn parsimony who has been accustomed to expensive and magnificent feasts and how shall he who has been accustomed to purple gold and costly attire condescend to the simplicity of a plebeian habit can he who was delighted with the honours of ambition live private and obscure he attended with crowds of clients thinks solitude the most dreadful punishment he must still thought i be infested by tenacious allurements drunkenness pride anger rapacity cruelty ambition and lust must still domineer over him in all this i had a peculiar eye to my own case i was myself established in many errors in my former life from which i did not think it possible to be cleared whence i favoured my vices and through despair of what was better i cleaved to my own evils as vernacular but after the filth of my former sins was washed off by the lava of regeneration and divine light infused itself from above into my heart now purified and cleansed after through the outpouring of the holy spirit from heaven the new birth had made me a new creature indeed immediately and in an amazing manner dubious things began to be cleared up things once shut to be opened dark things to shine forth what before seemed difficult now appeared feasible 
and that was now evidently practicable, which had been deemed impossible. I acknowledged that which was born after the flesh, and had lived enslaved by wickedness, was of the earth. But the new life, now animated by the Holy Ghost, began to be of God. You know yourself, and recollect as well as myself, what that death of crimes and that life of virtues took from us, and what is conferred upon us. You know yourself, nor do I proclaim it. To boast of one's own praises is odious, though that cannot be called an expression of boasting, but of gratitude. Whatever is not ascribed to the virtue of man, but is professed to proceed from the gift of God, so that deliverance from sin begins to be of faith. The preceding state of sin was the effect of human error. Of God it is, of God I say, even all that we can do. Thence we live, thence we have strength, thence conceiving and assuming vigour, though as yet placed below, we know beforehand the vestiges of our future felicity. Let only fear be the guardian of innocence, that the Lord, who kindly shone into our minds by the effusion of heavenly grace, may be detained as our guest by the soul delighting in him, in a regular course of upright conduct, lest pardon received should beget a careless presumption, and the old enemy break in afresh. But if you keep the road of innocence and righteousness, if you walk with footsteps that do not slide, if hanging with all your heart and with all your might on God, you be only what you have begun to be, you will then find, according to the proportion of faith, so will your attainments and enjoyments be for no bound or measure can be assigned in the reception of divine grace, as is the case of earthly benefits. The Holy Spirit, poured forth profusely, is confined by no limits, nor restrained by any barriers. He flows perpetually, he bestows in rich abundance. Let our heart only thirst and be open to receive him, as much of capacious faith as we bring, so much abounding grace do we draw from him. Hence an ability is given in sober chastity, in uprightness of mind, in purity of words, for the healing of the sick, to be able to extinguish the force of poison, to cleanse the filth of distempered minds, to speak peace to the hostile, tranquillity to the violent, and gentleness to the fierce, to compel unclean and wandering spirits by menaces to quit their hold of men, to scourge and control the foe, and bring him to confess what he is by torments, Thus, of what we have already begun to be, the spirit enjoys its licenses, though, till we have changed our body and members, the prospect as yet carnal is obscured by the cloud of the world. What a power, what an energy is this, that the soul should not only be emancipated from slavery and be made free and clean, but still stronger and victorious to be able to triumph over the powers of the enemy. End quote. The testimony here given to the ejection of evil spirits, as a common thing even in the third century among the Christians, deserves to be noticed as a proof that miraculous influences had not ceased in the church. Minutius Felix speaks to the same purpose, and I think with more precision. Quote, Being adjured by the living God, they tremble, wretched and reluctant, in the bodies of men, and either leap out immediately, or vanish by degrees, as the faith of the patient or the grace of the person administering relief may be strong or weak. End quote. Indeed, the testimony of the fathers in these times is so general and concurrent that the fact itself cannot be denied without universally impeaching their veracity. It is not my province to dwell on this. The sanctifying graces of the Spirit are the most important, and they are described by Cyprian as by one who had seen and tasted them. A life and energy far out of the reach of common rational processes and evidently divine, he doubtless felt in himself in his conversion, and he appeals to his friend Donatus, if he had not felt the same. We may safely infer that such things were then frequently known among Christians, even though the effusion of the Holy Ghost was not so much known as in the two former centuries. Indeed, what else can account for a change so sudden, so rapid, and yet so firm and solid as obtained in Cyprian? For nothing can be conceived more different in the last thirteen years of his life, than he must have been from his former self. Will modern fastidiousness call all this enthusiasm? The reader will see in the account here given the essential doctrines of justification and regeneration by divine grace not only believed but experienced by this zealous African. The difference between mere human and divine teaching is rendered more striking by such cases. With no great furniture of learning, it was his happiness to know little, if anything, of the then reigning philosophy. We see a man of business and of the world rising at once a phoenix in the church, 
no extraordinary theologian in point of accurate knowledge, yet an useful and practical divine, an accomplished pastor, flaming with the love of God and of souls, and with unremitted activity, spending and being spent for Christ Jesus. This is the Lord's doing, and it should be remarked as his. We shall see his own conversion prepared him for real service, and while they disputed and reasoned in the East, in the West they loved. He seems to express a remarkable influence of divine grace as having accompanied his baptism. It was reasonable to suppose that it was commonly the case at that time. The inward and spiritual grace really attended the outward and visible sign. It is to be lamented that the perversion of after ages, availing itself of the ambiguous language of the fathers on this subject, which with them was natural enough, supposed a necessary connection to take place where there had been a common one. In Cyprian's time, to call baptism itself the new birth was not very dangerous. In our age it is poison itself, for it has long been the fashion to suppose all baptized persons regenerate of course, and thus have men learned to furnish themselves with a convenient evasion of all that is written in Scripture concerning the godly motions of the Holy Spirit. Cyprian goes on, quote, and that the marks of divine goodness may appear the more perspicuously by a discovery of the truth, I will lay open to your view the real state of the world, removing the darkness of evils, and detecting the hidden darkness of this present course of things. Fancy yourself for a little time withdrawn to the top of a high mountain, thence inspect the appearance of things below you, and, looking all around, yourself unfettered by worldly connections, observe the fluctuating tempests of the world, you will pity mankind, and admonished of your own bliss and made more thankful to God, you will with more joy congratulate your escape. End quote. He then gives an affecting view of the immensity of evils which the state of mankind at that time exhibited, and graphically delineates the miseries of public and private life, and then returns to the description of the blessing of true Christianity. Quote, the only placid and sound tranquillity then, the only solid, firm and perpetual security is... If any man delivered from the tempests of this restless scene, be stationed in the port of salvation, lift up his eyes from earth to heaven, and being admitted into the favour of the Lord, and approaching near to his God with his mind, justly boast that whatever sublime and great in human things, among others, lies within the sphere of his conscience. He who is greater than the world can desire nothing, can want nothing of the world. What a stable, what an unshaken protection is it, a castle truly divine and fraught with eternal good, to be loosed from the snares of an entangling world, to be purged from earthly dregs, to be wafted into the light of immortal day, and to see what the insidious rage of the enemy, who before infested us, plotted against us. We are the more compelled to love what we shall be, while it has allowed us both to know and to condemn what we were. Nor is there any need for this of price, of canvassing, or of manual labour, that the complete dignity or power of man may be acquired by elaborate efforts, but the gift of God is gratuitous and easy. As the sun shines freely, as the mountain bubbles, as the rain bedews, so the celestial spirit infuses himself. After the soul, looking up to heaven, has known its author, higher than the earth and sublimer than all secular power, she begins to be what she believes herself to be. Do you, whom the heavenly warfare hath marked for divine service, only preserve untainted and sober your Christian course by the virtues of religion? Let prayer or reading be your assiduous employment. One while speak with God, another while hear him speak to you. Let him instruct you by his precepts, let him regulate you. Whom he hath made rich, none shall make poor. There can be no penury to him whose heart has once been fattened with celestial marrow." Roofs arched with gold and houses inlaid with marble will be vile in your eyes when you know that you yourself are rather to be cultivated and adorned, that this house is more valuable which the Lord has chosen to be his temple in which the Holy Ghost has begun to dwell. Let us adorn this house with the paintings of innocence, let us illuminate it with the light of righteousness. This will never fall into ruin through the decays of age, its ornaments shall never fade, Whatever is not genuine is precarious, and affords to the possessor no sure foundation. This remains in its culture perpetually vivid, in honour spotless, in splendour eternal. It can neither be abolished nor extinguished, only it will receive a richer improvement of its form at the resurrection of the body. Let us spend this day in joy, nor let an hour of our entertainment be unconnected with divine grace." Let the sober banquet resound with psalms, and as your memory is good, your voice harmonious, perform this office according to custom. Your dear friends will be agreeably fed, 
if we hear spiritually and religious harmony delight our ears. End quote. In all this, the intelligent reader sees a picture of a Christian alive, possessed of some rich portion of that effusion of the Holy Ghost, which, from the Apostles' days, still exhibited Christ Jesus, and fitted by experience to communicate to others the real gospel, and to be a happy instrument of guiding souls to the rest which remains for the people of God. End of chapter 7. Chapter 8 of The History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Beginnings of the Persecution of Decius and Cyprian's Government Till His Retirement How Cyprian conducted himself in his bishopric, who is sufficient to relate, says Pontius in the fullness of his admiration, some particular account, however, might have been expected from one who had such large opportunity of information. One thing he notices of his external appearance. His looks had the due mixture of gravity and cheerfulness, so that it was doubtful whether he was more worthy of love or of reverence. His dress also was correspondent to his looks. He had renounced the secular pomp to which his rank in life entitled him, yet he avoided affected penury. From a man of Cyprian's piety and good sense united, such a conduct might be expected. While Cyprian was labouring to recover the spirit of godliness among the Africans, which long peace had corrupted, Philip was slain and succeeded by Decius. His enmity to the former emperor conspired with his pagan prejudices to bring on the most dreadful persecution which the church had yet experienced. It was evident that nothing less than the destruction of the Christian name was intended, the chronology is here remarkably embarrassed, nor is it an object of consequence to trouble either myself or the reader with any studious attempt to settle it. Suffice it to say that the eventful period before us of Cyprian's bishopric extends from the year 248 to 260, and that Decius's succession to the empire must have taken place towards the beginning of it. The persecution raged with astonishing fury beyond the example of former persecutions both in the East and West. The latter is the scene before us at present, and in a treatise of Cyprian concerning the lapsed, we have an affecting account of the declension from the spirit of Christianity which had taken place before his conversion, which moved God to chastise his church. Quote, if the cause of our miseries, says he, be investigated, the cure of the wound is found, the Lord would have his family to be tried, and because the long peace had corrupted the discipline divinely revealed to us, the heavenly chastisement hath raised up our faith, which had lain almost dormant, and when by our sins we had deserved to suffer still more, the merciful Lord so moderated all things that the whole scene rather deserves the name of a trial than a persecution. Each was bent on improving his patrimony, forgetting what believers had done under the apostles and what they ought always to do, they brooded over the arts of amassing wealth. The pastors and the deacons each forgot their duty. Works of mercy were neglected, and discipline was at the lowest ebb. Luxury and effeminacy prevailed. Meretriculous arts in dress were cultivated. Fraud and deceit were practised among brethren. Christians could unite themselves in matrimony with unbelievers, could swear not only without reverence, but even without veracity. With haughty asperity they despised their ecclesiastical superiors, could rail against one another with outrageous acrimony, and conduct quarrels with settled malice. Even many bishops who ought to be guides and patterns to the rest, neglecting the peculiar duties of their stations, gave themselves up to secular pursuits, deserting their places of residence and their flocks. They travelled through distant provinces in quest of gain, gave no assistance to the needy brethren, were insatiable in their thirst of money, possessed estates by fraud and multiplied usury. What have we not deserved to suffer for such a conduct? Even the divine word hath foretold us what we might expect. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, I will visit their offences with the rod and their sin with scourges. These things had been denounced and foretold, but in vain. Our sins had brought our affairs to that pass, that while we despised the Lord's directions, we were obliged to undergo the correction of our evils and the trial of our faith by severe remedies. End quote. 
that a deep declension from Christian purity had taken place not only in the East, where false philosophy aided its progress, as we have seen, but also in the West, where the common influence of prosperity on human depravity alone appears, is now completely evident, and it deserves to be remarked that the first grand and general declension, since the first outpouring of the Divine Spirit, should be fixed about the middle of this century. The wisdom and goodness of God is also to be observed in first qualifying the Bishop of Carthage by a strong personal work on his own heart, and then in raising him to the See of Carthage to superintend the western part of his church in a time of trial like the present, which should operate as a wholesome medicine to revive the declining spirit of Christianity, and which needed all that fortitude, zeal, and wisdom with which he was so eminently endowed. In such a situation it is not to be expected that Cyprian's people would in general stand their ground. Avarice had taken such deep root among them that vast numbers lapsed into idolatry immediately. Even before men were accused as Christians, many ran to the forum and sacrificed to the gods as they were ordered, and the crowds of them were so large that the magistrates wished to defer a number of them till the next day, but were importuned by the wretched supplicants to allow them that night to prove themselves heathens. At Rome the persecution raged with unremitting violence. There Fabian the bishop suffered, and for some time it became impracticable to elect a successor, yet it does not appear that the metropolis suffered more in proportion than some other places, since we find that the flame of persecution had driven some bishops from distant provinces who fled for shelter to Rome. Cyprian, however, having been regularly informed by the Roman clergy of the martyrdom of their bishop, congratulated them on his glorious exit, and exulted on occasion of his uprightness and integrity. He expresses the pleasure he conceived that his example had so much penetrated their minds, and owns the energy which he felt to imitate the pattern. Moises and Maximus, two Roman presbyters with other confessors, were also seized and imprisoned. Attempts were repeatedly made to persuade them to relinquish the faith, but in vain. Cyprian found means to write to them also a letter full of benevolence, and breathing the strongest pathos. He tells them that his heart was with them continually, that he prayed for them in his public ministry and in private. He comforts them under the pressures of hunger and thirst which they endured, and congratulates them for living now not for this life but for the next, and particularly because their example would be a means of confirming many who were in a wavering state. But Carthage soon became an unsafe scene to Cyprian himself. By repeated suffrages of the people at the theatre, he was demanded to be taken and given to the lions, and it behoved him immediately either to retire into a place of safety or to expect the crown of martyrdom. Cyprian's spirit in interpreting scripture was more simple and more accommodated to receive its plain and obvious sense than that of men who had learnt to refine and subtilize. He knew the liberty which his divine master had given to his people of fleeing when they were persecuted in one city to another, and he embraced it. Nay, he seems scarce to have thought it lawful to do otherwise. Even the last state of his martyrdom evinces this. His manner of enduring it when it providentially was brought on him sufficiently clears him of all suspicion of pusillanimity. To unite such seemingly opposite things as discretion and fortitude, each in a very high degree, is a sure characteristic of greatness in a Christian. It is grace in its highest exercise. Pontius thinks it was not without a particular divine direction that he was moved to act in this manner for the benefit of the church. Behold him, now safe under God, from the arm of persecution, through the love of his people in some place of retreat, for the space of two years, and let us next see how this time was employed. End of chapter 8。Chapter 9 of The History of the Church of Christ, Century 3, by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. History of Cyprian and the Western Church during his retirement of two years. Cyprian was never more active than in his retreat. Nothing of moment occurred in ecclesiastical affairs either in Africa or in Italy, with which he was not acquainted, and his counsels under God were of the greatest influence in both countries. I shall endeavour to abbreviate the account from his own letters which were written in this period. The presbyters of Carthage sent Clementinus, a subdeacon, to Rome, from whom the Roman clergy learnt the retreat of the bishop, they, in return, to express to the Africans their perfect agreement in opinion concerning the fact, because he was an eminent character, and a life extremely valuable to the church. 
they represent the conflict as very important which God had now permitted to try his servants, willing to manifest both to angels and to men, that the conqueror shall be crowned, and the conquered be self-condemned. They express the deep sense which they had both of their own situation and that of the clergy of Carthage, whose duty it was to take care not to incur the censure passed on faithless shepherds in the prophet, but rather to imitate their lord, the good shepherd, who laid down his own life for the sheep, and who so earnestly and repeatedly charges Simon Peter, as a proof of his love to his master, to feed his sheep. Quote, we would not wish, dear brethren, say they, to find you mere mercenaries but good shepherds, since you know it must be highly sinful in you not to exhort the brethren to stand immovable in the faith, lest the brethren be totally subverted by idolatry. Nor do we only in words thus exhort you, but, as you may learn from many who come from us to you, we have done and still do, with the help of God, all these things with all solicitude at the hazard of our lives, having before our eyes the fear of God and perpetual punishment, rather than the fear of men and a temporary calamity, not deserting the brethren and exhorting them to stand in the faith, and to be ready to follow their Lord when called. We have also done our utmost to recover those who had gone up to sacrifice to save their lives. Our church stands firm in the faith in general, though some, overcome by terror, either because they were persons in high life or were moved by the fear of man, have lapsed. Yet these, though separated from us, we do not give up as lost altogether, but we exhort them to repent, if they may find mercy with him who is able to save, lest by relinquishing them we make them still more incurable. Thus, brethren, we would wish you also to do, as much as in you lies, exhorting the lapsed, should they be seized a second time, to confess their Saviour. And we suggest to you to receive again into communion any of these, if they heartily desire it, and give proof of sound repentance. And certainly officers should be appointed to minister to the widows, the sick, and those in prison, and those who are in a state of banishment. A special care should be exercised over the catechumens, to preserve them from apostasy, and those whose duty it is to inter the dead, or to consider the interment of the martyrs as matter of indispensable obligation. Certain we are that those servants, who shall be found to have been thus faithful in that which is least, will have authority over ten cities. May God, who does all things for those who hope in him, grant that we may all be found thus diligently employed. The brethren in bonds, the clergy, and the whole church salute you, all of us with earnest solicitude watching for all who call on the name of the Lord. And we beseech you in return to be mindful of us also in your prayers. End quote. Several observations offer themselves on this occasion. One, it appears both at Rome and Carthage that the reduced mode of episcopacy was the form of ecclesiastical government which gradually prevailed in the Christian world. It is not to be supposed that the whole body of Christians, either at Rome or at Carthage, was no more than what might be contained in one assembly. The inference is obvious. 2. The Roman Church appears, in the beginning of Decius's persecution at least, to have been in a much more thriving state than that of Carthage, and their clergy to have been models worthy of imitation in all ages. 3. The administration of discipline, wisely tempered by tenderness and strictness among them, is admirable. 4. The work of the Divine Spirit, infusing the largest charity, even to the laying down of their lives for the brethren, is apparent among them. See now the spirit of a primitive pastor, full of charity and meekness, zeal and prudence, in the following letter of Cyprian to his clergy. Quote, Being hitherto preserved by the favour of God, I salute you, dearest brethren, rejoicing to hear of your safety. As present circumstances permit not my presence among you, I beg you, by your faith and by the ties of religion, to discharge your office in conjunction with mine also, that nothing be wanting either on the head of discipline or of diligence. I beg that nothing may be wanting to supply the necessities of those who are imprisoned because of their glorious confession of God, or who labour under the pressures of indigence and poverty, since the whole ecclesiastical fund is in the hands of the clergy for this very purpose, that a number may have it in their power to relieve the wants of individuals. I beg further that you would use every prudential and cautious method to procure the peace of the church, and if the brethren, through charity, wish to confer with and visit those pious confessors whom the divine goodness hath thus far shone upon by such good beginnings, that they would, however, do this cautiously, not in crowds, nor in a multitude, lest any odium should hence arise, and the liberty of admission be denied altogether, and while through greediness we aim at too much, we lose all. Consult, therefore, and provide 
that this may be done safely and with discretion, so that the presbyters, one by one, accompanied by the deacons in turn, may successively minister to them because the change of persons visiting them is less liable to breed suspicion. For in all things we ought to be meek and humble, as becomes the servants of God, to redeem the time, to have a regard for peace and provide for the people. Most dearly beloved and longed for, I wish you all prosperity and to remember us. Salute all the brethren, Victor the deacon, and those that are with us salute you. End quote. The defection of such numbers must have penetrated deeply the fervent and charitable spirit of Cyprian. Not only very many of the laity, but part of the clergy had also been seduced. Quote, I could have wished, says he, dearest brethren, to have had it in my power to salute your whole body, sound and entire, but as the melancholy tempest has, in addition to the fall of so many of the people, also affected part of the clergy, sad accumulation of our sorrow. We pray the Lord that by divine mercy we may be enabled to salute you at least, whom we have known to stand firm in faith and virtue, safe for the time to come. And though the cause loudly called on me to hasten my return to you, first on account of my own desire and regret for the loss of your company, a desire which burns strongly in me, in the next place that we might in full counsel settle the various objects in the church which require attention, yet on the whole, to remain still concealed, seemed more advisable on account of other advantages which pertain to the general safety, on account of which our dear brother Tertullus will give you, who agreeably to that care which he employs in divine works, and with so much zeal, was also the adviser of this council, that I should act with caution and moderation, and not rashly commit myself to the public view in a place where I had so often been sought and called for. Relying, therefore, on your charity and conscientiousness, of which I have had good experience, I exhort and charge you by these letters that you, whose situation is less dangerous and invidious, would supply my lack of service. Let the poor be attended to as much as possible, those, I mean, who have stood the test of persecution. Suffer them not to want necessaries, lest indigence do that against them which persecution could not. I know the charity of the brethren has provided for very many of them, yet if any want meat or clothing, as I wrote you before, while they were yet in prison, let their necessities be supplied. End quote. In what follows he shows the deep knowledge which he had of the depravity of the heart, apt to fall through vainglory and self-conceit, on the consciousness of having well performed our part in any respect, and I cannot forbear transcribing the practical rules of humility which follow. Quote, Only let them know that they must be instructed and taught by you, as the doctrines of Scripture require subordination in the people to their pastors, they should cultivate an humble, modest, and peaceable demeanour, that those who have been glorious in confession may be equally so in conduct. The harder trial yet remains. The Lord saith, He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Let them imitate the Lord, whose humility never shone more than at the eve of his passion, when he washed his disciples' feet. The Apostle Paul, too, after repeated sufferings, still continued mild and humble, his assumption to the third heaven begat in him no arrogance. Neither, says he, did we eat any man's bread for naught, but laboured and travailed night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Each of these things do you instil into the brethren, and because he who humbles himself shall be exalted, now is the time more particularly that they should fear the snares of the enemy of souls, who loves to attack the strongest, and to revenge the disgrace which he has already sustained from them. The Lord grant that in due season I may be enabled to see them again, and exhort them to useful purpose. For I am grieved to hear that some run about in insolent and idle fooleries, or give themselves up to strife, and even pollute those members which had confessed Christ by fornication, and are not willing to be subject to the deacons or presbyters, but seem to act as if they intended, by the bad conduct of a few confessors, to bring disgrace on the whole body." He is a true confessor indeed, of whom the church may not blush, but glory. To the point concerning which certain presbyters wrote to me, I can answer nothing alone, for from the beginning of my bishopric I determined to do nothing without your consent and the consent of the people. But when I shall return to you by the favour of God, we will treat in common of all things. End quote. In the next letter, to the confessors, he dwells on the same subject, the ill conduct of some of them the use of good discipline in the church, the benefits of orderly subjection in the members, 
the danger of pride and self-exaltation and the deceitfulness of the human heart appear hence abundantly. After having congratulated them on the steadiness of their confession, he reminds them of the necessity of perseverance, since faith itself and the new birth saves us to life eternal, not merely as once received, but preserved. He reminds them that the Lord regards him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and that trembles at his words, and he rejoices to find that the greatest part of the confessors thus adorned the gospel. But he had heard that some of them were puffed up. To these he exhibits the mild, charitable, and humble spirit of the Lamb of God. Quote, and dare, says he, any one who lives by him now, and who lives in him, to lift himself up with pride? He that is least among you, the same shall be great. How execrable ought that to appear among you, which we have heard with the deepest sorrow of heart. End quote. He then repeats what he had before mentioned of the lasciviousness of some. Quote, Contentions and strifes ought to have no place among you, since the Lord has left us his peace. I beseech you, abstain from reproaches and abuse, for he who speaks what is peaceable and good and just, according to the precepts of Christ, confesses Christ daily. We renounced the world when we were baptized, but now we truly renounce the world when, being tried and proved by God, Leaving all our own things, we have followed the Lord, and stand and live in his faith and fear. Let us strengthen one another with mutual exhortations, and strive to grow in the Lord, that when in his mercy he shall give us peace, which he has promised, we may return to the church as new men, and that both our brethren and the Gentiles may receive us improved in holy conduct, that they who before admired the fortitude of Christians may admire also the excellency of their morals." End quote. The mind of Cyprian, full of the fear of God, and reflecting from a comparison of Christian precepts with the practice of professors how deeply his people had provoked the Lord before the persecution, was vehemently incited to stir them up to repentance. See how he preaches to the people from his recess. Quote, Though I am sensible, dearest brethren, for the fear which we all owe to God, that you are instant in prayers, yet I also admonish you, that you would breathe out your souls to God not only in words, but also in fasting, tears, and every method of supplication. In truth, we must understand and confess that the apostasy, which in so large a degree has wasted our flock and still wastes it, is the proper consequence of our sins. End quote. He then goes on to speak of their practical corruptions, as he does in his treatise concerning the lapsed. Quote, and what plagues, what stripes do we not deserve, since even confessors who ought to be patterns to the rest are quite disorderly? Hence, while the tumid and indecent pride of their confession puffs up some, torments have come, and torments unremitted, tedious, and most distressing, even to death itself. Let us pray with our whole heart for mercy, if in receiving we find a delay, because we have deeply offended. Let us knock, because to him that knocketh it shall be opened, if only prayers, groans, and tears beat the door. End quote. He then records some visions, which, as they rather suit the dispensation of that age in which miracles were by no means wanting, I pass over. Quote, our master himself prayed for us, being himself no sinner, but bearing our sins. And if he labour and watch for us and our sins, how much more should we be urgent in prayer, first in treating our Lord himself, and then through him we may obtain favour with God the Father? The Father himself corrects and takes care of us, standing still in the faith, in the midst of pressures, and sticking close to his Christ, as it is written, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, or nakedness or peril or sword? None of these can separate believers, nothing can pluck off those who stick to his body and blood. Persecution is the examination and trial of our heart. God would have us to be sifted and tried nor was ever his help wanting in trials to those who believe. Let our eyes be lifted up to heaven, lest earth with its enticements deceive us. If the Lord see us humble and quiet, lovingly united and corrected by the present tribulation, he will deliver us. Correction has come first, pardon will follow. Let us only pray on in steady faith, and like men placed between the ruins of the fallen and the remains of those who fear, between a numerous company of the sick and a small band of those who stand. End quote. The persecution at Carthage hence appears very dreadful, but mostly so on account of the number of apostates, and Christian faith, patience, and magnanimity in Cyprian, and a small remnant, were in full exercise. 
The persecutors endeavoured to lessen the number of Christians by banishing those who confessed Christ from Carthage, but this not answering to their purpose, they proceeded to cruel torments. Cyprian, hearing that some had expired under their sufferings, and others were still in prison yet alive, wrote to those last a letter of encouragement and consolation. Their limbs had been sorely mangled and torn, and appeared like one continued wound, yet they remained firm in the faith and love of Jesus. One of them, Mapalicus, amidst his torments, said to the proconsul, quote, "'Tomorrow you shall see a contest.' End quote. What he uttered in faith the Lord fulfilled, and he lost his life in the conflict next day. So keenly was the mind of Cyprian set on heavenly things, and so completely lifted up above the world, that he ardently exulted and triumphed in those scenes of horror. He described the martyrs and confessors as wiping away the tears of the church, while she was bewailing the ruin of her sons. Even Christ himself he describes as looking down with complacency, fighting and conquering in his servants, giving to believers as much strength as the receiver believes he can receive. Quote, he was present in the contest, says he, erected, corroborated, animated his warriors, and he who once conquered death for us always conquers in us. End quote. Toward the close he consoles, with suitable arguments, those who had not yet been crowned with martyrdom, but were prepared for it in spirit. The joy of Cyprian, on account of the faithfulness of the martyrs, must have been considerably damped by the disorderly conduct which began to take place in his absence. The lapsed Christians offered themselves to some of the presbyters of Carthage to be received into the church, who admitted them, without any just evidence of their repentance, to the Lord's Supper. Those who had suffered for Christ and were on the point of martyrdom, and to whom it was usual on these occasions to make application, wrote to Cyprian and desired that the consideration of these cases might be deferred till the persecution was stopped and the bishop was restored to his church. He dissembles not his pleasure on this occasion. Confesses he had long borne with these disorders for the sake of peace till he thought it was his duty to bear with them no longer, that it was quite unprecedented to transact these things without the consent of the bishop, that even in lesser offences a regular time of penitence was exacted of the members, a certain course of discipline took place, they made open confession of their sins, and were readmitted to communion by the imposition of hands of the bishop and his clergy. He directs that the irregular practice may be stopped, till on his return everything might be settled with propriety. Some of the martyrs themselves, it appears, acted very inconsiderately in this business, and gave recommendatory papers to lapsed persons, conceived in general terms. Cyprian wishes them to express the names of the persons and to give no such recommendations to any but those of whose sincere repentance they had some good proof and yet refer the cognizance of affairs to the bishop. Everything has two handles. Morsheim, in his ecclesiastical history, represents Cyprian as stretching the episcopal power beyond its due bounds. I see no evidence of his exceeding the powers of his predecessors and a pious care for the good of souls, not any ambition for the extension of his own authority, seems to influence his mind in these things, but of this the learned reader must judge for himself, who will take the pains to examine his epistles with attention. But the English reader may judge for himself by the following letter, and ask his own heart whether it is the language of a tender father of the church, or of an imperious lord. Quote, Cyprian to the brethren of the laity, greeting, I know from myself that you groan over and grieve for the ruin of our people, dearest brethren, as I groan over and grieve with you for each of them, and feel what the blessed apostle said, who is weak and I am not weak, who is offended and I burn not. And again he says, if one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. I sympathize and condole with our brethren, who, lapsing through the violence of persecution, draw with them part of our bowels, and by their wounds have brought acute pain to us. Divine grace is able indeed to heal them, yet I think we should not be in a hurry, nor do anything incautiously and precipitately, lest, while we rashly admit them into communion, the divine displeasure be more grievously incurred. The blessed martyrs have written to us, begging that their desires may be examined, when the Lord vouchsafing us peace, we return to the church. Then everything shall be examined in your presence and with concurrence of your judgments. 
Yet I hear that some presbyters, neither mindful of the gospel nor considering what the martyrs have written to us, and in contempt of the episcopal authority, have already begun to communicate with the lapsed, and to administer the Lord's Supper to them, in defiance of that legitimate order by which alone they should be admitted. For if in lesser faults this be observed, much more in evils like these which radically affect Christian profession itself. Our presbyters and deacons ought to admonish them of this, that they may cherish the sheep entrusted to them, and instruct them in the way of salvation by divine rules. I have too good opinion of the peaceable and humble disposition of our people to believe that they would have ventured to take such a step had they not been seduced by the adulatory arts of some of the clergy. Do you then take care of each of them, and by your judgment and moderation according to divine precepts, moderate the spirits of the lapsed? Let none pluck off fruit as yet unripe with improvident precipitation. Let none commit a vessel again to the deep, shattered already, and leaky, till it be carefully refitted. Let none put on his tattered garment till he see it thoroughly repaired. I beseech them to attend to our counsel, and expect our return, that when we shall come to you, by the mercy of God, we may examine the letters and the desires of the martyrs in the presence of the confessors, according to the will of the Lord, and with the concurrence of other bishops convened together. End quote. It is observable from hence that persons whose religion had more of form than sincerity, and whose consciences were not altogether seared, acted in the same manner then as such do now. They were more hasty to gain the good will of men than of their Maker. They were ambitious of the favour of persons of undoubted piety, as the martyrs then were, and we shall see soon still stronger proof that even men of undoubted godliness are sometimes too apt to repay the professions of respect made to them by concessions to those of ambiguous characters of a dangerous nature. The Lord's Supper was then, as it is now, made by some an engine of self-righteous formality, and it is in cases of this nature that wholesome church discipline is very precious. The danger of false healing justly appeared great to Cyprian, nor can anything be conceived more proper than the delay which he directed. Yet, as the time was protracted to a more distant period than he expected, and he was afraid that the sickly season of the hot weather might carry off some of the lapsed, he directs in a subsequent letter that any of the lapsed penitents whose lives might be in danger should, by such church officers as were authorised, be readmitted into the church. And he entreats his clergy to cherish the rest of the fallen Christians with care and tenderness, and observes that the grace of the Lord would not forsake the humble. His exhortations to his clergy were not without effect. They fell in with his views and solicited the people to patience, modesty, and real repentance, and asked of him how to act in critical cases, for which he refers them to the former letters, and repeats his idea of the proper time of settling the concerns of the rest, urging, at the same time, the indecency of some in expecting a readmission into the church before the return of those who were in exile and stripped of all their goods for the sake of the gospel. Quote, but if they are in such excessive hurry, it is in their own power to obtain even more than they desire. The battle is not yet over, the conflict is daily carrying on. If they cordially repent, and the fire of divine faith burns in their breasts, he who cannot brook a delay may, if he please, be crowned with martyrdom. End quote. The African prelate was ever studious of preserving an intimate connection with the Roman Church, where still the persecution raged, and permitted them not to elect a successor to Fabian. The next epistle is employed in giving them an account of his proceedings. But the bold neglect of discipline in Carthage proved a source of vexation to his mind, in addition to his other trials, and called forth all the patience, tenderness, and fortitude of which he was possessed. Lucian, a confessor of Christ, sincere and fervent in faith, but injudicious and too little acquainted with Christian precepts, undertook in the name of all the confessors to give peace to all the laps who had applied to them, and wrote a short letter to Cyprian, desiring him to inform the rest of the bishops what they had done, and that they would acquiesce in the views of the martyrs. It cannot be denied that, on the one hand, a superstitious veneration for the character of a martyr and a confessor had grown among these Africans, and that those who had suffered for Christ in persecution were apt to be elated with spiritual pride on the account, and to assume a right which by no means belonged to them. 
So dangerous a thing is it to be unacquainted with Satan's devices, and so prone in all ages are even professors of true religion to walk in the steps of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Cyprian sent a copy of this letter to his clergy at Carthage. Quote, to this man will I look, saith the Lord, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and that trembleth at my word. This character becomes us all, particularly those who have fallen, that indeed they may appear before the Lord humble and penitent indeed. End quote. He informs them that the bishops, his brethren, had agreed with him in opinion to defer the consideration of the cases of the lapsed to a council to be held by them in general, after it should please God to restore peace to his church, and he urges them to support his views, informing them at the same time of the correspondence between Caldonius, an African bishop, and himself, and sending them the copies of the letters. It is not known in what place Caldonius lived, but he, like Cyprian, was very cautious in restoring the lapsed to communion. Some, however, of his church, having apostatized by sacrifice, were called to a second trial, and recovered their ground, in consequence were driven into banishment and stripped of their property. Caldonius expressed his opinion that such should be readmitted. Felix, a presbyter, and his wife, Victoria, and Lucius, thus lost their possessions, which were forfeited to the imperial treasury. A woman also named Bona, who was dragged by her pagan husband to sacrifice, was, while they held her hands, compelled to a seeming compliance, but she fully cleared her integrity by saying, I did it not, ye have done it. She also was banished. Caldonius, having stated these facts and given his own opinion, asks the advice of Cyprian, who acquiesces in his judgment, wishing also that the rest of the lapsed who gave him so much affliction were disposed to retrieve their Christian character by these methods, rather than increase their faults by their pride and insolence. One Celerinus, a confessor, living in some part of Africa, most probably in banishment, was much pained on account of the apostasy of his two sisters, Numeria and Candida. He wept night and day in sackcloth and ashes on their account, and, hearing of Lucian still in prison and reserved for martyrdom at Carthage, he wrote to him to entreat him or any of his suffering brethren, particularly whosoever, should first be called to martyrdom to restore them to the church. He begs the same favour for Etcusa also, who, though she had not sacrificed, had given money to be excused from the act and he assures Lucian of the sincerity of their repentance evidenced by their kindness and assiduity in attending on their suffering brethren. He evidently attributes too much to the character of a martyr when he says he was a friend and a witness for Christ, and therefore could indulge all their desires. This letter and Lucian's answer demonstrate the mixture of good and evil, true grace tarnished with pitiable ignorance and superstition. Both Celerinus and Lucian were doubtless good men, but we are more disposed to be candid toward the evils of our own age than of those of preceding times. The conduct of Lucian affords a memorable instance of the pitiable weakness of human nature, even in a regenerate spirit. His answer to Celerinus demonstrates at once the most consummate fortitude, and as far as appears grounded on the true faith and love of Christ. Yet mixed with a deplorable and subtle spirit of pride, perhaps, yet certainly unknown to himself, he speaks of himself and his companions as shut up in two cells, oppressed with hunger and thirst, and intolerable heat arising from the pressure of the tortures. He mentions a number of them as already killed in prison, and informs them that in a few days he will hear of his expiring. Quote, For five days, says he, we have received very little bread and water by measure. End quote. Such were the sufferings of this persecution. Lucian speaks of all this in a cool, unaffected manner like one whose mind was lifted up above the world and its utmost malice, and patiently expected a blessed immortality. As to the question of Celerinus and his sisters, he informs him that Paul the martyr, who had lately suffered while yet in the body, called him and said, quote, Lucian, I say to thee before Christ that if any after my decease beg peace of you, you would impart it to him in my name, end quote. Lucian extends this generosity to the greatest height, and refers him to the general letter he had already written in behalf of the lapsed. Yet he owns they ought to explain their cause before the bishop and make a confession. It is plain, however, that he attributes a sort of superior dignity to Paul, himself, and the other martyrs in this matter, and the vainglory of martyrdom was no doubt much augmented by the excessive regard which now began to be paid to sufferers. Yet he speaks of his tears and sorrows on account of the lapsed women, 
and whilst we acknowledge that the corruptions of superstition with respect to the immoderate honours paid to saints and martyrs, and which were afterwards improved by Satan into idolatry itself, had already entered into the church, it ought to be candidly confessed that Lucian appears a person of real piety, though of small judgment. I have given the most material things in his letter, I hope without any mistake of consequence, which, whether from his very distressed circumstances, the corruptions of the text, or his own want of ability, is confused and perplexed beyond measure. It is evident that a spirit extremely dangerous to the cause of piety, humility, and wholesome discipline was spreading fast in the African church. Celerinus himself, who had been a confessor, owns that the cause of his sister had been heard by the clergy of her church, then it seems destitute of a bishop, who had deferred the settlement of it till the appointment of the chief pastor, but the precipitation of men would brook no delay. The eyes of all prudent and more discerning persons in the church were fixed on the bishop of Carthage in this emergency, the danger of the loss of the gospel itself by substituting a dependence on saints instead of Christ Jesus struck his mind. His connection with the Roman clergy and the superior regard to discipline which there prevailed was of some service on the occasion, and in his correspondence with them he compares the immoderate conduct of Lucian with the modesty of the martyr Mapalicus, who had abstained from such practices, only had written in behalf of his mother and sister, and of Saturninus, who was tortured and imprisoned, and yet sent out no letters at all. Lucian, he complains, gave out everywhere papers written with his own hand in the name of Paul, while alive, and continued to do so after his death, declaring that he had ordered him to do so, though he should have known that he ought to obey the Lord rather than his fellow-servant. A young person named Aurelius, who had suffered torments, was seized with the same vanity, but was unable to write, and Lucian wrote many papers in his name. Cyprian complains of the odium thus incurred by the bishops. In some cities he takes notice how the multitude had forced the bishops to readmit the lapsed, and he blames their want of faith and Christian constancy. In his own diocese he had occasion for all his fortitude. Some, who were formerly turbulent, were now much more so, and insisted on their speedy readmission. He takes notice of baptism being performed in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and the remission of past sins then received, and complains of the name of Paul, in effect, being inserted in the room of the Trinity. And St. Paul's well-known holy execration, denounced in the beginning of the epistle to the Galatians, he applies on this occasion. He owns his obligations to Rome for the letters of their clergy, which were well calculated to withstand these abuses. He wrote a congratulatory letter to Moises and Maximus, to whom he had formerly written, commending their faith and zeal, united with modesty, and the strictest attention to discipline, and he thanks them for the epistolary advice which they had given to the African confessors on that subject. In their answer they appear transported with holy joy, and elevated with the heavenly prospects before them. They quote the New Testament scriptures relating to these things, and express such strength of faith, hope, and charity, as demonstrates the real power of divine grace to have been possessed by them in a very eminent manner. Their love of the divine word and of just discipline appear no less great than their ardent zeal for martyrdom. They observe how deeply and how widely spread the evil of defection had been, and conclude with very just observations on the right method of treating the lapsed in perfect agreement with Cyprian. Greatness and order, warmth and judgment are equally evident in this epistle, and show from the just proportion of its parts that the work of the Holy Spirit was very sound in these holy men. Cyprian now wrote to the lapsed themselves, rebuking the precipitation of some, and exposing the injustice of their claims, since they acted as if they took to themselves the whole title of the church, and commending the modesty of others who refused to take advantage of the indiscreet recommendations of the martyrs, and wrote to him in the language of penitence, whence it appears that the folly of the lapsed was by no means universal. One Gaius Dedensis, a presbyter of his and his deacon, undertook, against the sense of the rest of the clergy, to communicate with the lapsed. Repeated admonitions availed not to a reformation. As the bishop was sensible that the common people, for whose salvation he was solicitous, were deceived by these things, he commends his clergy for refusing communion with them. He again intimates his intention of judging all things in full counsel upon his return, and entreats them to cooperate with his views in the maintenance of discipline in the meantime. 
In writing again to the Roman clergy, he declares his determination of acting as God had directed his ministers in the gospel, if the contumacious were not reformed by his and their admonitions. The Roman clergy, in another letter, condole with Cyprian, quote, because, say they, you have no rest in so great necessities of persecution, and because the immoderate petulance of the lapsed has proceeded to the height of arrogance. But though these things have grievously afflicted our spirits, yet your firmness and evangelical strictness of discipline hath moderated the load of our grief. While you both restrain the improbity of some, and by exhorting them to repentance show them the wholesome way of salvation, we are astonished that they should proceed to such lengths in a time so mournful, so unseasonable as the present, that they should not ask for peace, but claim it as a right, nay, say that they have it already in the heavens, end quote. They go on to confute their claims with arguments not impertinent, but which need not here be repeated, and in the spirit of Christian charity they proceed, quote, Do you, brother, desist not according to your charity to moderate the spirits of the lapsed, and to offer the medicine of truth to the erroneous, though the inclinations of the sick are wont to reject the industry of physicians. This wound of the lapsed is yet fresh, the stroke rises into a tumour, and therefore we are assured that in process of time, that impetuosity of theirs abating, they will be thankful that they were prevented for the present, and deferred to a wholesome cure, provided there be none to arm them with weapons against themselves, and by perverse instructions to demand for them the deadly poison of an over-hasty restoration, for we cannot think that they would all have dared to have claimed their admission so petulantly, without the encouragement of some persons of influence in the church. We know the faith of the Carthaginian church, its institution, its humility, whence we have been surprised that we observed some harsh reflections made against you in an epistle, when we have formerly had repeated proofs of your mutual charity. End quote. They proceed to give the most wholesome advice to the lapsed, and in truth the whole conduct of the Roman clergy at this time reflects the highest honour on their wisdom and charity, and affords the most pleasing proofs of the good state of that church at that time. The same can by no means be said of Cyprian's. They were, as we have seen, a declining people before his time. The scourge of persecution cut off vast numbers by apostasy. In those days of discipline, the lapsed showed the same dispositions of selfishness and pride, by their eagerness for readmission, which in our times are evinced by wanting to hear nothing but comfort preached to them, by finding fault with ministers who dare not speak false peace, and by unsoundly healing themselves, we are perfectly lax in point of discipline. Few seem to value its menaces on the disorderly. With the first Christians it was an awful subject. The same depravity of nature seems now to work on the corrupt in another way, and to exercise still the patience and fortitude of godly ministers, who, by still persevering in their duty and not giving way to the unreasonable humours of their people in things of importance, will find, in the end, a wholesome issue with respect to many, at least, of their froward people. There was one Privatus, an African, who had left Africa and, coming to Rome, solicited to be received as a Christian. Cyprian had mentioned him to the Roman clergy and pointed out his real and dangerous character. In the close of this admirable letter, they inform him that before they had received his letters, they had detected the fraud of the man. At the same time, they lay a golden maxim, quote, that we all ought to watch for the body of the whole church diffused through various provinces, end quote. It was this unity and uniformity of the Christian church which hitherto had preserved it under God from the infection of heresies. None of them were yet able to mix themselves with the body of Christ, and instead of being broken into small handfuls of distinct sets of persons, all glorying in having something peculiarly excellent and apt to despise their neighbours, as yet the church knew no other name than Christian. Diversity of place alone prevented their assembling altogether, but they were one people. In Italy and Africa the union at this time appears very salubrious, and the vigour and spirit of Cyprian was enabled to apply the solid graces of the Roman church for the reformation of his own disordered flock. The Roman clergy, in a second letter, take notice of St. Paul's eulogium of their church in the beginning of his epistle, that their faith was spoken of through the whole world, and express their desire of still treading in their steps. They mention the cases of Libelatici, which were twofold, First, those who delivered in books to heathen magistrates, abjuring the gospel, and at the same time begging off the act of sacrificing by money. 
secondly, those who got their friends to do these things for them. Both these and those who had actually sacrificed were censured by the Roman clergy as lapsed persons. They mention, likewise, the letters sent by the Roman confessors into Africa to the same purport, and express their pleasure on account of the consistency of their conduct in matters of discipline with their sufferings for the faith. They declare their agreement, in opinion with him, to defer the settlement of these matters to an united plan after peace should be restored. Quote, Behold, say they, almost the whole world laid waste, and the remains of the fallen to lie everywhere, with one and the same counsel, with unanimous prayers and tears let us, who seem hitherto to have escaped the ruins of time, as well as those who seem to have fallen into them, entreat the divine majesty and beg peace in the name of the whole church. Let us cherish, guard, arm one another with mutual prayers. Let us entreat for the lapsed, that they may be raised. Let us pray for those who stand, that they may not be tempted to ruin. Let us pray that those who have fallen, insensible of the greatness of the crime, may have the wisdom not to wish for a crude and momentary medicine, nor disturb the yet fluctuating state of the church, lest they appear to have inflamed an internal persecution. Let them knock at the doors, but not break them. Let them go to the threshold of the church, but not leap over it. Let them watch at the gates of the heavenly camp, but with that modesty which becomes those who remember they have been deserters. Let them arm themselves, indeed, with the weapons of humility, and resume that shield of faith which they dropped through the fear of death. But, so that they may be armed against the devil, not against the church who grieves at their fall. End quote. The want of a bishop at Rome was an additional reason for delay. They speak of some neighbouring bishops who had the same views, and of some who had fled to them from distant provinces through the flame of persecution. There was one Aurelius who twice underwent the rage of persecution for the sake of Christ. Banishment was his first punishment, and torture the second. Cyprian speaks of him as though very young, yet excelling in the graces of Christianity. Him he ordained a reader in the church of Carthage, and excuses from the circumstances of the case his not having previously consulted his presbyters and deacons, and beseeches them to pray that both himself and Aurelius may be restored to them. I cannot but observe from hence how exact and orderly the ideas of ordination were in those times. It is not to the advantage of godliness among us that any person can now, without ceremony, assume to himself the highest offices in the ministry." Salarinus was also ordained a reader by the same authority. However weak in judgment he may appear from the transactions between him and Lucian already stated, the man suffered with great zeal for the sake of Christ. The very beginning of the persecution found him a ready combatant. For nineteen days he had remained in prison, fettered and starved. But he persevered and escaped at length without martyrdom. But his grandfather and two uncles had suffered for Christ, and their anniversaries were celebrated by the church. It seems that Cyprian thought proper to reward with honourable establishments in the church those who had suffered with the greatest faithfulness in the persecution which was now drawing to a close. Numidicus was advanced to the office of presbyter. He had attended a great number of martyrs, murdered partly with stones and partly by fire. His wife, sticking close by his side, was burnt to death with the rest himself half-burnt, buried with stones, and left for dead, was found afterwards by his daughter, and drawn out and recovered. This seems to be the effect of a tumultuary persecution. One may conceive that the ferocity of many would not, in those times, wait for legal orders to oppress Christians. What an indefinite number of sufferers must be added to the list of martyrs on this account. Amidst all these cares, the charity and diligence of Cyprian towards his flock was unremitted, the reader who loves the annals of genuine and active godliness will not be wearied in seeing still fresh proofs of it in extracts of two letters to his clergy. Quote, Dear brethren, I salute you, still safe by the grace of God, wishing to come soon to you, that my desire, yours, and that of all the brethren may be gratified. Whenever, on the settlement of your affairs, you shall write to me that I ought to come, or, if the Lord should condescend to show it me before, then I will come to you. For where can I have more happiness and joy than there where God appointed me both to believe and to grow up? I beseech you, take diligent care of the widows, the sick, and all the poor, and supply also strangers, if any be indigent, with what is needful for them, out of my proper portion which I left with Rogation the presbyter. And lest that portion by this time should be all spent, I have sent to the same, by 
the Carius, the Acolith, another portion that you may the more readily and largely supply the distressed. Though I know you have been frequently admonished by my letters to show all care for those who have gloriously confessed the Lord and are in prison, yet I must repeatedly entreat the same thing. I wish circumstances permitted my presence among you. With the greatest pleasure would I discharge the offices of love towards you, but do you represent me? A decent care for the interment, not only of those who died in torture, but also of such as died under the pressures of confinement, is necessary. For whoever hath submitted himself to torture and death under the eye of God, hath already suffered all that God would have him suffer. Mark also the days in which they depart this life, that we may celebrate their commemoration among the memorials of the martyrs. Though our most faithful and devoted friend Tertullus, agreeably to his usual attention and care, who also attends to their obsequies, hath written and still writes and intimates to me the days in which the blessed martyrs are transmitted to immortality, and their memorials are here celebrated, and I hope shortly, under divine providence, to be able to celebrate them with you. Let not your care and diligence be wanting for the poor, who have stood firm in the faith, and fought with us in the Christian warfare. Our love and attention are more requisite, because neither poverty nor persecution have driven them from the love of Christ. End quote. It is obvious to see into what idolatry these commemorations of martyrs afterwards degenerated, but I observe no signs of it in the days of Cyprian. In addition to other evils, the providence of God now thought fit to exercise the mind of Cyprian with a calamity, one of the worst, to a lover of peace and charity, the rise of a schism. There was one Felicissimus, in the church of Carthage, who had long been a secret enemy of the bishop, and a person of very exceptionable character. He had now, by the artifices and blandishments used by seditious persons in all ages, drawn some of the flock to him, and held communion with them on a certain mountain. Some persons being sent from Cyprian to pay the debts of the poor brethren, and to furnish them with a little money to begin business again, and also to make a report of their ages, conditions, and qualities, that he might select some of them for ecclesiastical offices. Felicissimus opposed them and thwarted both these designs. Some of the poor who came first to be relieved were threatened by him with imperious severity because they refused to communicate with him on the mountain. This man, growing more insolent and taking advantage of Cyprian's absence, whose return he speedily expected, as the persecution had nearly ceased at Carthage, set up in form an opposition to the bishop and threatened those who would not communicate with him and found means to unite a considerable party to himself, to his other crimes the man had added that of adultery, and now saw no method of preventing an infamous excommunication but that of setting up as a leader himself. One Orgendus was his second, and did his utmost to promote his views. Cyprian by letter expresses his vehement sorrow on account of these evils, promises to take full cognizance of them on his return, and in the meantime he writes to his clergy to suspend from communication Felicissimus and his abettors and his clergy wrote him in answer that they had suspended the chiefs of the faction accordingly. In the meantime, there were not wanting upright and zealous ministers who instructed the people at Carthage. Among these were distinguished Britius, the presbyter, also Rugatian and Numidicus, confessors and some deacons of real godliness. These warned the people of the evils of schism, endeavoured to preserve peace and unity, and to recover the lapsed by wholesome methods. In addition to their labours, Cyprian wrote now to the people, quote, For, says he, the malice and perfidy of some presbyters hath effected that I should not be able to come to you before Easter. But now, whence the faction of Felicissimus has been derived, on what foundation it stands is evident. These encouraged certain confessors that they should not harmonise with their bishop, nor observe ecclesiastical discipline faithfully and modestly and as if it were too little for them to have corrupted the minds of confessors and to arm them against their pastor and stain the glory of their confession, they turned themselves to poison the spirits of the lapsed, to keep them from the great duty of constant prayer and to invite them to an unsound and dangerous peace. But I beseech you, brethren, watch against the snares of the devil, solicitous for your own salvation. This is a second persecution and temptation. The five seditious presbyters may be justly compared to the five pagan rulers who lately published some plausible arguments in conjunction with the magistrates to subvert souls. The same method is tried by the five presbyters, united with Felicissimus, to ruin your souls, that you should not ask of God. 
that he who denied Christ should cease to supplicate the same Christ whom he hath denied, that repentance should be removed, and everything should be conducted in a novel manner against the rules of the gospel. My banishment of two years, it seems, was not sufficient, and my mournful separation from your presence, my constant grief and perpetual lamentation, and my tears flowing day and night, because the pastor whom you chose, with so much love and zeal, could not salute nor embrace you. To my distressed spirit, still greater evil is added, that in so great a solicitude I cannot come over to you. The threats and snares of the perfidious oblige me to caution, lest on my arrival the tumult should increase, and whereas the bishop ought to provide in all things for peace and tranquillity, he himself should seem to have afforded matter for the sedition, and again to exasperate the persecution. Most dear brethren, I beseech you, do not give rash credit to pernicious words, nor put darkness for light. They speak, but not from the word of the Lord. They promise to restore the lapsed, who are themselves separated from the church. There is one God, one Christ, one church. Depart, I pray you, far from these men, and avoid their discourse as a plague and pestilence. They hinder your prayers and tears by affording you false consolations. Acquiesce, I beseech you, in our counsel, who pray daily for you, and desire you to be restored to the church by the grace of our Lord. Join your prayers and tears with ours. But if any, careless of repentance, shall betake himself to Felicissimus and his party, let him know that his after-return to the church will be impracticable. End quote. But I cannot, by a few extracts, give a perfect idea of the glowing charity which reigned in Cyprian's breast on this occasion. Whoever has attended to the imbecility of human nature, ever prone to consult ease and to humour self, and to admit flattery, will see the difficult trials of patience which faithful pastors in all ages have endured from the insidious arts of those who would heal the wounds of people falsely. Uncharitable and imperious are the usual epithets with which they are aspersed for their faithfulness but wisdom is justified of her children. But there was another character who was the primary agent of these disagreeable scenes, Novatus, a presbyter of Carthage, a man extremely scandalous and immoral. His domestic crimes had been so notorious as to render him not only no longer fit to be a minister, but even unworthy to be received into lay communion. The examination of his conduct was just going to take place when the breaking out of Decius's persecution prevented it. He it was who supported and cherished the views of Felicissimus and the rest, and appears by his address and capacity to have been extremely able to cause much mischief in the church, without the power of benefiting it in the least, from his entire want of conscience and honesty. Felicissimus himself, though at first the ostensible leader of the congregation on the mountain, gave way to Fortunatus, one of the five presbyters, who was constituted bishop in opposition to Cyprian, most of the five had been already branded with infamy for immoralities, yet so deep is the corruption of human nature, even where the light of the gospel shines, that even such will find advocates to espouse them against pastors of eminent sanctity, who irritate the corruptions of men by refusing to speak peace where there is no peace. It is no little proof of the strength of these evils that even a persecution of the most dreadful yet recorded in the annals of the church did not unite Christian professors in love. One hence sees the necessity for so severe a scourge to the church, and the advantages thence accruing to the real faithful, either by happily removing them to rest out of a world of sin and vanity, or by promoting their sanctification if their pilgrimage be prolonged. Novatus, either unwilling to face the bishop of Carthage, or desirous to extend the mischiefs of schism, passed the sea and came to Rome. There he separated from the church a priest named Novation, a friend of the confessor Moises, whose sufferings at Rome were of a tedious nature. Moises renounced his acquaintance on this, and died soon after in prison, where he had been near a year. He entered into full peace at length, having left the evidence of modesty and peaceableness, in addition to his other more splendid virtues, as testimonies of his love to the Lord Jesus. Novatus found the ideas of his new partner in religion placed in an extreme opposite to his own. Novation had been a Stoic before he was a Christian, and he still retained the rigour of the sect to such a degree that he held it wrong to receive those into the church who once had lapsed, though they gave the sincerest marks of repentance. Full of these unwarranted severities, he exclaimed against the unreasonable lenity of the Roman clergy in receiving penitence. Many of the clergy of Rome, who were still in prison for the faith, were seduced by his apparent zeal for church discipline, among others Maximus and others, to whom Cyprian had formerly written. 
these joined novation, his African tutor with astonishing inconsistency, after having stirred up a general indignation in Africa against the bishop for severity to the lapsed, now supported a party who complained of too much lenity at Rome and defended two extremes, it is hard to say which is the worse, with equal pertinacity within the compass of two years. The Roman clergy thought it high time to stem the torrent. They had for sixteen months, with singular piety and fortitude, governed the church during one of its most stormy seasons. Schism was now added to persecution. To be chosen bishop of Rome was plainly for a man to expose himself to martyrdom, for Decius threatened bishops with great haughtiness and asperity. Sixteen bishops, happening to be then at Rome, ordained Cornelius as the successor of Fabian. He was very unwilling to accept the office, but the election of a bishop to withstand the growing schism appeared necessary, and the people who were present approved of his ordination. Novation procured himself to be ordained bishop in opposition, in a very regular manner, and vented calumnies against Cornelius, whose life appears to have been worthy of the gospel. Thus was formed the first body of Christians, who in modern language ought to be called dissenters, that is, men who separate from the general church, not on grounds of doctrine, but of discipline. The Novationists held no opinion contrary to the faith of the gospel. It is certain, from some writings of Novation extant, that their leader was sound in the doctrine of the Trinity, but the confessors, whom his pretensions to superior purity had seduced, returned afterwards to the communion of Cornelius, and wept over their own credulity. In a letter of Cornelius to Fabius, bishop of Antioch, we have occasionally the mention of a few circumstances which may give an idea of the Church of Rome at that time. There were under the bishop forty-six priests, seven deacons, seven subdeacons, forty-two acolyths, fifty-two exorcists, and readers with porters, widows and impotent persons above one thousand fifty souls. The number of the laity was, says he, innumerable. I don't know so authentic a memorial of the numbers of the Christians in those times. In his letter he charges Novation, perhaps without sufficient warrant, with having denied himself to be a priest during the heat of the persecution, and with obliging his separatists, when he administered to them the Lord's Supper, to swear to adhere to him. He was daily more and more forsaken, and the party at Rome lost ground. In Africa, whither Novatus returned, the party held up its head and ordained Nicostratus the deacon, the only person of note who was seduced at Rome by Novation, and who refused to return to communion with Cornelius. Conscious of scandalous crimes, he fled from Rome and became bishop of the Novatians in Africa. It would not have been worth while to have detailed these events thus distinctly, but to mark the symptoms of declension in the church, the unity of which was now broken for the first time. For it ought not to be thought that all the Novatians were men void of the faith and love of Jesus, the artifices of Satan also, in pushing forward opposite extremes, are worthy of notice. He tried both the lax and the severe method in point of discipline. The former he finds more suitable to the state of Christianity among us, but it could gain no solid footing in the third century. The Novation schism stood at last on the ground of excessive severity, a certain proof of the strictness of discipline then fashionable among Christians, and of course of great purity of life and doctrine having been prevalent among them but to refuse the readmission of penitence was a dangerous instance of pharisaical pride, though in justice to novation it ought to be mentioned that he advised the exhorting of the lapsed to repentance, and then leaving them to the judgment of God. But extreme austerity and superstition were now growing evils, and cherished by false philosophy. On the same plan novation also condemned second marriages. At length Cyprian ventured out of his retreat and returned to Carthage, in what manner he conducted himself shall be the subject of the next chapter. End of chapter 9。Chapter 10 of The History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cyprian's settlement of his church after his return and the history of the Western Church till the persecution under Gallus. The prudence of Cyprian had been so remarkable during the whole of the persecution of Decius that we may fairly conclude he had ceased to apprehend any personal danger when he appeared again in public at Carthage. In fact, it was not the cessation of malice but the distraction of public affairs which put an end to the persecution. 
Decius, on account of the incursion of the Goths, was obliged to leave Rome, and God gave a breathing time to his servants, while men of the world were wholly taken up with resisting or mourning under their calamities. After Easter, a council was held at Carthage, and the eyes of Christians were turned toward it, in expectation of some settlement of the very confused state of the church under the auspices of Cyprian and the other bishops of Africa. There, at first, for want of exact information of circumstances, some delay was made before Cornelius was owned as legitimate bishop of Rome, but when the truth of things was laid open, the regularity of his appointment and the violation of order in the schismatical ordination of novation by some persons who were in a state of intoxication, there was no room to hesitate. Novation was rejected in the African synod, and Philicissimus, with his five presbyters, was condemned. And now the case of the lapsed, which had given so much disquietude, and which Cyprian had so often promised to settle in full council, was finally determined, and with men who feared God it was no hard thing to adjust a due medium. A proper temperature was used between the precipitation of the lapsed and the stoical severity of novation. Hence penitents were restored, and the case of dubious characters was deferred, and yet every method of Christian charity was used to facilitate their restoration." Fortunatus preserved still a schismatical assembly, but both this bishop and his flock shrunk soon into insignificance. The Christian authority of Cyprian was restored. The Novation party alone remained a long time after, in Africa and elsewhere, numerous enough to continue a distinct body of professing Christians. The little light which Christian annals afford of these dissenters, and it is very little, shall be given in its place. I feel not the least inclination to partiality concerning them, for I am conscious that God is not confined to any particular modes of church government. The laws of historical truth have obliged me, indeed, to observe that their secession could not be justified, but that does not render it impossible that the Spirit of God might be with some of this people during their continuance as a distinct body of Christians. Thus did it please God to make use of the vigour and perseverance of Cyprian in recovering the church of Carthage from a state of most deplorable declension, First, she had lost her purity and piety to a very alarming degree, then was torn with persecution and sifted by the storm so much that the greatest part of her professors apostatized, afterwards convulsed by schisms because of men's unwillingness to submit to the rules of God's own word, in wholesome discipline and sincere repentance. On Cyprian's return, however, and the new train of discipline established by the council, Carthage, and most probably Africa, assumed a new face, Unity was restored in a great measure, and though we want the accounts of particular instances, there is all reason to believe that the Church of God was much recovered in these parts. Decius lost his life in battle in the year 251, after having reigned thirty months. A prince not deficient in abilities and moral virtues, but distinguished during this whole period by the most cruel persecution of the Church of God, he was bent on its ruin, but perished himself. His successor was Gallus, who for a little time allowed peace to the church. It would now be proper to look into the east and see the effects of the persecution there. Only a few circumstances which had attended it in the west must detain us a little longer. Cyprian, zealous for the unity of the church, informed Cornelius that certain persons came to Carthage from Novation, who insisted on being heard as to some charges which they had to produce against Cornelius but as sufficient and ample testimony had already been given in favour of Cornelius, and a prudent delay had been made use of till the sense of the Church of Rome had been authentically exhibited, they refused to hear the novations any more. These, he observes, began to strive to make a party in Africa, going into private houses and different towns for that purpose. The Council of Carthage informed them that they ought to cease their obstinacy and not to relinquish their mother the Church, and to own that a bishop, being once constituted and approved by the testimony and judgment of his colleagues and the people, another could not be lawfully set up in his room. Therefore, if they would consult for themselves peaceably and faithfully, if they owned themselves to be the asserters of the gospel of Christ, they ought to return to the church. Though the ideas of this epistle may sound very strange to the ears of many professors of godliness in our days, I see not, I own, on what principles they can be controverted. There is a medium between the despotism of idolatrous Rome and the extreme licentiousness of many in our day. Is peace to be preserved in the church? Is unity precious? Certainly. Then the sense of the majesty where a church has been evangelically settled, and pastors sound in faith and manners are appointed, ought to prevail. 
it cannot be right for single persons on no better ground than their own fancy and humour to dissent. This is not keeping the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, but this was the first origin of the novation schism. Persons who have used themselves to the lawless mode of acting in religion which now so unhappily prevails, who feel no pity for the Church of Christ, nor care how much her members be torn one from another, and make no more difficulty of charging their pastors than their workmen, will not enter into the beauty of Cyprian's charitable concern for the unity of the Church. It is evident union at Rome was as much on his heart as union at Carthage, because he considered Christ's body as one. He explains to Cornelius why the acknowledgment of him as bishop was delayed, and how he was honourably received on full information. He speaks of the Roman schism with horror, he represents the Christian schismatics as refusing the bosom and embrace of their mother, and as setting up an adulterous head out of the church. I will not vindicate expressions which go to the length of a total condemnation of the persons of all schismatics. Schism is not so deadly an evil as heresy, nor must we judge of the hearts of others. But Cyprian's zeal requires in all reason that equal candor be shown to himself. The evil which had just begun to show itself in Rome and Carthage was then new in the Christian world. Before his time no instance had happened of any separations made from the church, but for the support of damnable heresies, and, it must be confessed, if really good men in all ages had possessed the same conscientious dread of the sin, it had fared much better with vital Christianity, and those separations which must of necessity be made, when not tolerable inconveniences, but false worship and false doctrine are prevalent, would be treated with more respect in the world. Encouraged with the success of his pacific labours at home, Cyprian endeavoured to heal the breaches of Rome. He was sensible that the examples of the confessors whom Novation's appearance of superior piety and discipline had seduced had been attended with a great defection. He wrote respectfully to his former correspondents, assuring them that the deepest sadness had possessed his breast on their account. He reminds them of the honour of their faithful sufferings, and entreats their return to the church, and points out the inconsistency of their glorious confession of Christ with their present irregularity. But so exactly attentive was Cyprian to order, that he first sent the letter to Cornelius, and ordered it to be read to him, and submitted to his discussion before he would suffer it to be sent to the confessors. With the same cautious charity, he explains again to Cornelius some things which had given him umbrage with respect to the delay of the acknowledgement of his ordination. The chief reason why I think these things enter into my plan is because the conduct of the African prelate is calculated to instruct Christian ministers in all ages to enlarge their views as far as the whole Church of Christ, and then only to think they grow in true zeal and true charity when they fear the evils of division and labour to preserve peace and unity. The progress of Christian grace is seen much in these things. There is the greatest reason to believe that the authority of Cyprian had a great effect on the minds of Maximus and the other seduced confessors, whose undoubted piety gave the chief support to Novation's party. But, as it often happens, the excessive eagerness of the schismatics defeated their own end at Rome. They were so fraudulent as to send out frequent letters in their name almost through all the churches to spread the schism. Maximus and the rest informed of this were surprised, owned themselves circumvented, and declared they knew not a syllable of the contents of these letters. Such the woeful fruits of discord. Their eyes now began to be opened, and they heartily desired a reunion with the church. The whole body of the Roman church, and there is every reason to believe it was at that time as pure a church as most, sympathized with these confessors both in their seduction and in their recovery. Tears of joy and thanksgiving to God were discovered in the assembly. Quote, we confess, say Maximus and the rest, with ingenuous frankness, our mistake. We own Cornelius, the bishop of the most holy general church chosen by God Almighty and Christ our Lord. We suffered an imposture. We were circumvented by treachery and a captious plausibility of speech. For though we seem to have had some communication with a schismatic and a heretic, yet our mind was sincerely with the church, for we knew that there is one God, one Christ, one Lord, whom we have confessed, one Holy Ghost, that one bishop ought to be in the general church. Quote. Quote, Should we not, says Cornelius, be moved with their profession, that what they had dared to confess before the world they might approve, being restored to the church? Maximus the Presbyter we restored to his office, the rest we received with the strong consent of the people. End quote. 
Cyprian, with his usual animation, congratulated Cornelius on the event and describes the happy effect which the example of the confessors had on the minds of the people. In truth, more tenderness of conscience, in point of schism, in many good men who in modern times appear to me to have suffered themselves to be harassed by needless and frivolous scruples, might have prevented much evil in the Church of Christ. But no one can now be deceived, says Cyprian, by the loquacity of a frantic schismatic, since it appears that good and glorious soldiers of Christ could no longer be detained out of the church by perfidy and fallacy. The Novatians being baffled at Rome, Novatus and Nicostratus went over to Africa. We have seen what they did there, and Cornelius wrote to warn Cyprian against their attempts. There is a disagreeable harshness of language in his account of his enemies in this letter. Much of the same spirit is breathed in the fragment of his epistle in Eusebius. But though the character of Novatus appears entirely indefensible, and so does the whole ground of the schism, nor is there the least reason to believe that the Spirit of God had left the general church to abide with the dissenters, yet the personal characters of some of their supporters might be excellent. I shall find a convenient place, by and by, to examine, as well as I can, that of Novatian himself. Of Novatus the Bishop of Carthage, one who must have thoroughly known him, asserts expressly and circumstantially that he was guilty of horrible crimes, which in truth is neither pleasant in itself to particularize, nor does the plan of this history require that I should. The charity of Cyprian requires that this testimony should be admitted. He was as remarkable for moderation as for zeal. He speaks with much sensibility of persons seduced by the arts of the foul impostor, and observes those only will perish who are willful in their evils. The rest, says he, the mercy of God the Father will unite with us, and the grace of our Lord Christ and our patience. I wish this benevolent spirit had had so good an opportunity of knowing Novation as Novatus. But a Roman, who does not appear ever to have come into Africa at all, could only be made known to him by report. In answer to a friendly letter of the Roman confessors, Cyprian, after congratulating them on their reunion with the church, and expressing his sincere sorrow for the former defection, delivers his sentiments on the duty of Christians in this point. The flattering idea which had seduced these good men was a notion of appointing a church here on earth exactly pure and perfect. He may be heard with patience on this subject, who had sustained so much ill-will on account of his attention to discipline, Yet, while he thought it necessary that the lapsed should show good marks of penitence, he was far from supposing that men should be able to decide positively in all cases who were true Christians and who not, and to rectify all abuses and cleanse the church of all tears. The middle state between impracticable efforts of severity and licentious neglect was Cyprian's judgment, and to separate from the visible church for the want of that exact purity in the members which the present state of things does not admit of, he held to be culpable. But let the reader hear him speak on a point which, though not of the first importance, deserves, on account of its influence on practice, to be deeply considered by all friends of vital godliness. Quote, though there appears to be tears in the church, our faith and love ought not to be impeded so, that because we see tears in the church we must leave it. Our business is to labour that we ourselves be found sound bread, that when the corn shall be gathered into the harvest, we may receive reward according to our labour. The Apostle speaks of vessels not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honour and some to dishonour. Be it our care that we be found vessels of gold or silver, but to break in pieces the vessels of earth belongs to the Lord alone, to whom is given a rod of iron. The servant cannot be greater than his master, nor can any man claim to himself what the father attributes to the son alone, that he should think himself capable of thoroughly purging the floor, or separating all the wheat from the tears by human judgment. It is proud obstinacy and sacrilegious presumption which a depraved madman assumes to himself, and while some lay claim to a dominion beyond the demands of justice and equity, they perish from the church and while they insolently extol themselves, blinded by their own humour, they lose the light of truth. For this cause, holding a temperature and contemplating the balance of the Lord, and thirsting for the holiness and mercy of God the Father, after a long and careful deliberation we have settled a just mediocrity. I refer you to my books on the subject, which I lately read here, and from common charity, have sent over to you to read, in which neither a due censure is wanting to the lapsed, nor medicine to heal the penitent. 
I have expressed also my thoughts on the unity of the Church to the best of my poor judgment. End quote. There was one Antoninus, a bishop of some note, who was disposed to embrace the Novatian schism. To him, Cyprian, in a long letter, explains with much force and clearness the whole of his ideas on the subject. A very short abridgment of it may be given because of the charity and good sense which runs through it. He clears himself from the charge of inconsistency by showing the views on which he formerly acted with strictness, now with lenity, under very different circumstances, informs him what had been determined both at Rome and Carthage concerning the lapsed, enlarges on the virtues of Cornelius, who had ventured his life in a time of severe trial under Decius, defends him against the unjust dispersions of the innovations, and demonstrates that very different rules and methods should be used according to the different circumstances of offenders, and that Novatian's Stoicism, by which all sins are equal, was vastly different from the genius of Christianity. He supports his ideas of mercy by striking and apposite passages of Scripture. For instance, the whole need not a physician but the sick. What sort of a physician is he who says, I cure only the sound? Quote, Nor ought we to think those whom we see wounded by the deadly persecution to be dead, but to lie half dead, else we should not afterwards behold in them the true characters of confessors and martyrs. End quote. He shows that the censures of the church are not to anticipate the judgment of the Lord. His quotations of scripture may well be spared in behalf of receiving penitence again into the church. The uncharitableness of novation will hardly now find a defender. He beautifully insists on the propriety and wholesomeness of mercy, gentleness and charity, and exposes the unreasonableness of the descent from this circumstance that formerly in Africa some bishops denied a return into the church for adulterers, yet did not form a schism on that account. And yet an adulterer appears to him to deserve a greater degree of severity than a man who lapses through fear of torment. And he exposes the absurdity of the innovations exhorting men to repent while they rob them of all those comforts and hopes which should encourage repentance. It is observable that he alleges nothing particular against the personal character of novation, only his schism he looks on with all that excess of severity which I blamed above. See from another circumstance the strictness of discipline which then prevailed in the purest churches. Several persons who stood firm for a time in persecution, and afterwards fell through extremity of torment, were three years kept in a state of exclusion from the church, and lived that time with every mark of true repentance. Cyprian, being consulted, decided that they ought to be restored to the church. The appearance of a new persecution from Gallus now threatening the church, Cyprian and the African synod, wrote to Cornelius about hastening the time of receiving penitence, that they might be armed for the approaching storm. In the meantime, Felicissimus, finding after his condemnation no security to his reputation in Africa, crossed the sea to Rome, raised a party against Cornelius, and by menaces threw him into great fear. Cyprian's spirit seems more disturbed on this occasion than in any of his epistles I have yet observed. He supports the dignity of the episcopal character in a style of great magnificence, and it is from hence evident that his continued ill-treatment from men of this character led him into some degrees of impatience, and the language he uses of the authority of bishops would sound strange to our ears, though it by no means contains any definite ideas contrary to the scripture. The whole epistle in which he rouses the dejected spirit of Cornelius shows much of the hero, not so much of the Christian. He confesses indeed that he speaks grieved and compelled by a series of undeserved ill-treatment. He takes notice that at the very time of writing this he was again demanded by the people to be exposed to the lions. He speaks of the ordination of Fortunatus, and also of one Maximus by the schismatics in a contemptuous manner. Yet it is evident that on the whole he triumphed in Carthage among his people. His great virtues and unquestionable sincerity secured him the affections of the church, they scarce had patience when he was for readmitting a lapsed offender of note into the church, and when such were not amended by his lenity, they expressed their resentment. The eloquence and even the genuine charity of this great man appears through the epistle, but it is deficient in the meekness and patience which shine in his other performances. End of chapter 10《ジャプター11 of the History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
the effects of the persecution of Decius in the Eastern Church. The Eastern and Western Churches were divided in those times by the Greek and Roman language from each other, though cemented by the common bond of the Roman government, and much more of the common salvation. It will often be found convenient to consider their history distinctly. The Gentile Church of Jerusalem still maintained its respectability under Alexander its bishop, who has been spoken of above. He was again called on to confess Christ before the tribunal of the president at Caesarea, and in this second trial of his faith, having acquitted himself with his usual fidelity, he was cast into prison. His venerable locks procured him no pity nor respect, and he finally breathed out his soul under confinement. At Antioch, Babylus, after his confession, dying in bonds, Fabius was chosen his successor. In this persecution, the renowned Origen was called to suffer extremely. Bonds, torments, a dungeon, the pressure of an iron chair, the distension of his feet for many days, the threats of burning and other evils were inflicted by his enemies, which he manfully endured. All these things ended at last in the preservation of his life, the judge solicitously taking care that his tortures should not kill him. Quote, what words he uttered on those occasions, and how useful to those who need consolation, many of his epistles, says Eusebius, declare with no less truth than accuracy. End quote. Were they now extant, more light, I apprehend, might be thrown on the internal character of Origen in respect to experimental godliness than by all his works which remain. These show the scholar, the philosopher, and the critic. Those would have shown the Christian. This great man died in his seventieth year, about the same time as the Emperor Decius. An estimate of his character I shall find occasion to insert by and by. Dionysius was at this time Bishop of Alexandria, a person of great and deserved renown in the church. We are obliged to Eusebius for a few of his remains, some of which, being historical, must be here inserted. In an epistle to Germanus he speaks thus, quote, Sabinus, the Roman governor, sent an officer to seek me during the persecution of Decius, and I remained four days at home, expecting his coming. He made the most accurate search in the roads, the rivers, and the fields where he suspected I might be hid. A confusion seems to have seized him that he could not find my house, for he had no idea that a man in my circumstances should stay at home. At length, after four days, God ordered me to remove, and having opened me a way contrary to all expectation, I and my servants and many of the brethren went together. The event showed the whole was the work of divine providence. About sunset, being seized together with my company by the soldiers, I was led to Tapasiris. But my friend Timotheus, by the providence of God, was not present, nor was he seized. But coming afterwards, he found my house forsaken, and ministers guarding it, and that we were taken captive. How wonderful was the dispensation! But it shall be related with truth. A countryman met Timotheus flying in confusion, and asked the cause of his hurry. He told him the truth. The peasant hearing it went away to a nuptial feast, for in them the custom was to watch all night. He informed the guests of what he had heard. At once they all rose up, as by a signal, and ran quickly to us, and shouted. Our soldiers, struck with a panic, fled, and the invaders found us as we were on naked beds. I first thought they must have been a company of robbers, and remaining on my bed in my linen garment, reached to them the rest of my apparel, which was just by. They ordered me to rise and go out quickly. At length, understanding their real designs, I cried out, entreating them earnestly to depart and let us alone. But if they really meant any kindness to us, I begged them to prevent my persecutors and take off my head. They compelled me to rise by plain violence, and I threw myself on the ground. They, seizing my hands and feet, pulled me out by force. I was set on an ass and conducted from the place. In so remarkable a manner was this useful life preserved to the church. We shall see it was not in vain. In an epistle to Fabius, bishop of Antioch, he gives this account of the persecution at Alexandria, which had preceded the Decian persecution a whole year, and which must have happened therefore under Philip, the most open friend of Christians. Quote, a certain augur and poet took pains to stir up the malice of the Gentiles against us and to inflame them with a zeal for the support of their superstitions. Stimulated by him and giving free course to their licentiousness, they deemed the murder of Christians to be the only piety and worship of demons. 
they first seized one Metris, an old man, and ordered him to blaspheme. He refusing, they beat him with clubs, and pricked his face and eyes with sharp reeds, and dragging him to the suburbs, they there stoned him. Then hurrying one Quinta, a faithful woman, to the idol temple, they insisted on her worshipping, to which she, showing the strongest marks of abomination, fastening her by the feet, they dragged her over the rough pavement through all the city, having first dashed her against millstones and whipping her, led her to the same place and dispatched her. Then, with one accord, they all rushed on the houses of the godly, and every one ran to his neighbours, spoiled and plundered them, purloining the most valuable of their goods and throwing away those things which were vile and refuse, and burning them in the roads, and thus exhibiting the appearance of a captive and spoiled city. The brethren fled and withdrew themselves, and received with joy the spoiling of their goods, as those did to whom Paul beareth witness, and I do not know that any except one falling into their hands hitherto denied the Lord, but having seized the admirable aged virgin Apollonia, beating her cheeks, they dashed out all her teeth, and having kindled a fire before the city, they threatened to burn her alive, unless she would consent to blaspheme. But she begged a little intermission, quickly leapt into the fire, and was consumed. Having seized Serapion in his house, and tortured him, and broken all his limbs, they threw him headlong from an upper room. No road, public or private, was passable to us, by night or by day, and all of them, crying out always and everywhere, that if they should not speak blasphemy, they would be thrown into the flames, and these evils continued a long time. A sedition then succeeded, and a civil war which averted their fury from us, and turned it against one another, and we breathed again a little during the mitigation of their rage. Immediately the change of government was announced. Persecuting Decius succeeded Philip, our protector, and we were threatened with destruction, and the edict against us appeared, that foretold by our Lord so dreadful as to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. All were astonished, many Christians of quality showed themselves immediately through fear. Others, who held public offices, were constrained by their office to exhibit themselves, and others were drawn along by their Gentile relations, and being cited by name they approached to the unholy altars, some pale and trembling, not as if they were going to sacrifice, but themselves to be the victims, so that they were derided by the multitude who stood around, and it was visible to all that they were very much frightened, both at death and at the crime of sacrificing. But some ran more readily to the altar, affirming boldly that they never had been Christians. Of such our Lord affirmed most truly that they should be saved with great difficulty. Of the rest, some followed one or other of these, others fled, Others were seized, and of these some persisting to bonds and imprisonment, some of them having been confined many days, at last before they were led to the tribunal, abjuring the faith, others of them enduring torments for a time, at length yielded. But the firm and stable pillars of the Lord being strengthened by him, and having received vigour and courage, analogous and correspondent to the strong faith which was in them, became admirable martyrs of his kingdom. The first of these was Julian, a gouty person who could neither stand nor walk, he was brought forth with two others who carried him, one of whom immediately denied Christ. The other, called Cronian the Benevolent, and old Julian himself, having confessed the Lord, were led through the whole city, very large as ye know it is, sitting on camels and scourged, and were at last burnt in a very hot fire in the view of surrounding multitudes. A soldier, one Bessus, standing by them and defending them against insults, incensed the mob against himself, and having played the man in the service of his god, had his head struck off. An African by birth, called Makar, footnote, happy or blessed, end footnote, and truly meriting the appellation, having resisted much importunity, was burnt alive. After these, Epimachus and Alexander, having long sustained imprisonment and undergone a thousand tortures, were burnt to death, and with these four women. Amenarion, and holy virgin, being grievously tormented by the judge for having declared beforehand that she would not repeat the blasphemy which he ordered, and persisting faithful, was led away to execution. The rest, the venerable ancient Mercuria, and Dionysia, mother of many children, but not loving them above the Lord, and another Amenarion, the president, being ashamed to torment them in vain, and to be baffled by women, were slain with the sword, without being exposed first to any torments, for their leader, Amenarion, had undergone torture for them all. Heron, Ata, and Isidore, Egyptians, and with them a boy, Dioscorus, of fifteen, were brought before the tribunal. The boy resisted both the blandishments and tortures which were applied to him, 
the rest after cruel torments were burnt. The boy, having answered in the wisest manner to all questions, and excited the admiration of the judge, was dismissed by him from motives of compassion, with an intimation of hope that he might afterwards repent. And now the excellent Dioscorus is with us, reserved to a greater and longer conflict. Nemesian was first accused as a partner of robbers, but having cleared himself before the centurion of this accusation, and being informed against as a Christian, he came bound before the president, who most unjustly scourging him with twice the severity used against malefactors, burned him among robbers. Thus was he honoured to resemble Christ in suffering. And now some of the military guard, Ammon, Zeno, Ptolemy, and Ingenuous, and with them old Theophilus, stood before the tribunal, and a certain person, being interrogated as a Christian, and seeming inclined to deny, they made such lively signs of aversion as to strike the beholders. But, before they could be seized, they ran to the tribunal, owning themselves Christians, so that the governor and his assessors were astonished. These evidently had the ascendant over the judges, and went to execution with all the marks of exultation, God triumphing gloriously in them. Many others, through the towns and villages, were torn to pieces by the Gentiles. One Iscurian was an agent to a certain magistrate, who being ordered to sacrifice refused, and after repeated indignities was killed by a great stake driven through his bowels. But why need I mention the multitude of those who, wandering in deserts and mountains, were destroyed by famine and thirst and cold, and diseases and robbers and wild beasts, of whom those who survived are witnesses of their election and victory? Suffice it to relate one fact, there was one Kiremon, a very aged person, bishop of the city of Nilus. He, flying into an Arabian mountain with his wife, returned not, nor could the brethren, after much searching, discover them, alive or dead, and many about the same Arabian mountain were led captive by the barbarian Saracens, some of which were afterwards redeemed for money with difficulty, others could never regain their liberty." End quote. Dionysius adds something of the charity of the martyrs towards the lapsed, contrasting it with the inexorable severity of novation. Two things are evident from this narrative. First, that the persecution found the Eastern Christians as poorly provided against the storm as the Western. The long peace and prosperity had corrupted both, and men in the former part of this century had forgotten that a Christian life was that of a stranger. The Decian persecution under God was at once a scourge and an antidote. Second, yet a competent number there still were of those who should prove the truth of Christianity and the power of divine grace accompanying it. The true church is not destroyed, but flourishes and triumphs amidst these evils inward and outward. Eusebius relates a story from Dionysius's letters to Fabius, which he says was full of wonder. Quote, there was one Serapion, a faithful aged person who had lived blameless a long time, but in the time of persecution fell. He had frequently solicited to be restored to the church, but in vain, because he had sacrificed. Being in a disease, he continued speechless and senseless for three days successively, but recovering a little on the fourth, he called to his grandson. And how long, says he, do you detain me? I beseech you hasten and quickly dismiss me. Call one of the presbyters to me and after this he was speechless. The boy ran for the presbyter. It was night, the presbyter was sick and could not come, but he had given directions to receive dying penitents, particularly if they had supplicated for it, that they might leave the world in good hope. He gave a little of the Eucharist to the boy, bidding him to dip it in water and put it into the old man's mouth. The child followed the directions, and before he entered, Serapion again recruited, saying, You are come, my son, do quickly what you are ordered, and dismiss me. The old man had no sooner received the morsel than he gave up the ghost. Was he not evidently reserved until he was absolved, and his sin being remitted, he might be acknowledged by Christ as a faithful servant on account of many good works? End quote. Thus far Dionysius. I remark here, first, it is evident that the connection between the sacrament and the grace conveyed by it, being thus expressed as if it were necessary and indissoluble, both in baptism and the Lord's Supper, gave occasion to the increase of much superstition in the church. I believe that both Dionysius and Serapion knew that the sign was nothing without the inward grace, yet perhaps they are not to be cleared of superstition on account of the inordinate stress which they laid on external things. The reader must observe that this evil is growing up in this century. Second, along with this superstition the power of the leaders of the church would naturally swell beyond the due bounds. 
That it did so afterwards, surprisingly, is well known, but I think the evil had begun already both in the East and West. Third, there was at that time, among persons of real piety, a general propensity to extend discipline too far. Serapion ought doubtless to have been received into the church before. The Lord seemed willing to give him a token of his loving kindness, by fulfilling his desires, before he left the world, of being readmitted into the church. But how much more decent and proper had it been for him to have been received while in health? Satan always pushes us to extremes. Church discipline was held then too high. With us it is reduced to little or nothing. Without communion with a visible church, established in form, it was scarce thought possible for a man to be saved, however impracticable it might be. Many would have then had no hope of Serapion's salvation, had the power of his disease prevented the reception of the Eucharist. This miserable superstition increased, till by the light of the Reformation it was destroyed. In our age the Lord's Supper itself is looked on as nothing by thousands who call themselves Christians, and communion with a settled ministry and church is esteemed as a thing of no consequence by numbers who profess the doctrines of vital godliness. Dionysius wrote several other treatises mentioned by Eusebius. Among the rest he wrote to Cornelius, Bishop of Rome, having received his letter against Novation, footnote, Eusebius certainly calls him Novatus by mistake, end footnote, and informs him that he had been invited by Hellenus of Tarsus in Sicilia, and the rest of the bishops of his neighbourhood, by Familian of Cappadocia, and Theoctistes of Palestine, to meet them in a synod at Antioch, where some attempts were made to strengthen the Novatian party. But all these churches united to condemn the schism, and Dionysius wrote to the Roman confessors both before and after they had returned to the church. On the whole, the East and West united in condemning the new dissenters, whose head, having professed that some brethren had compelled him to the separation, Dionysius wrote to Novatian himself to this effect, quote, If you are led unwillingly, as you say, you will prove it by returning willingly, for a man ought to suffer anything rather than to rend the church of God. Even martyrdom on this account would be no less glorious, even more so than any other, for in common martyrdom a man is a witness for one soul, here for the whole church. And now, if you would compel or persuade the brethren to unanimity, your good conduct would be more laudable than your defection was culpable. The latter will be forgotten, the former will be celebrated through the Christian world. But, if you find it impracticable to draw over others, save your own soul at least, I wish you, studious of peace, to be strong in the Lord. End quote. Such was the zeal of the Christian leaders at that time for the preservation of unity. Had there been a defection from Christian purity of doctrine in the general church, or were the heads of it vicious men, for the most part, in principle or practice, one might have suspected that the Lord had forsaken these, and that his spirit had rested chiefly with the new separatists. But that godliness in a considerable degree prevailed still in the church at large is evident. Cyprian, Dionysius, Cornelius, Familian were holy men. Martyrs in abundance suffered for Christ's sake from their flocks. A number of church officers suffered in a very edifying manner. The lapsed were restored among them by the most Christian methods of mildness and just discipline, and this with success in a variety of cases. Dionysius concurred with Cyprian in his views on the subject, and though the flame of Christian piety was considerably lowered since the days of Ignatius, I see not a shadow of proof that there was any just reason for dissent, or any superior degree of spirituality with the Novatians. Had there been any persons among them, of half the piety of Cyprian, for instance, I think it probable that we must have had some account of them. It is my duty to trace the work of the Divine Spirit wherever I can find it. Traces of his Spirit with the Novations in general in these times I cannot discern, and yet it is improbable that they should be a people altogether forsaken of God. Wherever the real truth, as it is in Jesus, is professed, there some measure of his Spirit most probably is. Novation himself is constantly reprehended both by Cyprian and Dionysius, yet I observe they cast no imputations on his moral character. His schism alone is the object of their accusation. Cornelius indeed carries the matter still farther, as we have seen, but I am not disposed to credit all he says. He was heated against him, and was in a state of personal competition with him. Let us, before we proceed to other instances of the Decian persecution, finish the whole of Novatian's affairs by collecting what we can on the other side, in order to form a just estimate of his character. If, after all, the evidence be not satisfactory, let it be imputed to the scantiness of our materials. 
Novation, from a Stoic becoming a Christian, seems to have contracted that severity which formed the basis of his sect. He was born a Phrygian and came to Rome where he received Christianity. Having neglected some ecclesiastical forms after he had recovered from a sickness, he was objected to by the clergy and people when applying for the office of presbyter. The bishop, probably Fabian, the predecessor of Cornelius, desired that the rules might be dispensed with in his case, and it was granted. A testimony surely rather in favour of his abilities and conduct than otherwise, though coming from the mouth of Cornelius his rival. That he excelled in genius, learning, and eloquence is certain. I hence infer that he must have been a man of good character. The evils of his schism were great, but no blot seems affixed to his conduct, nor any just suspicion to lie on the purity of his intentions. One of the letters of the Roman clergy to Cyprian is still extant in his collection, in which he, at that time, coincided with the African prelate, and it is worthy of a Roman presbyter and a zealous Christian. Eusebius, in his Chronicon, ranks him among the confessors, and it is certain that, while he continued presbyter, his fame was not only without a blot, but very fair in the church. Perhaps it had been happy for him had he never presented to become a bishop. Cornelius, being preferred before him in the election, was, probably enough, the grand cause of schism, and from a temperate degree of severity he became intolerably inexorable in his ideas of discipline. It was not for man to say how far temper, stoicism, prejudice, and principle might all unite in this business. We must now behold him, bishop of the Novatians, and spreading the schism so far as he can through the Christian world. The repeated condemnation of it in synods hindered not its growth, and as purity of conduct with inflexible severity of manners were their favourite object, it is not to be apprehended that Novation could have supported himself in the opinion of his followers without some exemplariness of conduct. The Christian faith he is allowed to have preserved in soundness. In truth, there is extant a treatise of his on the Trinity, one of the most regular and most accurate that is to be found among the ancients. It is astonishing that any should ascribe the ideas of the Trinity mainly to the Nicene Fathers. We have repeatedly seen proofs of the doctrine from the Apostles' days, being held distinctly in all its parts. This treatise of Novation may be added to the list. I don't know how to abridge it better than to refer the reader to the Athanasian Creed. The Trinity in unity and the Godhead and manhood of Christ in one person are not more plainly to be found in that Creed than in this contemporary of Cyprian. I wish a more experimental view, a more practical use of Christian doctrines, were to be seen in it. But, churchmen or dissenters, all Christians seem to have relaxed in this respect. The savour and simplicity of the life of faith in Jesus was not now so well known, yet particularly under the article of the Holy Ghost, he speaks very distinctly of him as the author of regeneration, the pledge of the promised inheritance, and, as it were, the handwriting of eternal salvation, who makes us the temple of God and his house, who intercedes for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, acting as our advocate and defender, dwelling in our bodies and sanctifying them for immortality. He it is who fights against the flesh, hence the flesh fights against the spirit. And he goes on in the best manner to speak of his holy and blessed operations in the faithful. He wrote also a sensible little tract against the bondage of Jewish meats, and maintains Christian liberty, according to the views of St. Paul, with just directions for the maintenance of temperance and decorum. The letter to Cyprian before mentioned closes his works. He lived to the time of Valerian under whom Cyprian suffered. In that persecution also fell innovation by martyrdom, as appears from the authentic testimony of Socrates. His rival Cornelius had suffered a little before them, dying in exile for the faith, and it is no unpleasant contemplation to conceive these three men meeting in a better world, clothed with the garments of Jesus, and in him knowing their mutual relation, which prejudice hindered in this life. I can by no means justify either the separation of Novation or the severity with which these two good bishops personally condemned him. We seem, however, to have found sufficient evidence of the Christian character of the separatist. His death, added to the general tenor of his life, shows to whom he belonged. The reader will pardon this digression, if it be a digression, to show that the Spirit of God was not limited to one denomination, and to pave the way for that liberal and candid construction of characters which it will behove us to cultivate in the future scenes of this history, while we trace the kingdom of God through a multiplicity of names and divisions of men. To proceed with the Decian persecution, it seems to have been the whole employment of magistrates to persecute. Swords, wild beasts, pits, red-hot chairs, wheels to stretch the bodies, 
and talons of iron to tear them. These were the instruments of this persecution. Malice and covetousness were deeply and strongly set on work during this whole short but horrible reign in informing against Christians, and the genius of men was never known to have had more of employment in aiding the savageness of the heart. Life was prolonged in torture, that impatience in suffering might affect at length what surprise and terror could not. See two examples of satanic artifice. A martyr having endured the rack and burning plates, the judge ordered him to be rubbed all over with honey and then exposed him in the sun, which was very hot, lying on his back with his hands tied behind him that he might be stung by the flies. Another person, young and in the flower of his age, was, by the order of the same judge, carried into a pleasant garden among flowers, near a pleasing rivulet surrounded with trees. Here they laid him on a feather bed, bound him with silken cords, and left him alone. Then they brought thither a lewd woman, very handsome, who began to embrace him and to court him with all imaginable impudence. The martyr bit off his tongue, not knowing how to resist the assaults of sensuality any longer, and spit it in her face. Shocking as these things were, Christianity appeared what it is, true holiness, while its persecutors showed that they were at enmity with all goodness. Alexander, bishop of Comana, suffered martyrdom by fire. At Smyrna, Eudemon, the bishop apostatized, and several unhappily followed his example, but the glory of this church, once so celebrated by the voice of infallibility, was not totally lost. The example of Peonius, one of the presbyters, was salutary to all the churches. The acts of his martyrdom are still extant, and the substance, at least, of the account is confirmed by Eusebius, who refers us to his narrative, not now extant. Nor, in general, is there anything in the story improbable or unworthy of the Christian spirit. In expectation of being seized, he put a chain about his neck, and caused Sabina and Asclepiades to do the same to show their readiness to suffer. Palaemon, keeper of the idol temple, came to them with the magistrates. Quote, Don't you know, says he, that the emperor has ordered you to sacrifice? We are not ignorant of the commandments, says Peonius, but they are those which command us to worship God. Come to the marketplace, says Palaemon, and see the truth of what I have said. We obey the true God, end quote, said Sabina and Asclepiades. When the martyrs were in the midst of the multitude in the market, Quote, you had better, says Palaemon, submit to avoid the torture. Paeonius began to speak. Citizens of Smyrna, who please yourselves with the beauty of your walls and city, and value yourselves on account of your poet Homer, and ye Jews, if there be any among you, hear me speak a few words. We find that Smyrna has been esteemed the finest city in the world, and was reckoned the chief of those who contended for the honour of Homer's birth. I am informed that you deride those who come of their own accord to sacrifice, or who do not refuse when urged to it. But surely your teacher Homer should be attended to, who says that we ought not to rejoice at the death of any man. And ye Jews ought to obey Moses, who tells you, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down by the way, and hide thyself from him. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. And Solomon says, Rejoice not when thy enemy falleth. For my part, I had rather die and undergo any sufferings than contradict my principles. Whence then proceed the laughter and scoffs of the Jews, pointed not only against those who have sacrificed, but against us. They insult us with a malicious pleasure to see our long peace interrupted. Though we were their enemies, still we are men. But what harm have we done them? What have we made them suffer? Whom have we spoken against? Whom have we persecuted? Whom have we compelled to worship idols? Do they think themselves less culpable than those who suffer death from persecution? End quote. He then addressed the Jews on the grounds of their own scriptures and solemnly placed before the pagans the day of judgment. The sermon bore some resemblance to Stephen's in like circumstances, tending to beget conviction of sin and leading men to feel their need of the divine Saviour, according to the justest views and in the soundest taste of the gospel. He spake long and was very attentively heard and there is reason to hope it was not in vain. The people who surrounded him said with Palaemon, quote, Believe us, Paeonius, your probity and wisdom make us deem you worthy to live, and life is pleasant, end quote. Thus powerfully did conscience and humanity operate in their hearts. Quote, I own, says the martyr, 
Life is pleasant, but I mean that which I aspire after. We will not, through a contemptuous spirit, forsake these gifts, but that which we prefer to them is infinitely better. But I thank you for your expression of kindness. I cannot, however, but suspect some stratagem in it." End quote. The people continued entreating him, and he still discoursed to them of an hereafter. The well-known sincerity and unquestionable virtues of the man seemed to have filled the Smyrnians with veneration, and his enemies began to fear an uproar in his favour. It is impossible to persuade you then, said Polemon. I would to God I could, says Paeonius, persuade you to be a Christian. End quote. Sabina had changed her name by the advice of Peonius, who was her brother, for fear of falling into the hands of her pagan mistress, who, to compel her to renounce Christianity, had formally put her in irons and banished her to the mountains, where the brethren secretly nourished her. She called herself Theodota, since this happened. Quote, what God dost thou adore? says Palaemon. God Almighty, she answers, who made all things, of which we are assured by his word, Jesus Christ. And what dost thou adore? Speaking to Asclepiades, Jesus Christ, says he. What, is there another God? Says Palaemon. No, says he, this is the same whom we come here to confess. End quote. He who worships the Trinity in unity will find no difficulty to reconcile these two confessions. Let him who does not so worship attempt it. One person, pitying Peonius, said, quote, Why do you that are so learned so resolutely seek death? End quote. Being put into prison, they found there a presbyter named Lemnus, and a woman named Macedonia, and another called Eutychiana, a Montanist. The prisoners were placed all together, and employed themselves in praising God, and showed every mark of patience and cheerfulness. Many pagans visited Peonius, and attempted to persuade him. His answers struck them with admiration. Some, who by compulsion had sacrificed, visited them, and entreated them with tears. Quote, I now suffer afresh, says Peonius. Methinks I am torn in pieces when I see the pearls of the church trod under foot by swine, and the stars of heaven cast to the earth by the tail of the dragon. But our sins have been the cause. End quote. The Jews, whose character of bigotry had not been lessened by all their miseries, and whose hatred to Christ continued from age to age with astonishing uniformity, invited some of the lapsed Christians to their synagogue. The generous spirit of Peonius was moved to express itself vehemently against the Jews. Among other things, he said, quote, They pretend that Jesus Christ died like other men by constraint. Was that man a common felon whose disciples have cast out devils for so many years? Could that man be forced to die, for whose sakes his disciples and so many others have voluntarily suffered the severest punishment? End quote. Having spoken a long time to them, he desired them to depart out of the prison. Though the miraculous dispensations attendant on Christianity form no part of the plan of this history, I cannot but observe on this occasion how strongly their continuance in the third century is here attested. Peonius affirms that devils were ejected by Christians in the name of Christ in the face of apostates, who would have been glad of the shadow of an argument to justify their perfidy. The captain of the horse, coming to the prison, ordered Peonius to come to the idol temple. Quote, Your bishop, Eudaemon, hath already sacrificed, says he. End quote. The martyr, knowing that nothing of this sort could be done legally till the arrival of the proconsul, refused. The captain put a cord about his neck and dragged him along with Sabina and others. They cried, quote, We are Christians, end quote, and fell to the ground lest they should enter the idol temple. Peonius, after much resistance, was forced in and laid on the ground before the altar. There stood the unhappy Eudaemon after having sacrificed. Lepidus, a judge, asks, quote, What God do you adore? Him, says Peonius, that made heaven and earth. You mean him that was crucified? I mean him whom God the Father sent for the salvation of men. We must, said the judges one to another, compel them to say what we desire. Blush, answered Peonius, ye adorers of false gods, have some respect to justice and obey the laws. They enjoin you not to do violence to us, but to put us to death. End quote. One Rufinus said, quote, Forbear, Peonius, your thirst after vainglory. Is this your eloquence? answered the martyr. Is this what you have read in your books? Was not Socrates thus treated by the Athenians? According to your advice, he sought after vainglory because he applied himself to wisdom and virtue. 
end quote. A case thus apposite, and which doubtless bore some resemblance as the philosopher's zeal for moral virtue exposed him to persecution, struck Rufinus dumb. A certain person placed a crown on Peonius's head, which he tore, and the pieces lay before the altar. The pagans, finding their persuasions vain, remanded them to prison. A few days after, the proconsul Quintilian returned to Smyrna and examined Peonius. He tried both tortures and persuasions in vain, and at length, enraged at his obstinacy, sentenced him to be burnt alive. He went cheerfully to the place of execution, and thanked God who had preserved his body pure from idolatry. Then he stretched himself out upon the wood, and delivered himself to a soldier to be nailed to the pile. After he was fastened, the executioner said to him, quote, Change your mind, and the nails shall be taken away. I have felt them, answered he. After remaining thoughtful for a time, he said, I hasten, O Lord, that I may the sooner be raised up again. End quote. They then lifted him up, fastened to the wood, and afterwards one Metrodorus, a Marcionite. They were turned towards the east, Peonius on the right hand and Metrodorus on the left. They heaped round them a great quantity of wood. Peonius remained some time motionless, with his eyes shut, absorbed in prayer, while the fire was consuming him. Then at length he opened his eyes and looked cheerfully on the fire, said Amen, and expired, saying, Lord, receive my soul. Of the particular manner in which his companions suffered death we have no account. I have extracted a considerable part of this narrative in which we see the spirit of divine charity triumphing over all worldly and selfish considerations. The zeal of Peonius deserves to be commemorated while the world endures. It seems to have led him to a forgetfulness of himself and to have absorbed him in the vindication of divine truths to the last. One may judge what a faithful preacher of the gospel he had been, who seems intent on the blessed work amidst his bitterest sufferings. What true religion is in its simplicity seems in him exemplified abundantly. If there is anything particular in the treatment he underwent, it consists in the repeated pains taken to preserve him. Is it that the man was much respected, though the Christian was abhorred? Integrity and uprightness, when eminent and supported by wisdom and good sense, fail not to overawe, to captivate, and to soften mankind. The voice of nature will speak for them, but they cannot conquer the natural enmity of the heart against God. There are many good reasons which may be assigned why sound learning ought to be cultivated among Christians, especially by all who mean to be pastors of Christ's flock. This the case of Peonius obviously intimates. A character for knowledge never fails to ensure respect. It is not money, nor rank, nor power, nor quality that will command esteem. Knowledge secures it a thousand times more with mankind. It is evident that Peonius was a man of learning, and that his persecutors respected him on that account, and took pains to preserve him. We may conceive how useful this accomplishment had been in his ministry. One remark more on this story. A Montanist and a Marcionite are his fellow sufferers. The latter is consumed with him in the flames. Doubtless from all the lights of antiquity, both these heresies appear in an odious light. But there might be exceptions, and who so likely as those who suffered? We must not confine the truth of godliness to any particular denomination. Providence, by mixing persons of very opposite parties in the same scene of persecution, demonstrates that the pure faith and love of Jesus may operate in those who cannot own each other as brethren. I know not whether Peonius and Metrodorus did so on earth. I hope they do so in heaven. In Asia, one Maximus, a merchant, was brought before Optimus the proconsul, who inquired after his condition. Quote, I was born free, says he, but I am the servant of Jesus Christ. Of what profession are you? A man of the world who live by my dealings. Are you a Christian? Though a sinner, yet I am a Christian. End quote. The usual process was carried on of persuasions and tortures. Quote, These are not torments which we suffer for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are wholesome unctions. End quote. Such the effect of the Holy Spirit shedding the love of God in Christ abroad in the human heart. He was ordered to be stoned to death. All this time the persecution raged in Egypt with unremitting fury. In the lower Thebais there was a young man named Paul, to whom, at fifteen years of age, his parents left a great estate. He was a person of much learning, of a mild temper, and full of the love of God. He had a married sister with whom he lived. 
her husband was base enough to design an information against him in order to obtain his estate. Paul, having notice of this, retired to the desert mountains where he waited till the persecution ceased. Habit at length made solitude agreeable to him. He found a pleasant retreat and lived there fourscore and ten years. He was, at the time of his retirement, twenty-three and lived to be a hundred and thirteen years old. This is the first distinct account of a hermit in the Christian church. No doubt ought to be made of the genuine piety of Paul. Those who in our days condemn all monks with indiscriminate contempt seem to forget what times they live in themselves and what times the first monks lived in. Was not solitude better than such society as that which Christians were exposed to in the days of Decius? Was there a day, an hour, in which they had the least enjoyment of society, or security of any of its benefits? What could a Christian eye or ear observe but what must be exceedingly distasteful to him? Paul, loving solitude in such circumstances, is no more to be wondered at than Elijah the prophet. But he carried it too far. With the return of peace, the return of social duties should have taken place. Yet a heart breathing the purest love to God may naturally enough be led to think the perfection of godliness obtainable only in solitude. The increasing spirit of superstition soon produced a number of Pauls. The worst effect of it was that those who had only external religion placed their righteousness in monastic austerities, and thus, from the depraved imitations of well-meant beginnings, one of the strongest supports of false religion gradually strengthened itself in the Christian world. And here we close the account of the Decian persecution. Its author is admired by pagan writers. What has been said of Trajan and Antoninus, moralists, but persecutors, is applicable to him. It cannot be denied that for thirty months the Prince of Darkness had full opportunity to glut his rage, but the Lord meant to chasten and to purify his church, not to destroy. The whole scene is memorable on several accounts. It was not a local or intermitting persecution, but universal and must have transmitted great numbers to the regions where sin and pain shall be no more. The peace of thirty years had corrupted the whole Christian atmosphere. The lightning of the Decian rage refined and cleared it. No doubt the effects were salutary to the church. Without such a scourge, external Christianity might have still spread and internal have been no more. The survivors had an opportunity to learn what the gospel is in the faithfulness of the martyrs, and men were taught again that he alone who strengthens Christians to suffer can make true Christians. Yet the storm proved fatal to a number of individuals who apostatized, and Christianity was cleared of many false friends. Two other evils we have also seen... The formation of schisms and of superstitious solitudes had their date from the Decian persecution. End of chapter 11「The History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The History of the Church during the Reign of Gallus. The successor of Decius gave the church a little pause. In that space, the two little treatises of Cyprian concerning the lapsed and concerning unity were doubtless of some service in disposing the minds of men to preserve the unity of the church, and in recovering the lapsed to a state of penitence. In the latter of these treatises, indeed, it must be confessed, he carries his censure of the novations too far. The sin and the danger of rending the body of Christ might have been stated in the strongest terms, to pronounce the evil absolutely damnable was carrying the matter beyond the bounds of moderation, but the same candour which should incline one to apprehend novation meant well in his too rigid scheme pleads also for Cyprian's zeal in the maintenance of unity. He seems to have felt the evil as most destructive, and knows not terms strong enough to express his detestation of it. But Gallus soon began to disturb the peace of the church, though not with the incessant fury of his predecessor, one Hippolytus, a Roman presbyter, had been seduced into novationism, but his mind had not been perverted from the faith and love of Jesus. He was now called on to suffer martyrdom, which he did with courage and fidelity. Either curiosity or a desire of instructive information induced some to ask him in the last scene of his sufferings whether he still persisted in the communion of novation. He declared in the most explicit terms that he now saw the affair in a new light, repented of his having encouraged the schism, and died in the communion of the general church. 
One may conceive such a testimony must have weakened the influence of the schism. In this persecution of Gallus it was that Cornelius confessed the faith of Christ and was banished to Civita Vecchia by the emperor, which gave occasion to the congratulatory letter of Cyprian. In one part of it he reflects on the novations with his usual vehemence, the rest breathes a fervent spirit of piety and charity, and throws a strong light on two facts, both that the persecution of Gallus was severe, and that the Roman Christians bore it with becoming and exemplary fortitude. Quote, we have known, dearest brother, the glorious testimonies of your faith and virtue, and we have received the honour of your confession with such exultation, that in the praises of your excellent conduct we reckon ourselves partners and companions. For, as we have but one church, united hearts and indivisible concord, what pastor rejoices not in the honours of his fellow pastors as his own? Or what brotherhood does not everywhere exult in the joy of brothers? We cannot express how great was our exultation and joy when we heard of your prosperous fortitude, that you were at Rome the leader of the confession, but that the confession of the leader grew with the confession of the brethren, that while you led the way to glory, you incited many companions of your glory, and persuaded the people to confess, while you were prepared to confess for them all, so that we are at a loss which most to celebrate, your active and steady faith or the inseparable charity of the brethren. The virtue of the bishop leading the way was publicly approved, the union of the brethren following him was exhibited. While one mind and one voice was among you all, the whole Roman church confessed. Your faith, which the apostles so much celebrated, shone illustriously. He foresaw in spirit this firmness of yours, and while he commends the fathers, he stirs up the sons to imitation. While you are thus unanimous and firm, your example is most instructive. You have taught largely the great lessons of fearing God, of firmly adhering to Christ, of uniting pastors and people in one common danger, of uniting brethren with brethren in persecution, that a concord thus united is invincible, that the God of peace gives to the peacemakers that which is jointly asked by all. With terrible violence the adversary rushed to attack the soldiers of Christ, but was bravely repulsed. He hoped again to supplant the servants of God as rude novices and improvident. He hoped to circumvent one of the faithful, but he found the united resistance of all the faithful. He understood that the soldiers of Christ stand sober and armed to the battle, that they cannot be conquered, that they may die and are invincible on this very account, because they fear not to die, that they resist not aggressors, since it is not lawful for them, though innocent, to kill the guilty, but that they readily give up life and blood, that while wickedness and cruelty rage so fiercely in the world, they may the more quickly depart from the evil. What a glorious spectacle under the eyes of God! What a joy in the sight of Christ and his church, that not a single soldier but the whole army together endured the warfare! For if they could have heard, all would have come, since every one came who heard. How many lapsed are restored by a glorious confession! They stood firm, and by the very grief of their penitence were made more magnanimous, their former fall may now appear to have been the effect of sudden tremor. They now return to themselves, collecting real faith and strength from the fear of God, and pant for martyrdom. As much as possible we exhort our people not to cease to be prepared for the approaching contest, by watching, fasting, and prayers. Let our groans and supplications be frequent. These are our celestial arms, these our fortresses and weapons. Let us remember one another, unanimous and united, praying for one another, and relieving our pressures and distresses with mutual charity. And whichsoever of us shall first be called hence, let our love persevere before the Lord, let not our prayers cease before the mercy of our Father, for the brethren and sisters. Quote. So ardent was the spirit of Cyprian in the expectation of martyrdom. So little account did he make of temporal things, and in so natural and easy a manner did he count these terrible scenes as matter of joy but he was reserved beyond the life of Gallus as well as Decius for the use of the church. Of Cornelius's death we have no particular account, only we know he died in exile. The faithfulness of his sufferings for Christ evinces all along whose servant he was. In other respects I know little or no evidence of his character, nor can I conceive highly of his parts and capacity from the little specimen which we have of his writings. It is no wonder that Cyprian, who had seen and known such dreadful devastations under Decius, 
finding, after a very short interval, the persecution renewed by Gallus should be tempted to imagine the approach of Antichrist, the end of the world and the day of judgment to be at hand. Sagacious and holy men are never more apt to be deceived than when they attempt to look into futurity. God hath made the present so much the exclusive object of our duty that he will scarce suffer any of his best and wisest servants to gain any credit in conjecturing concerning the times and the seasons which he hath put in his own power. The persecution of Gallus proved, however, a light one compared with that of Decius. Under very formidable apprehensions of it, Cyprian wrote an animating letter to the people of Thibarus. The mistaken idea I have mentioned may have added spirit to the epistle, but its grounds are solid, and his arguments and the scriptures which he quotes deserve attention in all ages. A few extracts may be sufficient. Quote, I had intended, most dear brethren, and wished, if circumstances had permitted, agreeably to the desires you have frequently expressed, to have myself come among you, and to the best of my poor endeavours to have strengthened the brotherhood with exhortations. But urgent affairs detain me at Carthage. I cannot make excursions into a country so distant as yours, nor be long absent from my people. Let these letters then speak for me. You ought to be well assured that the day of affliction is at hand, and that the end of the world and the time of Antichrist is near, that we may all stand prepared for the battle, and think only of the glory of eternal life and the crown of Christian confession. Nor ought we to think that the imminent persecution will resemble the last. A heavier and more ferocious conflict hangs over us, for which the soldiers of Christ ought to prepare themselves with sound faith and vigorous fortitude, considering that they daily drink the cup of the blood of Christ for this reason, that they may be able themselves to shed their blood for Christ. To follow what Christ hath taught and done is to be willing to be found with Christ. As John the Apostle says, He that saith, he abideth in Christ, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Thus also the blessed Apostle Paul exhorts and teaches, saying, We are the sons of God, and if sons, then heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Let no man desire anything now which belongs to a perishing world, but let him follow Christ who lives forever, and makes his servants to live, who are settled in the faith of his name. For the time is come, most dear brethren, which our Lord long ago foretold, saying, The hour is coming, when whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God's service. End quote. In his usual manner he quotes the scriptures which relate to persecution the force and beauty of which would then be felt and admired, but which we are too apt to speculate upon at our ease. See how justly he arms their minds against the discouragement which the circumstances of approaching persecution are apt to induce. Quote, Let no one, when he sees our people to be scattered through fear of persecution, be disturbed, because he sees not the brethren collected, nor the bishops employed among them. Those who must not kill, and who must be killed, cannot be altogether. Wherever, in those days, any one of the brethren shall be separated from the flock by the necessity of time, in body nor in spirit, let him not be moved at the horror of the flight, nor while he retreats and lies hid be terrified at the solitude of the desert. He is not alone to whom Christ is a companion in flight. He is not alone who, keeping the temple of God, wherever he is, is not without God. And if a robber oppresses a Christian, flying in the desert and mountains, a wild beast attack, famine, thirst, or cold afflict, or the tempest oppressed by sea, Christ beholds his soldier fighting in all these various ways. End quote. He goes on to set forth the precedents of Scripture, saints who had suffered for God in the most ancient times, and adds, quote, How shameful must it be for a Christian to be unwilling to suffer when the Master suffered first, and that we should be unwilling to suffer for our sins, when he who had no sin of his own suffered for us. The Son of God suffered, that he might make us the sons of God, and shall not a son of man be willing to suffer, that he persevere in his sonship? Antichrist is come, but Christ comes also after him. The enemy rages and is fierce, but the Lord immediately follows and will avenge our sufferings and wounds. End quote. He again makes apposite scripture quotations. That from the Apocalypse is remarkable. If any man worship the beast and his image, etc. Revelation 14.9 O oh, what a glorious day will come when the Lord shall begin to recount his people and adjudge their rewards, 
to send the guilty into hell and to condemn our persecutors to the perpetual fire of penal flame and to bestow on us the reward of faith and devotedness to him. What glory, what joy to be admitted to see God, to be honoured, to partake of the joy of eternal light and salvation with Christ the Lord, your God, to salute Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the patriarchs and prophets, apostles and martyrs, to joy with the righteous, the friends of God, in the pleasures of immortality. When that revelation shall come, when the beauty of God shall shine upon us, we shall be as happy as the deserters and rebellious will be miserable in inextinguishable fire. End quote. Such are the views of the next life, which Cyprian sets before Christians. The palm of heavenly mindedness belonged to these persecuted saints. I wish we, with all our theological accuracy, may reach a measure of their simple zeal while we live enjoying the good things of this life. Lucius was chosen bishop of Rome instead of Cornelius, but was immediately driven into exile by the authority of Gallus. Cyprian congratulated him both on his promotion and on his sufferings. His exile must have been of short duration. He was permitted to return to Rome in the year 252, and a second congratulatory letter was written to him by Cyprian. He suffered death, however, soon after, and was succeeded by Stephen. The episcopal seat at Rome was then, it seems, the next door to martyrdom. It was not owing to any diminution of his usual zeal and activity that the Roman bishop was still preserved alive, while three of his contemporaries at Rome... Fabian, Cornelius, and Lucian died a violent death or in exile. About this time he dared to write an epistle to a noted persecutor of those times, one Demetrianus, and with great freedom and dignity exposed the unreasonableness of the pagans in charging the miseries of the times on the Christians. There will be no necessity to give any detail of his reasonings on the subject. Paganism has at this day no defenders. The latter part of the epistle, which is exhortatory and doctrinal, shall be afterwards considered when we come to make an estimate of Cyprian's theological works. The short reign of Gallus was distinguished by so large a collection of human miseries as to give a plausible colour to Cyprian's mistake of the near approach of the end of the world. A dreadful pestilence broke out in Africa, which daily carried off numberless persons and swept away whole houses. The pagans were alarmed beyond measure, neglected the burial of the dead through fear, and violated the duties of humanity. The bodies of many lay in the streets of Carthage, and in vain seemed to ask the pity of passengers. It was on this occasion that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Christians to show the practical superiority of their religion, and Cyprian exhibited one of the most brilliant proofs of his real character. He gathered together his people, and expatiated on the subject of mercy, he pointed out to them that if they did no more than others, the heathen and the publican, in showing mercy to their own, there would be nothing so admirable in that, that Christians ought to overcome evil with good, and, like their heavenly Father, to love their enemies, since he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Why does not he who professes himself a son of God imitate the example of his father? We ought to answer to our birth, and those who appear to be born again of God should not degenerate, but should be solicitous to evidence the genuineness of their relation to God by the imitation of his goodness. Much more than this, Pontius tells us, was said by him, but Pontius is very scanty in his informations. The eloquent voice of Cyprian was attended to by the people with their usual alacrity. The Christians ranked themselves into classes to relieve the public calamity. The rich contributed largely the poor, and there were many, gave what they could, their labour with extreme hazard of their lives, and the pagans saw with admiration what the love of God in Christ can do, and beheld their own selfishness and inferiority. The dreadful calamity of the plague gave to Cyprian an opportunity of pressing on his people what in truth had been the ruling passion of his own life since his conversion, a warm and active regard for the blessings of immortality, joined with an holy indifference for things below. He published on this occasion his short treatise on mortality. He who wrote it must have felt what all need to feel, how little a thing life is, how valuable the prospect of heavenly bliss. Take a few extracts, the whole is in truth very precious. Quote, the kingdom of God, my dearest brethren, has begun to be just in hand. The reward of life, the joy of eternal salvation, perpetual gladness, and the possession of paradise lately lost, come to us now as the world passes away. Heavenly things now succeed earthly, great things small and eternal, those that are fading. 
what room is there here for anxiety and solicitude? Who, amidst these things, is sad and disconcerted, unless to whom faith and hope are wanting? It is his part to fear death who is unwilling to go to Christ. It is his to be unwilling to go to Christ, who does not believe that he may begin to reign with Christ, for it is written, The just shall live by faith. If you are just and live by faith, if you really believe in God, why do not you, secure of the promise of Christ and of being soon with him, embrace his call, and bless yourselves that you shall be no more exposed to Satan? End quote. After having made an apposite use of the case of good old Simeon, he adds, quote, That indeed is our peace, that is our sound tranquillity, that is firm and stable and perpetual security. But what else is carrying on in the world than a daily conflict with Satan? If one sin be subdued, another must be fought with. Here is no rest from war. You are provoked to curse, the divine law forbids it, to swear it is not lawful. Certainly, amidst such constant pressures, we ought the more to long and wish to hasten to Christ by a more speedy exit, he himself instructing us, Ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Who does not wish to be free from sorrow? Who would not run to take possession of joy? Since then we see Christ is joy, and our joy cannot be full till we see Christ. What blindness, what infatuation is it, to love the penal pressures and tears of the world, and not to hasten rather to joy, which shall not pass away. The cause of this, dear brethren, is unbelief, because we none of us believe really and solidly those things to be true which the God of truth promises, whose word is eternally firm to those that believe. If a man of a grave and respectable character promised you anything, you would give him credit, nor doubt his promises, because you know him to be a faithful and consistent character. Now God talks with you, and do you waver in uncertainty? To you, departing out of this world, God promises immortality, and do you doubt? This is not to know God at all, this is to offend Christ, the Lord and Master of believers, with the sin of unbelief. This is for a man, placed in the church, to have no faith in the Lord of faith. To me, to live as Christ, and to die as gain, says the blessed Apostle, computing it to be gain indeed, no longer to be detained in the snares of the world, no longer to be obnoxious to sin and the flesh, exempt from excruciating pressures, and freed from the poisonous jaws of Satan, to go to the joys of eternal salvation on the call of Christ. End quote. Some of his people, being staggered in their minds because they found Christians as liable to the plague as others, he shows that God's people, in spirit indeed, are separated from the rest of mankind, in all other respects are obnoxious to the common evils of human life. In his usual manner he supports his precepts by scripture examples and speaks eloquently and solidly of the benefits of afflictions and the opportunity which a distress like the present gave to Christians of showing what spirit they are of. Quote, Let that man fear to die, says he, who is not born of water and the spirit and is obnoxious to hell. Let them fear to die who are not partakers of the cross and passion of Christ. Let him fear to die who is to pass from the first to the second death, whom, receding from the world, eternal flame will torment with perpetual punishment. Let him fear to die, who gains by life only a delay of judgment. The just are called to refreshment, the unjust to torture. By the fear of mortality, the lukewarm are inflamed, the remiss are awakened, the idle are roused, deserters are compelled to return, Gentiles are compelled to believe, the ancient people among the faithful are called to rest. A new and copious army is collected with fresh strength to fight when war shall come, who entered into the service in the time of mortality. We should consider and think again and again that we have renounced the world and live here as strangers. Let us embrace the day which assigns to each of us his home. What stranger loves not to return to his country? A great number of dear friends there wait us. What a great and common joy to see and embrace them. End quote. It was a season of various calamity, and the active as well as the passive graces of Cyprian were kept in perpetual exercise. The madness of men has ever been generating the horrors and miseries of war, and there have never been wanting poets and historians to celebrate the praises of those bloodthirsty villains who call the desolation of the species their glory. It belongs to narrations purely Christian to give renown to the actions of saints whom the world despise, but whom the grace of God leads to the exercise of real charity to God and man. 
behold another instance of Cyprian's benevolence in Christ Jesus. Numidia, the country adjoining to Carthage, had been blessed with the light of the gospel, and a number of churches were planted in it. By an eruption of the barbarous nations, who neither owned the Roman sway nor had the least acquaintance with Christianity, a number of Numidian Christians were carried into captivity. Eight bishops, Januarius, Maximus, Proculus, Victor, Modianus, Nemesian, Nampulus, and Honoratus, wrote the mournful account to the prelate at Carthage. What he felt and did on the occasion, his own answer will best explain. The love of Christ and the influence of his spirit will appear to have been not small in the African church from this and the foregoing case, nor will the calamities of the times and the scourge of persecution seem to have been sent to them in vain. Quote, With much heartfelt sorrow and tears we read your letters, dearest brethren, which you wrote to us in the solicitude of your love concerning the captivity of our brethren and sisters. For who would not grieve in such cases, or who would not reckon the grief of his brother his own? Since the Apostle Paul says, If one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. If one member rejoice, all the members rejoice with it. And elsewhere, who is weak, and I am not weak. Therefore now, the captivity of our brethren is to be reckoned our captivity, and the grief of those who are in danger is to be reckoned as our own grief, since we are all one body, and not only love, but religion, ought to incite us to redeem the members of the brethren. For since the Apostle says again, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Even if love should not induce us to help our brethren, yet in such circumstances we ought to consider that we are the temples of God, which are taken, and we ought not by a delay and neglect to suffer the temples of God to remain in captivity, but to labour with all our might, and quickly to show our obsequiousness to Christ our Judge, our Lord and our God. For whereas Paul the Apostle says, As many of you as have been baptised into Christ have been baptised into his death, in our captive brethren Christ is to be looked at and redeemed from the danger of captivity, who redeemed us from the danger of death, that so he who snatched us from the jaws of Satan may now himself, even he who dwells and inhabits in us, be snatched from the hands of barbarians, and may be redeemed by a sum of money, who redeemed us by his cross and blood, who for that reason suffers these things to be done, that our faith may be tried, whether we be willing to do for another what every one would wish to be done for himself, were he a prisoner among the barbarians. For who, if he is a father, would not reckon now his sons to be in a state of captivity? Who, if a husband, would not reckon his wife to be in that calamitous situation, if we feel as men and know what sympathy means? But how great is our common sorrow and vexation for the danger of virgins who are held there in bondage! Not only their slavery, but the loss of their chastity is to be deplored. The bonds of barbarians are not so much to be deplored as the lewdness of men, lest members dedicated to Christ, and devoted forever to the honour of continency, should be defiled and insulted by the lusts of men. Our brethren, having contemplated all these things with grief, have freely and largely contributed to their relief in the power of faith, ever prone to the work of God, but now much more quickened by sorrow to such salutary works. For whereas the Lord says in the gospel, I was sick and ye visited me, with how much stronger approbation would he say, I was a captive and ye redeemed me? And when again he says, I was in prison and ye came to me, how much more is it for him to say, I was in the prison of captivity and lay shut up and bound as among barbarians, and ye freed me from the prison of slavery to receive your reward of the Lord at the day of judgment? Truly we thank you very much that he wished us to be partakers of your solicitude, and of a work so great and necessary, that he might offer us fertile fields in which we might deposit the seeds of our hope with an expectation of an exuberant harvest. We have sent a hundred thousand cestuses, the collection of our clergy and laity of the Church of Carthage, which you will dispense according to your diligence. Heartily do we wish that no such thing may happen again, and that the Lord may protect our brethren from such calamities. But if, to try our faith and love, such afflictions should again befall you, hesitate not to certify us, assuring yourselves of the hearty concurrence of our church with you in prayer and in cheerful contributions. But that you may remember our brethren, who have cheerfully contributed in your prayers, I have subjoined the names of each. I have added also the names of our colleagues in the ministry, who were present and contributed in their own names, and in that of the people. And besides my own proper quantity, I have set down and sent their sums, 
For us all, I trust you will think yourselves bound to pray. We wish you, brethren, always prosperity. End quote. To one Cecilius, an African bishop, he wrote about this time to correct a practice in administering the Lord's Supper, which had crept into some churches, of using water instead of wine. The necessity of wine in the ordinance as a proper emblem of the blood of Christ, he insists on with arguments drawn from the scriptures. But let it suffice to have barely mentioned such a subject as this. Soon after the appointment of Stephen to the bishopric of Rome, Gallus was slain, after a wretched reign of eighteen months, in the year 253. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of The History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pacific Part of Valerian's Reign Under Valerian, the successor of Gallus, the church was allowed a longer truce, for that under Gallus seems to have been very short and precarious, but for upward of three years the people of God found in Valerian even a friend and protector. His house was full of Christians, and he had a strong predilection in their favour. The Lord exercises his people in various ways. There are virtues adapted to a state of prosperity as well as of adversity. The wisdom and love of God which directed the late terrible persecutions have in part appeared by the excellent fruits. Let us now collect, as we can, the works of Christians during this interval of refreshment, it is not pleasant to leave a guide while we may have him with us. If Cyprian's affairs detain us long, it is because his eloquent pen still attends us. Doubtless, there were many before his time whose Christian actions would have equally deserved to be commemorated, but the materials of information are wanting. His letters must still be to us a capital source of historical instruction. A council was held in Africa by sixty-six bishops, with Cyprian at their head during this peace, to settle, no doubt, various matters relating to the Church of Christ. I imagine all these bishops to have had each small diocese, and to have superintended them with the assistance of their clergy, according to what I conceive to have been the primitive mode of church government, and to suppose them to have paid a real regard to their flocks, which was doubtless the case with very many of them at that time. The face of Africa, which is now covered with Mohammedan, idolatrous and piratical wickedness, afforded in those days a very pleasing spectacle. We have no further account of this council than what is contained in Cyprian's letter, which I shall take notice of presently. But it is unreasonable to suppose that the two points mentioned in it were all that engaged the attention of the council. Probably matters much more important than either of them were reviewed. Certainly no schemes of political ambition, of wealth, or of power were then practised by Christian bishops. On the whole, then, I must judge the synod worthy of the Christian name, especially as many of the bishops had faithfully maintained the cause of Christ during scenes of trial the most severe that can be imagined. One victor, a presbyter, had been received into the church without having undergone the legitimate time of trial in a state of penance, and without the concurrence and consent of the people. His bishop, Therapius, had done it arbitrarily and contrary to the institutes of the former council for settling such matters. Cyprian, in the name of the council, contents himself with reprimanding Therapius, but yet confirms what he had done and warns him to take care of offending in future. This is one of the points. We see hence that a strict and godly discipline on the whole now prevailed in the church, and that the wisest and most successful methods of recovering the lapsed were used. The authority of bishops was firm but not despotic, and the share of the people in matters of discipline by this letter appears worthy of notice. The other part he thus explains in the same letter addressed to Fidus, quote, As to the care of infants, of whom you said that they ought not to be baptized within the second or third day after their birth, and that the ancient law of circumcision should be so far repeated that they ought not to be baptized till the eighth day, we were all of a very different opinion. The mercy and grace of God we all judged should be denied to none. For if the Lord says in the gospel, The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them, how ought we to do our utmost, as far as in us lies, that no soul be lost? Spiritual circumcision should not be impeded by carnal circumcision. If even the foulest offenders, when they afterwards believe, 
remission of sins is granted, and none is prohibited from baptism and grace, how much more should an infant be admitted, who, just born, hath not sinned at all, except that, being carnally born according to Adam, he hath contracted the contagion of ancient death in his first birth, who approaches to remission of sins the more easily, because not his own actual guilt, but that of another, is remitted. Our sentence, therefore, dearest brother, in the council, was that none by us should be prohibited from baptism and the grace of God, who is merciful and kind to all. End quote. I purpose carefully to avoid disputes on subjects of small moment, yet to omit a word here on a point which hath produced volumes of strife might seem almost a studied affectation. On such occasions I shall only pacifically state my own views, as they appear deducible from evidence. Instead of disputing whether the right of infant baptism is to be derived from Scripture alone, and whether tradition deserves any attention at all, I shall observe though the scripture itself seems to speak for infant baptism, that tradition in matters of custom and discipline is of real weight, as appears from the confession of all, for all are glad to support their cause by it if they can, and in the present case, to those who say that the custom of baptizing children was not derived from the apostolical ages, the traditional argument may fairly run in language nearly scriptural. If any man seem to be contentious, we have never had such a custom as that of confining baptism to adults, nor the churches of God. Here is an assembly of sixty-six pastors, men of approved fidelity and gravity, who have stood the fiery trial of some of the severest persecutions ever known, and who have testified their love to the Lord Jesus Christ, in a more striking manner than any anti pedobaptists have had an opportunity of doing in our days, and if we may judge of their religious views by those of Cyprian, and they are all in perfect harmony with him, they are not wanting in any fundamental of godliness. No man in any age more reverenced the scriptures, and made more copious use of them on all occasions than he did, and, it must be confessed, in the very best manner. For he uses them continually for practice, not for ostentation, for use, not for the sake of victory and argument. Before this holy assembly a question is brought, not whether infants should be baptized at all, none contradicted this, but whether it is right to baptize them immediately or on the eighth day. To a man they all determined to baptize them immediately. This transaction passed in the year 253. Let the reader consider, if infant baptism had been an innovation, it must have been now of a considerable standing. The disputes concerning Easter and other very uninteresting points show that such an innovation must have formed a remarkable era in the church. The number of heresies and divisions had been very great. Among them all, such a deviation from apostolical practice as this must have been remarked. To me it appears impossible to account for the state of things, but on the footing that it had ever been allowed, and therefore that the custom was that of the first churches. Though then I should waive the argument drawn from that sentence of St. Paul, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy, and yet I must confess I cannot understand it to mean anything else than infant baptism. I am under a necessity of concluding that the enemies of infant baptism are mistaken, yet I see not why they may not serve God in sincerity, as well as those who are differently minded. The greatest evil lies in the want of charity, and in that contentious eagerness with which singularity in little things is apt to be attended. Really good men have not always been free from this. Perhaps a few on the whole cultivated larger and more generous views than the African prelate. Yet in one instance we shall presently see he was seduced into a bigotry of spirit, not unlike that which I am censuring. I could have wished that Christian people had never been vexed with a controversy so frivolous as this about baptism, and having once for all given my views and the reasons of them, I turn from the subject and observe further that there is in the extract of the letter before us a strong and clear testimony of the faith of the ancient church concerning original sin. One may safely reason in the same way as in the case just now considered, but the fullness of scripture concerning so momentous a point precludes the necessity of traditional arguments. A lover of divine truth will be glad, however, to learn that Christians in the middle of the third century did believe without contradiction that men were born in sin, and under the wrath of God through Adam's transgression, conceiving themselves as one with him, and involved with him in the consequences of his offence. Modern self-conceit may say to this what it pleases, but thus thought ancient Christians in general, and the very best Christians too, with whom was the Spirit of Christ in a powerful degree. 
The just consequence of such facts is not always attended to by those who are concerned in it. Yes, but reason should be attended to. So I say, but what is right reason? To submit to the testimony of the divine word. This alone is sufficient and is above all. If men will not abide by this, it is not unreasonable to tell them that their strained interpretations of Scripture are confuted by the sense of the primitive church, who had every opportunity of knowing the truth, that to deduce Scripture doctrines from what we should fancy to be reasonable is not reason but pride, that an argument drawn from settling the question, what do the ancient Christians think of these things, deserves some attention, but an argument drawn from our own fancies, what we think ought to be in Scripture, deserves none at all. It may be called a language of philosophy, nothing is more confused than the use of that term in our days, but it is not the language of one disposed to hear the word of God and to do it. A private case, which must have happened in time of peace, and therefore may properly be referred to this time, will deserve, for the light which it throws on primitive Christian manners, to be distinctly recorded. Quote, Cyprian, to Eucratius, his brother, health. Your love and esteem have induced you, dearest brother, to consult me as to what I think of the case of a player among you, who still continues in the same infamous art, and as a teacher of boys, not to be instructed but to be ruined by him, instructs others in that which he himself hath miserably learned. You ask whether he should be allowed the continuance of Christian communion. I think it very inconsistent with the majesty of God and the rules of his gospel that the modesty and honour of the church should be defiled by so base and infamous a contagion. In the law men are prohibited to wear female attire and are pronounced accursed. How much more criminal must it be not only to put on women's garments, but also to express lascivious, obscene and effeminate gestures in a way of instructing others? And let no man excuse himself as having left the theatre, while yet he undertakes to qualify others for the work. You cannot say that he has ceased from a business who provides substitutes in his room, and instead of one only furnishes the playhouse with a number, teaching them, contrary to the divine ordinance, how the male may be reduced into a female, and the sex be changed by art, and how Satan may be gratified by the defilement of the divine workmanship. If the man makes poverty his excuse, his necessities may be relieved in the same manner as those of others, who are maintained by the arms of the church, provided he be content with frugal but innocent food, and do not fancy that we are to hire him by a salary to cease from sin, since it is not our interest but his own that is concerned in this affair. But let his gains from the service of the playhouse be ever so large, what sort of gain is that which tears men from a participation in the banquet of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and leads them miserably and ruinously fattened in this world to the punishments of eternal famine and thirst. Therefore, as much as you can, recover him from this depravity and infamy to the way of innocence and to the hope of life, that he may be content with a parsimonious but salutary maintenance from the church. But if your church be insufficient to maintain its poor, he may transfer himself to us, and here receive what is necessary for food and raiment, and no longer teach pernicious things out of the church, but learn himself salutary things in the church. Dearest son, I wish you constant prosperity. End quote. The decision of Cyprian is doubtless that which piety and good sense would unite to dictate in the case. A player was ever an infamous character at Rome, and was looked on as incapable of filling any of the offices of state. The Romans, at the same time that they showed in this point their political, evinced the depravity of their moral sense. A set of men were still maintained for the public amusement, whom yet they knew must of necessity be dissolute and dangerous members of society. If this was the judgment of sober pagans, it is not to be wondered at that the purity of Christianity would not even suffer such characters to be admitted into the bosom of the church at all. To say that there are noble sentiments to be found in some dramas answers not the purpose of those who would vindicate the entertainments of the stage. The support of them requires a system in its own nature corrupt, and which must gratify the voluptuous and the libidinous, or it can have no durable existence. Hence in every age complaints have been made of the corruptions of the stage, and ideas have been thrown out of its great utility, provided it were kept under proper regulations. But who is to regulate it? Were it purged of its viciousness, and made altogether meet for Christian eyes and ears, it would cease to be attended at all. While the world is as it is, it must be an engine of corruption. 
Instruction is looked on in a subordinate light by the gravest advocates for it. Pleasure is its capital end, and that pleasure, if a set of men are to subsist by it, will ever be, as it always has been while mankind are what they are, impure in its nature in a great degree, and a school of impurity. It required no deep penetration in the first Christians to see this and to reject the stage entirely. A Christian renouncing the pomps and vanity of this wicked world, and yet frequenting the playhouse, was with them a solecism. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which now for three centuries we are reviewing, never admitted these amusements at all. A professor of the drama, we see, could not be allowed consistently to profess Christianity. It is one of the main designs of this history to show practically what true Christians were, both in principles and manners. The case before us shows them very clearly in this article belonging to the latter. What would Cyprian have said, to see large assemblies of Christians so called, devoted to these impurities and supporting them with all their might, and deriving from them their highest delights? He would at the same time observe the same persons, as might be expected, perfect strangers to the joy of the Holy Ghost. This is consistent enough, only he might wonder why such persons still kept up the name of Christians. If he examined their stage entertainments and compared them with those that were in vogue in his day, he would have seen the same confusion of sexes, the same encouragement of unchaste desires, and the same sensuality with the same contemptuous ridicule of Christianity, if indeed in his time the gospel was burlesqued on a stage as it has been in ours. In some points the ancient drama might be worse than ours, yet in others it might be more decent. But, as on the whole the spirit and tendency was the same, he would have been astonished that such men could still call themselves Christians, that actors and actresses could amass fortunes in a Christian country, in which many pastors could scarce find subsistence, and that theologians of great erudition should obtain applause by writing comments on dramatic poets, and by openly enlisting in the service of the stage. Pro dolo. There was one Fortunatian, bishop of Azure, who had lapsed in the time of persecution, and without any marks of repentance, still assumed to himself the episcopal character, and insisted on his being received as such by the clergy and people. This case gave occasion to an epistle of Cyprian to the church, in which he as strenuously opposes the ambitious claims of the bishop, as in like circumstances he had formerly done those of the laity, and he repeats the advice to the lapsed he had before given, cautioning the people against the reception of him in that character. Behold now the strenuous asserter of the rights of faithful bishops, openly exposing the pretensions of unworthy ones, and instructing the people to guard themselves against their delusions. What effect his epistle had does not appear. The weight of his character and the vigour of discipline, now happily prevalent in Africa, make it probable that it had the desired success. One Rogation, an African bishop, complained to Cyprian and his colleagues, assembled in a synod, of the insolent and injurious behaviour of a deacon. Cyprian observes that he might have done himself justice without them. He applies the case of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram to this of the haughty deacon, and takes notice very properly of the humble and unassuming carriage of our Lord towards the impious dignitaries of the Jewish church. Quote, he taught us, says he, how true pastors ought to be fully and regularly honoured, while he behaved himself so towards false ones. End quote. The following passage is perhaps the most striking proof of any in Cyprian's writings that the ideas of episcopacy were too lofty even in that age, and had insensibly grown with the gradual increase of superstition. Let it be remarked as a character of the times, and as an instance of the effect of the spirit of the times on a mind of one of the purest and humblest in the world. Quote, Deacons ought to remember that the Lord chose apostles, that is, bishops and rulers, but the apostles chose to themselves deacons, after his ascent into heaven, as the ministers of their government and of the church. Now, if we dare do anything against God who makes bishops, then may deacons dare to act against us by whom they are appointed. End quote. The comparison is very unseemly, nor ought bishops to be set on the same footing as the apostles, but he is certainly right in observing farther, quote, these are the beginnings of heresies and the attempts of ill-disposed schismatics to please themselves and despise with haughtiness their superior, End quote. And he goes on to advise the bishop how to act concerning him with that happy mixture of firmness and charity, of which, by a peculiarly intuitive discernment, he seldom failed to show himself a master. One Gominius Victor, 
appointed Faustinus, a presbyter, a guardian by his will. In an African synod, Cyprian and his colleagues wrote to the church of Ferne a protest against the practice. The clergy were then looked on as men wholly devoted to divine things. Secular cares were taken out of their hands as much as possible. Let this again be remarked as one of the happy effects of the work of the Holy Ghost on the church. Novationism had spread into Gaul, and Marcion, bishop of the church of Arclet, united himself to the schism. Faustinus, bishop of Lyon, wrote both to Cyprian of Carthage and Stephen of Rome on the subject. Other bishops in France wrote also on the subject. Cyprian supports the same cause with them in a letter to Stephen. The chief reason for mentioning this is to show how the gospel, which had so gloriously begun at Lyon in the second century, must now have spread in France to a great degree. Contentions and schisms usually have no place till after Christianity has taken deep root. The same observation may be made of the progress of the gospel in Spain, where, by the inscriptions of Syriac of Ancona, it appears that the light of truth had entered in Nero's time. Here, two bishops, Basiliades and Marshall, had deservedly lost their pastoral offices in the church on account of their unfaithfulness in the persecution. Cyprian and his colleagues in council wrote to confirm their deposition, and he shows that the people were no less bound than the clergy to abstain from the communion of such, and supports his argument by the directions of Moses to the children of Israel. Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. He recommends that ordinations should be performed in the sight of all the people, that they might all have an opportunity to approve or to condemn the characters of the persons ordained. He takes notice that in Africa the neighbouring bishops used to meet before the people of the place where the bishop was to be ordained, and the bishop was chosen in the presence of the people, who knew fully the life of each and his whole conversation. He observes that Sabinus, who had been substituted in the room of Basiliades, had been ordained in this fair and equitable manner. He censures Basiliades for going to Rome, imposing on Stephen and gaining his consent for his being reinstated. Cyprian thinks his guilt was augmented by his conduct. Marshall, it seems, had defiled himself with pagan abominations, and his deposition, he insists, ought to remain confirmed. While these things show the unhappy spirit of human depravity, bearing down the most wholesome fences of discipline, they evince that there were those at that time in the Christian world extremely careful, and that not without success, of the purity of the church and if ever it should please God to put it into the hearts of those who have power to reform what is amiss amongst ourselves, better guides and precedents than these, next to the Scriptures, are scarcely to be found. In the year 254, one Pupian, a man of note in the Church of Carthage, wrote him a letter complaining of his insolent and haughty conduct in ejecting such members out of the Church, and ruling with imperious sway. The African prelate had governed now six years, and had signalized himself equally in persecution and in peace, as the friend of piety, discipline, and order, and had with every temporal and spiritual faculty laid himself out for the good of the falling and distempered church. He saw by this time the great success of his labors, and he must now pay the tax which eminent virtue ever pays to slander and envy, to prevent the risings of pride, and to keep him low before his God. Pupian believed, or affected to believe, very unjust rumours which were circulated against his pastor, and said that the scruple of conscience with which he was seized prevented his owning the authority of Cyprian. He himself had suffered during the persecution, and had been faithful, probably a person of Lucian's character, both in his virtues and weaknesses, and was disgusted at the backwardness of Cyprian to receive the lapsed. He heavily complained of his severity, while the Novation party had separated from him on account of his lenity. But the best and wisest of men have ever been most exposed to such inconsistent charges. It does not appear that Pupian was able to raise a second sect of dissenters on opposite grounds to those of the first. We will rather hope that he saw into his error and returned into a state of charity with his bishop. A few extracts from Cyprian's answer, for we have not Pupian's letter, may throw still stronger light on the character of Cyprian and may afford us some salutary reflections. To the charge of Pupian that he was not possessed of humility, he answers thus, quote, Which of us is farthest from humility? I, who daily serve the brethren, and who with kindness and pleasure receive every one who comes to the church, or you, who constitute yourself the bishop of the bishop, and the judge of the judge appointed by God for the time? 
The Lord, in the Gospel, when it was said to him, Answerest thou the high priest so? Still preserving the respect due to the sacerdotal character, said nothing against the high priest, but only cleared his own innocence. And St. Paul, though he might have exerted himself against those who had crucified the Lord, yet answers, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Unless you will say that I was a pastor before the persecution, when you were in communion with me, and after the persecution I ceased to be a pastor. The persecution reaching you exalted you to the honour of a witness for Christ. Me it depressed with a load of a prescription, when the public edict was read. If any one holds or possesses anything of the goods of Cecilius Cyprian, bishop of the Christians. Thus even those who believed not God, who appoints the bishop, credited the devil who proscribed him. I speak not these things in a way of boasting, but with grief, since you set yourself up as a judge of God and his Christ, who says to the apostles, and of consequence to all the bishops, the successors of the apostles, He that heareth you, heareth me, and he that rejecteth you, rejecteth me. Hence heresies and schisms arise, and do arise while the bishop who is one, and presides over the church, is despised by the proud presumption of some. For what arrogance is this, to call pastors to your cognizance, unless they be acquitted at your bar? Behold, now for six years the brethren have been without a bishop. You say your scruples must be solved, but why did not those martyrs, full of the Holy Ghost, who suffered for God and his Christ, indulge those scruples? Why so many of my colleagues and so many of the people illustrious for their sufferings? Must all who communicated with me be polluted, according to what you have written, and have lost the hope of eternal life? Pupian, alone upright, inviolable, holy and chaste, who will not mix with us, will dwell solitary in paradise. End quote. He then exhorts him to return to the bosom of the church, at the same time informs him that in the matter of receiving him he shall be guided by intimations from the Lord communicated to him, it may be by visions and dreams. This is a language not unusual with Cyprian. He repeatedly speaks of instructions communicated to him in this way. We know too little of the mode of dispensation the church at that time was under to judge accurately concerning this language. Certainly the age of miracles had not then ceased. Instruction by dreams was very much the method of God in Scripture, and it would be an inexcusable temerity to censure a man of such wisdom and veracity, as Cyprian was, by tying him down to our modes of judging. If some expressions in the letter savour of episcopal haughtiness, which was then growing in the church, the main tenor of it contains nothing but what Pupian ought to have attended to. A readiness to believe stories, tending to calumniate the worthiest pastors, is a snare which Satan has too successfully laid for the church in all ages. Much greater circumspection is doubtless due on this head than many are disposed to pay. The brotherly fellowship of churches much depends on this point, their endeavouring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Cyprian concludes in this nervous manner, quote, I have written these things with a pure conscience and in the confidence of my God. You have my letters, I have yours. Both will be recited in the day of judgment before the tribunal of Christ. End quote. A controversy now arose in the church while the pacific spirit of Valerian continued to protect it, which reflects no honour on any of the parties concerned in it. The question was whether persons returning from heresies into the church ought to be rebaptized. The active spirit of Cyprian was employed, partly by a council in Africa and partly by his letters, in maintaining that the baptism of heretics was null and void, that even novation baptism ought to be looked upon in the same light. Stephen of Rome maintained that if they were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, it was sufficient to receive them into the church by imposition of hands, and though nothing was at present decided, because no party had power to compel others, Yet most Christians have agreed long since with Stephen that the efficacy of a sacrament rightly administered depends not on the character of him that administers it, is the voice of good sense as well as of the Church of England. But the character which Cyprian had not undeservedly acquired by his labours and sufferings procured him a much greater degree of strength than either the importance of his cause or the weight of his arguments merited. Even Familian of Cappadocia in a long letter supported his side of the question, he occasionally mentions, in it, a story of a woman about twenty-two years before the date of this letter, who professed herself a prophetess, and for a long time deceived the brethren with her ecstatic raptures, till one of the exorcists confuted her pretensions. 
It is worthwhile just to have mentioned this to show that delusions have ever been raised by Satan to disgrace the work of God. It appears by his letter that Stephen behaved with much violence and asperity in the contest, not even admitting to a conference the brethren who came to him from distant parts who were of Cyprian's opinion, and denying to them the common rights of hospitality. Another circumstance which turns out in the course of this controversy is that Cyprian justly enough decides that those whose weak state of health did not permit them to be washed in water were yet sufficiently baptized by being sprinkled, and observes that the virtue of baptism ought not to be estimated in a carnal manner by the quantity of external apparatus. How weak, alas, is man! A piece of three years had set the church in a flame among themselves for a trifle, and one of the best and wisest of men in his day, by his zeal for unity and his care against innovations, is betrayed into the support of an indefensible point of mere ceremony, which tends to the encouragement of superstition and the weakening of brotherly love. How soon do we forget that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost? With what difficulty is anything of the real love of Jesus and the fruits of it preserved in the church? All this proves in the strongest manner how mighty and gracious the Lord is in still preserving a church in the earth, how dark and corrupt man is, how active and subtle Satan is, how precious is that blood which cleanses from all sin, and how true is that book which contains such salutary doctrine, and so faithfully describes the misery of man. How safely may its account of the way of salvation be rested on, how pleasing the prospect it exhibits of the church above. The reader would justly think my time and his own ill spent in unravelling the niceties of this trifling controversy. God has a scourge for his froward children. Persecution lowers again with recollected strength, and Christians are called on to forget their idle, internal squabbles, to humble themselves before him and prepare for scenes of horror and desolation. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of the History of the Church of Christ, Century Three by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Last Acts and Martyrdom of Cyprian. The change in the disposition of Valerian towards the Christians, which now took place, is one of the most memorable instances of the instability of human characters. More than all his predecessors, he was disposed to kindness towards the Christians. Not even Philip was so courteous and friendly towards them. His palace was full of the friends of Jesus and was looked on as a sanctuary. But now, after he had reigned three years, he was induced by his favourite, Macrianus, to commence a deadly persecution. This man dealt largely in magical enchantments and abominable sacrifices. He slaughtered children and scattered the entrails of newborn babes. The persecution of Christians was an exploit worthy of a mind so fascinated with diabolical wickedness and folly. He found in Valerian but too ready a disciple. The persecution began in the year 257 and continued the remainder of his reign, three years and a half. Stephen of Rome appears to have died a natural death about the beginning of it. For there is no evidence of his martyrdom, and we want the proofs which might thence be afforded, whether his turbulent and aspiring spirit was combined with anything of genuine Christianity. He was succeeded by Sixtus. Cyprian, who had escaped two persecutions, was now made the victim of the third, though by slow degrees, and attended with circumstances of comparative lenity. Everything relating to him is so interesting that it may not be amiss to prosecute his story in a connected manner to his death and to reserve the narrative of other objects of this persecution till afterwards. He was seized by the servants of Paternus, the proconsul of Carthage, and brought into his council chamber. The sacred emperors, Valerian and Galenius, says Paternus, have done me the honour to direct letters to me, in which they have decreed that all men ought to adore the gods whom the Romans adore, and on pain of being slain with a sword. I have heard that you despise the worship of the gods, whence I advise you to consult for yourself and honour them. I am a Christian, replied the prelate, and know no god but the one true god who created heaven and earth, the sea and all things in them. This god we Christians serve, to him we pray night and day for all men, and even for the emperors. You shall die the death of a malefactor if you persevere in this inclination. That is a good inclination which fears God, answered Cyprian, and therefore must not be changed. You must then, by the will of the princes, be banished. 
He is no exile, it was replied, who has God in his heart, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Paternus said, Before you go, tell me, where are your presbyters, who are said to be in this city? With much presence of mind, Cyprian reminded him of the edicts made by the best Roman princes against the practice of informers. They ought not, therefore, to be discovered by me, but you may find them, and you yourselves do not approve of men offering themselves voluntarily to you. I will make you discover them by torments. By me, the intrepid bishop rejoined, they shall not be discovered. Our princes have ordered that Christians hold no conventicles, and whoever breaks this rule shall be put to death. Do what you are ordered, Cyprian calmly replied. Paternus, however, was not disposed to hurt Cyprian. Most probably he respected the character of the man, which by this time must have been highly esteemed, through a shining series of good works in Africa. Having made some ineffectual attempts to work on his fears, he sent him into banishment to Curubius, a little town fifty miles from Carthage, situate by the sea, over against Sicily. The place was healthy, the air good, and by his own desire he had private lodgings. The citizens of Curubius, during the eleven months which he lived among them, treated him with great kindness, and he was repeatedly visited by Christians. Here he served his divine master in good works, and Paternus, in the interim, died. While he was here, he heard that the persecutors had seized nine bishops with several priests and deacons, and a great number of the faithful, even virgins and children, and after beating them with sticks had sent them to work in the copper mines in the mountains. Every one of these bishops had been present at the last council of Carthage, and their names were Nemesius, Felix, Lucius, a second Felix, Latius, Paulus, Victor, Jada, and Dativus. I cannot account for the better treatment which Cyprian received from the Roman governors in any other way than by the respect that was paid to his superior quality, labours, and virtues. Be that as it may, Providence favoured him in a peculiar manner. But his sympathising spirit could not but be with his brethren, and what he felt and how he thought see expressed in a letter to Nemesian and the rest. Quote, Your glory required, blessed and beloved brethren, that I ought to come and embrace you, were it not that the confession of the same name has confined me also to this place, but I exhibit myself to you as well as I can, and if it is forbidden me to come to you in body, yet I come in spirit and affection, expressing my soul in letters, how I exult in your honours, reckoning myself a partner with you, though not in suffering, yet in the fellowship of love. How can I hold my peace when I know such glorious things of my dearest brethren, with which the divine appointment hath honoured you? part of you, having already been consummated in martyrdom, who will receive a crown of righteousness from the Lord, and the rest as yet in prisons, or in mines and bonds, exhibiting by the tediousness of punishment greater arguments to arm and strengthen the brethren by the retardation of torments, advancing to a higher proficiency in Christian glory, and sure to receive in heaven according to their sufferings. In truth, that the Lord has thus honoured you affords me no surprise when I consider the blameless cause of your faith in the church, your firm adherence to the divine ordinance, your integrity, concord, humility, diligence, mercy in cherishing the poor, constancy in defence of the truth, and strictness of Christian discipline, and that nothing might be wanting in you as patterns of good works even now in the confession of your voice and in the sufferings of your body, you stir up the minds of the brethren to divine martyrdom by exhibiting yourselves as leaders of goodness, so that while the flock follow their pastor and imitate their presidents, they may be crowned in like manner by the Lord." that you have been grievously beaten by clubs, and have been initiated by that punishment in Christian confession, is a thing not to be lamented. The body of a Christian trembles not on account of clubs, all whose hope is in wood. The servant of Christ acknowledges the emblem of his salvation, redeemed by wood to eternal life, by wood he has advanced to the crown, of feet embarrassed with fetters indeed, but quickly about to run to Christ in a glorious cause. Let malice and cruelty fetter you as they please, quickly you will come from heaven, and its sorrows to the kingdom of heaven. In those minds the body is not refreshed by a bed, but Christ in its consolation and rest. Your limbs, fatigued with labours, lie on the ground, but to lie down with Christ is no punishment. Filth and dirt defile your limbs, void of the cleansing bath, but you are inwardly washed from all uncleanness. Your allowance of bread is but scanty, but man doth not live by bread alone, but by the word of God." You have no proper clothes to fence you from the cold, but he who has put on Christ is clothed abundantly. End quote. He afterwards comforts them by suitable arguments under the loss of means of grace and public worship, and speaks of the Lord as rewarding what he himself hath performed in us. 
quote, For it is of him that we conquer. It is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. End quote. He shows hence the great sin of unbelief in not trusting him who promises his aid to those who confess him, and in not fearing him who threatens eternal punishment to those who deny him. In conclusion, he begs their earnest prayers that he and they may be freed from the snares and darkness of the world, that those who in the bond of love and peace had stood together against the injuries of heretics and the pressures of the heathen might together rejoice in celestial mansions. Nemesian and the other bishops returned him an answer full of affection and gratitude from three different places in which they were confined, in which they acknowledged the pecuniary assistance which Cyprian sent them. He wrote also to Rogation the Younger and other confessors who were in prison, most probably at Carthage, animating them in his usual manner, quote, to spurn present punishment through the hope of future joys, end quote. He speaks with much pleasure also of some women and boys who were partners of their sufferings. He recommends to them the example of the elder Rogation and the ever-quiet and sober Felicissimus, footnote, I suppose he thus distinguishes him from the factious Felicissimus, epistle 81, end footnote, who had consummated their martyrdom already. In the year 260, Cyprian, returning from exile by permission, lived in a garden near Carthage, which was now providentially restored to him, though he had sold it at his first conversion. His liberal spirit would have inclined him once more to sell it for the relief of the needy, had he not feared to attract the envy of the persecutors. He here regulated the affairs of the church and distributed to the poor what he had left. Here he understood that the persecution, after a little interval, was broken out afresh, and hearing various reports, he sent some to Rome to gain certain information. From these he learnt what he immediately communicated to the brethren, that Valerian had given orders that bishops, presbyters, and deacons should be put to death without delay, that senators, noblemen, and knights should be degraded and deprived of their property, and if they still persisted to be Christians, should lose their lives, that women of quality should be deprived of their property and banished that all Caesar's freedmen, who should have confessed, should be stripped of their goods, chained, and sent to work on his estates. These were Valerian's orders to the Senate, and thus he wrote to the governors of the provinces, quote, These letters we daily expect to arrive, standing in the firmness of faith, in patient expectation of suffering, and hoping from the Lord's help and kindness, the crown of eternal life. End quote. He mentions also the news he had heard of the martyrdom of Sixtus, the Bishop of Rome, and the daily ferocity with which the persecution was carried on at Rome in all its horrors. He begs that the intelligence may be circulated through Africa, quote, that we may all think of death not more than immortality, and, in the fullness of faith, may rather rejoice at than fear the event, End quote. Galerius Maximus had succeeded Paternus in the proconsulate, and Cyprian was daily expected to be sent for. In this awful crisis, a number of senators and others, considerable for their offices or their quality, came to him. Ancient friendship melted the minds of some of them towards the man, but they offered to conceal him in country places, but his soul was now a thirst for martyrdom. The uncertainty of tedious banishment could not be agreeable to one who had had so much experience of this kind, and Valerian's law being expressly levelled at men of his character, there seemed little probability of his being long concealed. I believe his generous temper would have been hurt to have endangered any of his old pagan friends on his account. He might then hesitate to accept their offers, though he would by no means, according to the steady maxims of his conscientious prudence, do anything to accelerate his own death. Pontius, his deacon, in his life, tells us, in opposition to the intemperate zeal of those who were for giving themselves up to the martyrdom, that he had fears on his head, but his fears were conscientious, lest he should displease God by throwing away his life. He continued still at Carthage, exhorting the faithful, and wishing that when he should suffer for martyrdom, death might find him thus employed for his God. However, being informed that the proconsul, then at Utica, had sent some soldiers to bring him thither, he was induced to comply for a season with the advice of his friends, to retire to some place of concealment that he might not suffer at Utica, but, if he was called to martyrdom, might finish his life among his own people at Carthage. So he states the matter in the last of his letters to the clergy and people. Quote, Here, says he, in this concealment I wait for the return of the proconsul to Carthage, ready to appear before him, and to say what shall be given me at the hour. Do you, dear brethren, do you agreeably to the discipline you have always received, and to the instructions you have learnt from me, continue still and quiet, let none of you excite any tumult on account of the brethren, or offer himself voluntarily to the Gentiles. 
He who is seized and delivered up ought to speak. The Lord in us will speak at that hour, and confession rather than profession is our duty. End quote. The proconsul being returned to Carthage, Cyprian returned to his garden. While he was there, two officers with soldiers came to seize him. They carried him in a chariot between them to a place called Sextus, six miles from Carthage by the seaside, where the proconsul lodged indisposed. The proconsul deferred the affair till the next day, and he was carried back to the lodgings of the chief of the officers about the distance of a stadium from the praetorium. The news spread through Carthage, his celebrity on account of his good works drew prodigious crowds to the scene, not only of Christians but of infidels who revered the virtue of the man. The chief of the officers guarded him, but in a courteous manner, so that he ate with his friends and had them about him as usual. The Christians passed the night in the street before his lodgings, and the charity of Cyprian moved him to direct a particular attention to be paid to the young women who were among the crowd. The next day the proconsul sent for Cyprian, who went to the praetorium attended by crowds of people. The proconsul not yet appearing, he was ordered to wait for him in a private place where he sat down. Being in a great perspiration, a soldier, who had been a Christian, offered him fresh clothes. Shall we, says Cyprian, seek for a remedy for that which may last no longer than today? He was at length brought into the judgment hall where the proconsul sat. Are you Thasca Cyprian? I am. Are you he whom the Christians call their bishop? I am. Our princes have ordered you to worship the gods. That I shall not do. You will do better to consult your safety and not despise the gods. My safety and virtue is Christ the Lord, whom I desire to serve forever. I pity your case, says the proconsul, and could wish to consult for you. I do not wish, says the prelate, that things should be otherwise with me than that adoring my God I may hasten to him with all the ardour of my soul, for the afflictions of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The proconsul, now reddening with anger, says, You have lived sacrilegiously a long time and have formed into a society men of an impious conspiracy and have shown yourself an enemy to the gods and their religion and have not hearkened to the equitable counsels of their princes, but have ever been a father of the impious sect and their ringleader. You shall therefore be an example to the rest and they shall learn their duty by your blood." Let Theseus Cyprian, who refuses to sacrifice to the gods, be put to death by the sword. God be praised, said the martyr, and while they were leading him away, a multitude of the people followed and cried, Let us die with our holy bishop. A troop of soldiers attended him, and the officers marched on each side of him. They led him into a plain surrounded with trees, and many climbed up to the top of them to see him at a distance. Cyprian took off his mantle and fell on his knees and worshipped his god. Then he put off his inner garment and remained in his shirt. The executioner being come, Cyprian ordered twenty-five golden denarii to be given him. He himself bound the napkin over his eyes, and a presbyter and deacon tied his hands for him, and the Christians laid before him napkins and handkerchiefs to receive his blood. Then his head was cut off by the sword. His biographer, Pontius, represents himself as wishing to have died with him, and as divided between the joy of his victorious martyrdom and sorrow that himself was left behind. Thus, after an eventful and instructive period of about twelve years since his conversion, after a variety of toils and exercises among friends, and open foes and nominal Christians, by a death more gentle than commonly fell to the lot of martyrs, rested at length in Jesus the magnanimous and charitable spirit of Cyprian of Carthage. An extraordinary personage, surely, but the character will yet deserve a more distinct illustration. Let writers whose views are secular celebrate their heroes, their statesmen, and their philosophers, and while a Christian taste is derided, let us at least enjoy the rare felicity of these times of civil liberty in employing the press to do some justice, however deficient our powers may be, to men whom the modern taste seems willing to assign to contemptuous oblivion, and let their memorial be blessed for ever. End of chapter 14《ジャンプ15》of the history of the Church of Christ, century three by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cyprian compared with Origen. The East and the West beheld at the same time these two men in talents, activity, and endowments much superior to the rest of the Christian world. The Roman seems beyond comparison to have excelled the Grecian in those things in which true Christian virtue consists. 
yet as the latter, by the fruits of his life, claims a just place among the saints, though miserably tarnished and clouded, chiefly by his philosophy, it may answer some valuable purpose, not impertinent to the design of this history, to enter into a comparison between them in some particulars. First, there may have been, as pious and holy men as Cyprian in the interval of time between the apostles and him, but we have no opportunity of knowing any other so well. The distinct particularity of the accounts concerning him makes his character remarkably deserving of our attention. The dealings of God with a sinner at his first conversion often give a strong tincture to his whole future life. Cyprian was meant for very great and important services of an active nature in the church, attended with an almost uninterrupted series of suffering, such as no man could perform to the glory of God, but one who knew assuredly the ground on which he stood by a strong work of the divine spirit on his soul. His experience in conversion, he describes himself in his letter to Donatus, his reception of Christianity was not the effect of mere reasoning or speculation, it was not carried on in a scholastic or philosophical manner, but may truly be said to have been in demonstration of the spirit and of power. He felt the grace of God, forgiveness of sins by Jesus Christ, the influence of the Holy Ghost, powerful, exuberant, and victorious. His soul was brought into the love of God, and that of the purest kind, tempered ever with humility and godly fear. And it is very evident that he always saw the work to be of God, and had nothing to behold in himself as wise, holy, and glorious, that a spirit of thankfulness for redeeming love, of simple dependence on the divine promises, and of steady charity to God and man was the result. His race was of no long duration, about twelve years, by far the greater part of the time he was Bishop of Carthage. He lived a Christian life, and no part of that was exempt from much labour or much affliction. He seems never to have known what it was to settle into a lukewarm state. The fire first kindled in him, burnt serene and steady to the end of his days. I know that Morsheim charges him with an ambitious domineering spirit that invaded the rights of the lower clergy and people. But I know him too well, though an excellent and very judicious secular historian, to trust his account of men of real holiness. From the most attentive review I have been able to make of the African prelate, by a repeated perusal of his writings, especially his epistles, I cannot see anything on which to ground this censure. He did nothing in general without the clergy and people. He was ever sedulous in promoting the good of the whole. The episcopal character itself, through the gradual growth of superstition, though as yet at no very blamable height in the church, was naturally growing up to an excess of honour, and some few expressions savouring of haughtiness and asperity under particular provocation I have observed in Cyprian but ambition was not his vice. Candor would rather say he was in general influenced by a very fervent zeal, doubtless supported in its exertions by a temper remarkably active and sanguine. But when I would look for anything selfish, proud, or domineering in his general conduct, I am struck with the steady tenor of gentleness, charity, and humility. In fine, had he not been a Christian, one might have held him forth to the world as a great man, if it be the part of a great man to unite in a large and capacious soul the opposite qualities which so rarely meet in firm consistence in the same subject, spirit and mildness, magnanimity and mercy, fortitude and prudence, warmth of temper and accuracy of judgment, and particularly zeal and discretion, each in a very high degree. In Origen's conversion we see nothing remarkable. He received Christianity more in a way of education, it is not usual with God to make use of such persons for such extraordinary services as those who, like Cyprian, in the prime of life have been selected from the world. Origen's views of the peculiar truths of Christianity were, to say no more, too faint and general, nor ever sufficiently distinguished from moral and philosophical religion. He bore persecution when young, with much zeal and honesty, but he lived many years in peace and prosperity. Sought after by philosophers, esteemed by courts, and honoured by the great, he lived a scholastic rather than an active life in the church, always fully employed indeed, but more like a scholar than a minister, ever bent on promoting truth and holiness so far as he knew them, but always leaving one in pain because of the defectiveness of his views. His last scenes are the best and most decisively Christian. He suffered persecution with the patience and honesty of a martyr, and proved indeed whose disciple he was on the whole. Mosheim charges him with dishonesty in his arguments against Celsus, and says that any one that has penetration and judgment may discern it. I have examined this tract. I cannot say, by any means, with that care with which I have Cyprian's letters, 
as I do not think it deserves it, but I have examined it so far as to be induced to dissent from Mosheim. Indeed, great honesty of mind was, if I mistake not, a ruling feature of Origen's character. When will modern writers learn to show any candour towards the ancients, and cease to suppose all excellencies to be confined to these later ages? After this general review of these two great men, and after it has been owned that integrity and fairness of mind were possessed by both in a very great degree, if it be asked wherein lay the superior virtue of Cyprian, I answer, besides what has been said of the difference of their conversions, and above all, of the work of God in their hearts all along. Second, Cyprian was possessed of a simplicity to which Origen seems ever to have been a stranger. By simplicity, I mean here a genuine and unadulterated taste for the doctrine and spirit of the Christian religion, just as it stands in its real nature. It is possible for a person very eminent in this gift, which is purely divine and spiritual, not to know much more of evangelical truth than another far inferior in this respect, because the light and means of information are very different in different ages of the church, and it is evident that the third century suffered a decline in illumination. But where a man is deficient in knowledge, yet if his simplicity of Christian taste be very strong, he will be silent on those subjects which he understands not, at least you shall hear hardly anything opposite to any part of divine truth. This is Cyprian's case. I cannot find, for instance, that he understood the election of grace. Since Justin's days the knowledge of it was departing from the church, but he opposed it not. Origen, less humble and less submissive to divine instruction, and feeling more resources in his reasoning powers, dares to oppose it by an opposite statement of the doctrine. In Cyprian, this simplicity appears in a supreme degree. He never trifles with scripture, or sets up his reason against it. Void of the whole apparatus of Grecian philosophy, and possessed of what is much better, plain good sense, he takes always the words of Scripture in their first, obvious, and most natural meaning, and thinks he has sufficiently proved his point when he has supported it by an apposite quotation. His spirit bows to the divine word, and hence faith, patience, charity, heavenly mindedness have full dominion in his soul. Hence his sentiments have a strength, a purity, a perspicuity peculiarly inherent in those whose religious taste is altogether scriptural. Here it is that he and Origen are opposite, Toto Coelho. The latter is full of platonic notions concerning the soul of the world, the transmigration of spirits, free will, and pre-existence of souls, and allegorical interpretations without end. The first and simple sense of scripture he too often dares to reject entirely. David's sin in the affair of Uriah he cannot admit. It seems he had not such strong and palpable proof of his own innate depravity as to suppose it possible for so good a man to fall so foully. He has recourse, therefore, to a hidden, abstruse sense. In his numberless comments on scripture, he constantly deals in fanciful allegories, and makes a system of this sort which pervades the whole of the sacred oracles, and while the just and plain sense is much neglected, he covers the whole with the thick mist of mysticism and chimerical philosophy. And while he labours still to support the faith, which was once delivered to the saints, he mixes it with much allegorical trash, after the manner of his platonic master, Ammonius, which will not incorporate with Christian doctrine. Thus, by accommodating his interpretation to the then reigning literary taste, he gained to himself indeed a celebrity of character among the heathen, even among the great and the noble, but threw all things into inextricable ambiguity. The quickness of his parts and his superior ingenuity hence entangled him only the deeper, and enabled him to move in the chaos of his own formation with an ease and rapidity that rendered him unconscious of the difficulties in which he had involved himself. One remarkable consequence of this difference of character was that, while Origen could gain the favour of the great among the pagans, and be heard by them with patience, Cyprian could not be endured in his preaching or writings, but by real Christians. And another is this, that while it is no easy thing to vindicate the soundness of the former in Christian principles, the latter stands in full perspicuity Christian throughout. Such is the difference between a man of simplicity and a man of philosophy in religion, and one may on this occasion compare the effect of a philosophical and of a philological spirit. Origen had the former, Cyprian the latter, for eloquence was his forte, and he possessed all the powers of it in a very high degree, according to the taste of his age, which was far from being the best. May it not be said that grammar, history, criticism, oratory, 
taught and acquired, with a proper subordination to divine grace and regulated by common sense, are much less dangerous and, in their way, more useful endowments for a minister of Christ than philosophy of any kind, metaphysical or natural. I mean not to exclude these from the education of persons who mean to be pastors, far from it, but this I must say, that a less proportion of these and a greater proportion of those than what agrees with the present fashionable taste would be more advantageous to the church. The reasoning powers may find in the former an useful exercise and improvement without the danger of presumption so strongly adhering to the latter. Third, having compared the lives and the spirit of the men, let us now view a little the principles of each. Of Cyprian, after the many quotations already given from his writings, little need be added. Nevertheless, as it has lain more in our way to consider him as addressing Christians than pagans or infidels, I shall select a letter of his to Demetrian, a persecutor of Christians in Africa, in which his manner of preaching to men, altogether profane and unconverted, is observable. He denounces to him the plain threatenings of eternal punishment. Quote, there remains hereafter an eternal prison, constant flame and perpetual punishment. There the groans of supplicants will not be heard because... Here you would not hear the terror of God's indignation. End quote. He bids him solemnly look into himself and appeals to his conscience as affording full proof of his guilt before God. And he aggravates the charge of condemnation because, amidst the miseries of the times, men did not repent, and he exposes the unreasonableness of idolatry. After exhibiting in lively colours the all important scenes of the Last Judgment, he concludes with this Christian exhortation, which is introduced in the true taste and order of things after he had first denounced the terrors of the law. Quote, Provide then for your security and life while you may. We offer you the salutary office of our mind and counsel, and because we may not hate you, and we please God more by not requiting evil, we exhort you, while there is time, to please God and to emerge from the profound night of superstition to the fair light of true religion. We envy not your advantages, nor do we hide the divine benefits. We return good will for your hatred, and... For the torments and punishments which are brought upon us, we show the paths of salvation. Believe and live, and ye who persecute us for a time, rejoice with us forever. When you depart hence, there will be no room for repentance, no method of being reconciled to God. Here life is lost or held. Here provision is made for eternal salvation by the worship of God and the fruit of faith, and let no man be retarded either by his sins or his years from coming to obtain salvation. No repentance is too late while a man remains in this world. An access lies open to the grace of God, and to those who seek and understand the truth, the access is easy. Even in the very exit of life, pray for remission of sins and implore the only living true God with confession and faith. Pardon is granted to him who confesses, and saving grace from the divine goodness is conferred on the believer, and a man may pass to immortality in the very article of death. This grace Christ imparts, this office of his mercy he affords by subduing death through the trophy of his cross, by redeeming the believer with the price of his blood, by reconciling man to God the Father, by quickening the dead with celestial regeneration. Him, if it be possible, let us all follow. Let us be baptized in his name. He opens to us the way of life. He brings us back to paradise. He leads us to the heavenly kingdom. With him we shall always live. By him made sons of God. With him we shall always exult. Recovered by his blood, we shall be Christians with Christ in glory, blessed of God the Father, rejoicing ever in his goodness in his sight, and giving him thanks to eternity, for he cannot but be always grateful and joyful, who, when he was obnoxious to death, has been made secure of immortality. End quote. With such an affectionate spirit and with such clearness of doctrine did Cyprian preach justification by faith only to the unconverted. It must not be denied that in his address to men who had already tasted that the Lord is gracious, there is not the same degree of evangelical purity. In his opere and Elle Emosunis, he represents the duty of almsgiving, of which he says very excellent things, in a style that might easily be constructed into the language of merit, and as he had not learnt to distinguish the Apocrypha from the Old Testament, he supports his ideas with quotations from Tobit and Ecclesiasticus. He thinks that the filth we contract after conversion may be washed away by baptism, and has a few other expressions to the same purport. We have had an experience of the evil tendency of such language which he had not. 
We know, too, from the dependence on divine grace and the Spirit's illumination, which Cyprian and many other fathers of the same stamp had, besides the testimony of their holy lives, that the same expressions mean not with them what they do in the mouths of moderns, full of self-righteousness and contempt both of the grace of Christ and of the work of the Holy Ghost. We are sure that the former mean no opposition to the grace of God because they are humble. It is but too evident that the latter do because they are proud and scorn the whole work of God in the new birth. It had been well, however, if saints had never given a handle to the profane to adulterate the doctrines of the gospel. But I have before observed that Cyprian's views of grace were not equally clear with those of the first Christians. Yet in every fundamental principle he speaks as the oracles of God. In his addresses to pagans, Christians, or Jews, he is always fervent and zealous. His tract on patience as a practical performance, and that on the Lord's Prayer as a doctrinal one, deserve the highest praise. To finish here the account of his works, they are excellent in their kind, and he must have a poor taste indeed in godliness who will not find the perusal of them refreshing to his soul. But he shines much more in practical than in speculative divinity. The shortness of his Christian life and the weight of his employments will easily account for this. I wish it were as easy to clear the doctrinal character of origin from reproach. The ancients themselves were much divided in their views of his opinion concerning the Son of God, it is certain that the Arians of the 4th century seemed to receive some countenance from him, and men who had so very little assistance from precedence were glad to catch at the shadow of an argument drawn from his illustrious name. Were his Arianism indeed full and confessed on all hands, what would it avail as an argument? I say not against the Scriptures, but against the joint consent of the whole Church for 300 years. Even the very opposition made against his character, by many, shows how zealous the Church had ever been in the defense of the doctrine of the Trinity. I see no profit from entering this wide field. His books against Celsus, in which he ably defends Christianity against philosophy and paganism, with his Philokalia, are those alone which I have had opportunity to read, and these want not sufficiently decisive passages, were they not embarrassed by others of a more doubtful cast. It is certain, however, that one who thought so rapidly, wrote so much, and had his eyes so steadily on his philosophy, must have dropped many things from his pen, which he would not have said a second time had he considered them. That he never meant to hold anything different from the general creed is certain from the pains he took against heretics, as well as his general character. His erroneous sentences seem, then, more properly to contain queries and conjectures than settled opinions, Athanasius, and he must be allowed to have been a judge of this matter, believed him to be sound, and quotes him to prove our Lord's co-eternity and co-essentiality with the Father. And he observes that what things he wrote by way of controversy and disputation are not to be looked on as his own words. The best defense, after all, of Origen lies in the general holiness of his life and patient suffering for the faith of Christ in his old age and I rejoice that, amidst all the trash with which his writings abound, we have yet this unquestionable testimony that he kept the commandments of God and had the faith of Jesus. The great loss of his works, particularly his very voluminous commentaries, is not much to be regretted, but there are two sentences in them which deserve to be quoted at length. He thus speaks on these words, Romans 3, we conclude that a man is justified by faith, etc., Quote, the justification of faith only is sufficient, so that if any only believe, he may be justified, though no good work hath been fulfilled by him. End quote. And again, on the case of the penitent thief, quote, he was justified by faith without the works of the law, because concerning this the Lord did not inquire what he had done before, neither did he stay to ask what work he would perform after he had believed, but being justified by his confession only, he, going to paradise, carried him as a companion along with him. End quote. Thus the precious doctrine of justification, though too much sullied and covered with rubbish, even in the third century, was yet alive in the faith of the most dubious characters among the Antinicene fathers. This it was that kept Origen, with all his hay and stubble, firm on Christian foundations, and distinguished him radically from an enemy of Christ. Fourth, if we compare the public life of these two men, the Grecian shines in scholastic, the Roman in a pastoral capacity. Origen appears as an author, and moves in a sphere calculated for the learned. Cyprian is a preacher, and like the apostles, addresses equally all sorts of men. Yet, through the pride of corrupt nature, he was most likely to be attended to by the poor. Refinement of thought he valued not. To address the heart and conscience, and to reduce every religious consideration to real practice, this was his aim. 
Yet Origen was usefully employed in untying knotty speculations, in arguing down heresies, in recommending Christianity, or something like Christianity, to the learned world. No doubt his labours would be of some use amidst the mischief which the accommodating scheme pronounced. But the pastoral labours of Cyprian, as they would not be received at all by prejudiced philosophers, so where they were received, left effects of unadulterated piety, through the divine influence that attended them. As a Christian bishop, hardly any age has seen his superior in activity, disinterestedness, steady attention to discipline, equally remote from extremes of negligent remissness and impracticable severity, a charity and a patience unwearied and ever consistent. He may safely be recommended as a model to all pastors, and particularly to those of episcopal rank through Christendom. Whoever of them feel a desire to serve God in the most arduous and the most important of all professions, next after the study of the sacred oracles, may profitably give their days and nights to Cyprian. All his genuine writings, the correspondence with Stephen of Rome, and what relates to the controversy between them accepted, deserve to be studiously perused. His letters most of all, yet unless a man has himself experienced the new birth unto righteousness, he cannot be expected to relish them much. If he is regenerated indeed, it is scarce possible for him not to feel a generous glow of the purest godliness from the reading of them with care and attention. That such bishops were more frequent in Europe is devoutly to be wished. What avails good sense, taste, learning, without Christian simplicity, and a heart above the world, its flatteries or its frowns? Whoever would see what Christian bishops were once, and still ought to be, let him contemplate the prelate of Carthage. Fifth but the chief point of view in which the contrast between these two persons is most striking is in the consequences and fruits of their labours and their works. Before Cyprian's time, Africa appears to have been in no very flourishing state with respect to Christianity. Within twelve years, he was the instrument of most material service in recovering many apostates, in reforming discipline and in reviving the essence of godliness. His example was most fragrant among them for ages. The honours paid to his memory demonstrate it. Certain it is that his diocese, once the scene of Punic greatness, continued long after one of the most precious gardens of Christianity, as I shall have abundant occasion to show in the course of this history, should I be allowed to continue it. But the mischiefs of Origen's taste and spirit in religion were inexpressible. Talents and learning, he who possesses much of them, has more abundant need to learn humility and divine caution. If he does not much benefit mankind by them, he is in danger of prejudicing them much. No man, not altogether unsound and hypocritical, ever more hurt the Church of Christ than Origen. From the fanciful mode of allegory introduced by him, uncontrolled by scriptural rule and order, arose a vitiated method of commenting on the scriptures, which has been succeeded by a contempt of types and figures altogether, just as his fanciful ideas of letter and spirit tended to remove from men's minds all right conceptions of genuine spirituality. A thick mist for ages pervaded the Christian world, supported by his absurd allegorical mode. The learned alone were looked at as guides implicitly to be followed, and the vulgar, when the literal sense was hissed off the stage, had nothing to do but to follow the authority of the learned. It was not till the days of Luther and Melanchthon that this evil was fairly and successfully opposed. If I have carried the parallel to a greater length than the just laws of history allow, the importance of the case is my only apology." Let the whole be considered in connection with two passages of St. Paul. I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, lest your minds be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, and hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16 of the History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Other Particulars of Valerian's Persecution It has been already mentioned that Cyprian heard of the death of Sixtus, Bishop of Rome, a little before his own martyrdom. In pursuance of the cruel orders of Valerian for carrying on the persecution, he had been seized with some of his clergy. While they were carrying him to execution, Laurentius, his chief deacon, followed him weeping and said, Whither goest thou, father, without thy son? Sixtus said, You shall follow me in three days. We may suppose him to have been possessed with the spirit of prophecy in saying this, because we are certain that miraculous gifts were as yet by no means extinct in the church, but perhaps the declaration was not out of the reach of common sagacity from the circumstances of affairs. 
After Sixtus' death, the prefect of Rome, moved by an idle report of the immense riches of the Roman church, sent for Laurentius and ordered him to deliver them up. Laurentius replied, Give me a little time to set everything in order and to take an account of each particular. The prefect granted him three days' time. In that space, Laurentius collected all the poor who were supported by the Roman church, and going to the prefect, said, Come, behold the riches of our God. You shall see a large court full of golden vessels. The prefect followed him, but seeing all the poor people, he turned to Laurentius with looks full of anger. What are you displeased at? said the martyr. The gold you so eagerly desire is but a vile metal taken out of the earth, and serves as an incitement to all sorts of crimes. The true gold is that light whose disciples these poor men are. The misery of their bodies is an advantage to their souls. Sin is the true disease. The great ones of the earth are the truly poor and contemptible. These are the treasures which I promised you, to which I will add precious stones. Behold, these virgins and widows, they are the church's crown. Make use of these riches for the advantage of Rome, of the emperor, and yourself. Doubtless, had the prefect's mind been at all disposed to receive an instructive lesson, he had met with one here. The liberality of Christians in maintaining a great number of objects and looking for no recompense but that which shall take place at the resurrection of the just, while they patiently bore affliction and humbly rested on an unseen Saviour, was perfectly agreeable to the mind of him who bids his disciples in a well-known parable to relieve those who cannot recompense them. How glorious the scene, at a time that the rest of the world was tearing one another in pieces, and philosophers aided not the miseries of men in the least. But as the persecutors would not hear the doctrines explained, so neither would they see the precepts exemplified with patience. Do you mock me? cries the prefect. I know you value yourselves for contemning death, and therefore you shall not die at once. Then he caused him to be stripped, extended, and fastened to a gridiron, and in that manner to be broiled to death by a slow fire. When he had continued a considerable time on one side, he said to the prefect, Let me be turned, I am sufficiently broiled on one side. And when they had turned him, he said, It is enough, you may eat. Then, looking up to heaven, he prayed for the conversion of Rome, and gave up the ghost. I give this story at some length, because it has sufficient marks of credibility, and is supported by the evidence of Augustine. I cannot go on with Fleury in various other stories. He seems ready to believe everything, Gibbon to believe nothing in subjects of martyrology. Whatever judgment they may be possessed of, it remains in both equally unexercised, indiscriminate incredulity being as blind a thing as indiscriminate belief. It is the duty of a reasonable creature to discern and to distinguish. This requires labour and judgment. Fleury's method needs only the former, Gibbon's neither the one nor the other. Where I believe not, I say nothing. Where I believe, I relate and endeavour, as well as I can, neither to impose on my readers nor on myself. The two following stories carry with them every internal mark of credibility. The one illustrates well that scripture, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength, and the other, another scripture, If ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. At Caesarea, in Cappadocia, a child named Cyril showed uncommon fortitude. He called on the name of Jesus Christ continually, nor could threats or blows prevent him from owning Christianity. Many children of his own age persecuted him, and his own father drove him out of his house with the applauses of many for his zeal in the support of paganism. The judge ordered him to be brought before him, and said, My child, I will pardon your faults. Your father shall receive you again. It is in your power to enjoy your father's estate, provided you are wise and take care of your own interest. I rejoice to bear your reproaches, replied the child, God will receive me. I am glad that I am expelled out of your house. I shall have a better mansion. I fear not death, because it will introduce me into a better life. Divine grace having enabled him to witness this good confession, he was ordered to be bound and led, as it were, to execution. The judge had given secret orders to bring him back again, hoping that the sight of the fire might overcome his resolution. Cyril remained inflexible. The humanity of the judge induced him still to continue his remonstrances. Your fire and your sword, says the young martyr, are insignificant. I go to a better house and more excellent riches. Dispatch me presently that I may enjoy them. The spectators wept through compassion. You should rather rejoice, says he, in conducting me to my punishment. You know not what a city I am going to inhabit, nor what is my hope. Thus he went to his death and was the admiration of the whole city. There was at Antioch a presbyter named Sapricius and a layman called Nicephorus. 
who, through some misunderstanding, after a remarkable intimacy, became quite estranged from one another, and would not even salute in the street. Nikephorus, after a time relented, begged for forgiveness of his fault, and took repeated measures to procure a reconciliation, but in vain. He even ran to the house of Sapricius, and, throwing himself at his feet, entreated his forgiveness for the Lord's sake. The presbyter continued obstinate. In this situation of things, the persecution of Valerian reached them suddenly, and Sapricius was carried before the governor, and was ordered to sacrifice on the command of the emperors. "'We Christians,' replied Sapricius, "'acknowledge for our King, Jesus Christ, who is the true God, creator of heaven and earth. Let idols perish who can do neither good nor hurt.' The prefect tormented him a long time, and then ordered him to be beheaded. Nicephorus, hearing of this, runs up to him, as he is leading to execution, and renews in vain the same supplications. The executioners deride his humility as perfect folly, but he perseveres and attends Sapricius to the place of execution. There, he says further, ask and it shall be given you, and soon. But not even the mention of the word of God itself, so suitable to Sapricius's own circumstances, could move his spirit. Sapricius, suddenly forsaken of God, recants and promises to sacrifice. Nicephorus, amazed, exhorts him to the contrary, but in vain. He then speaks to the executioners, I believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he hath renounced. The officers return to give an account to the governor, who ordered Nicephorus to be beheaded. The account ends here, but if Sapricius lived to repent, as I hope he did, he might see what a thing it is for a miserable mortal, whose sufficiency rests entirely on divine grace, to despise, condemn, or exult over his brother. The last became the first, and God showed his people wonderfully by this case, that he will support them in their sufferings for his name, but at the same time will have them to be humble, meek, and forgiving. This is the first instance I have seen of a man attempting to suffer for Christ on philosophical grounds, and it failed. Let Christians and men of self-sufficiency be ever thus kept asunder, and let both their cause and their spirit be preserved distinct and separate. It appears that Christian fortitude is a very different thing from the pride of philosophy or the sullenness of Indians, and cannot even subsist in the absence of Christian meekness and charity. Philosophers and savages can maintain the hardy spirit of nature amidst the highest gratifications of malice and ferocity. The spirit of suffering for Christ, being above nature and wrought in the heart by the grace of Christ, cannot subsist if the spirit of God be provoked to leave the sufferer, and the event of this story shows how little reason infidels have to plume themselves on the hardiness of others who have suffered besides Christians. Their spirit is of a quite different nature." Dionysius of Alexandria, whom divine providence had so remarkably preserved in the Decian persecution, lived to suffer much also in this, but not to death. Eusebius has preserved some extracts of his writings, which not only inform us of this, but also throw some considerable light on the effects of this persecution in Egypt. He was brought before Emilian the prefect, with the presbyter Maximus and three of his deacons, Faustus, Eusebius, and Chiremon, and a certain Roman Christian, Emilian ordered the bishop to recant, observing that his so doing might have a good influence on others. It was answered, We ought to obey God rather than man. I worship God, who alone ought to be worshipped. Hear the clemency of the emperor, says Emilian. You are all pardoned, provided you return to a natural duty, adore the gods who guard the empire, and forsake those things which are contrary to nature. Dionysius answered, All men do not worship all gods, but men worship variously according to their sentiments. But we worship the one God, the maker of all things, who gave the empire to the most clement emperors, Valerian and Galenius, to whom we pour out incessant prayers for their prosperous administration. What can be the meaning, says Emilian? Why, you may not still adore the God of yours, supposing him to be a God, in conjunction with our gods. Dionysius answered, We worship no other God. From this remarkable question of the prefect, it is evident that men might have been tolerated in the worship of Jesus if they had allowed idolaters also to be right in the main by associating idols with the true God. The firmness of Christians in this respect provoked their enemies. The quarrel is the same at this day against real Christians. They must be condemned as bigots because they cannot allow the world to be right in the eyes of God. Emilian banished them to a village near the desert called Sephro and thither Dionysius, though sickly, was constrained to depart immediately. And truly, says Dionysius, we are not absent from the church, meaning, I suppose, his own church at Alexandria, for I still gather such as are in the city, as if I were present, absent indeed in body, but present in spirit, 
and there continued with us in Sephro a great congregation, partly of the brethren which followed us from the city, Alexandria, and partly of them which came from Egypt. And there God opened a door to me to speak his word. Yet at the beginning we suffered persecution and stoning, but at length not a few of the pagans forsook their idols and were converted. For here we had an opportunity to preach the word of God to a people who had never heard before. And as God had brought us among them, after our ministry was there completed, he removed us to another place. I, hearing that Emelian had ordered that we should depart from Sephro, and not knowing the place whither we were to go, yet took my journey cheerfully. Understanding that Coluthio was the place, I felt much distress. It was reported to be destitute of all the comforts of society, infested by thieves and exposed to the tumults of travellers. My companions know well the effect this had on my mind. I proclaim my own share. At first I grieved immoderately. It was a consolation, however, that it was nigh to a city. I was in hopes, from the nearness of the city, that we might enjoy the company of dear brethren, and that particular assemblies for divine worship might be established in the suburbs, which indeed came to pass. Amidst this scantiness of information, and conveyed in no great perspicuity or beauty of style, as far as appears from the slight specimens we have of Dionysius, it appears that the Lord was with him, and made his sufferings to tend to the furtherance of the gospel. His confession of his own heaviness of mind does honour to his ingenuousness, and the strength of Christ was made perfect in his weakness. In another epistle he gives a brief account of the sufferings of others. It deserves to be transcribed as a monument of the greatness and violence of Valerian's persecution. Quote, it may seem superfluous to recite the names of our people, for they were many, and to me unknown. Take this, however, for certain, there were men and women, young men and old men, virgins and old women, soldiers and vulgar persons of all sorts and ages. Some, after stripes and fire, were crowned victors, some after the sword, some others sufficiently tried in a small time were acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. You all heard how I and Caius and Faustus and Peter and Paul, when we were led bound by the centurion and his soldiers, were seized by certain men of Moreato, and drawn away by violence against our wills. And Caius and Peter, alone deprived of the other brethren, were shut up in a desert and dreary part of Libya, distant three days' journey from Peritonium, in the desert and dreary country. End quote. I suppose the rest of the company were rescued by the mob. Afterwards, he says, quote, In the city there hid themselves some who visited the brethren secretly, of the ministers Maximus, Dioscorus, Demetrius, Lucius, for two others of greater note, Faustinus and Aquila, now wander, I know not where, in Egypt, and of the deacons, the rest dying of diseases, there remained alive Faustus, Eusebius, and Cameron. God strengthened and instructed Eusebius from the beginning to minister diligently to the confessors in prison, and to bury the bodies of the holy martyrs, not without great danger. The president to this day ceases not cruelly to slay some that are brought forth, to tear in pieces others by torments, to consume others more slowly by bonds and imprisonments, commanding that none come nigh them, and inquiring daily if any such persons appear. Yet God still refreshes the afflicted with consolation and the attendance of the brethren. End quote. This Eusebius, here honourably mentioned, was some time after Bishop of Laodicea in Syria, and Maximus the Presbyter was successor to Dionysius in Alexandria and Faustus was reserved to the days of Diocletian, again to suffer even to blood. At Caesarea in Palestine three persons were devoured by wild beasts, Priscus, Malchus, and Alexander. These persons led an obscure life in the country, but hearing of the multitude of executions they blamed themselves for their sloth, came to Caesarea, went to the judge, and obtained the object of their ambition. A woman, inclined to the heresy of Marcion, of the same city, suffered likewise. Cyprian of Carthage, and above all our divine master, condemned the too forward zeal of the former, which was yet, it is hoped, not without the real love of his name, and Marcion's heresy might more nominally than really cleave to the latter. After three years employed in persecution, Valerian was taken prisoner by Sapor, king of Persia, who detained him the rest of his life and made use of his neck when he mounted his horse, and at length had him flayed and salted. This event belongs to secular rather than church history. But as it is perfectly well attested, and no one that I know of but Mr. Gibbon ever affected to disbelieve it, it cannot but strike the mind of anyone who fears God. Valerian had known and respected the Christians, 
His persecution must have been a sin against the light, and it is common with divine providence to punish such in a very exemplary manner. The church was restored to rest after Valerian's captivity. About the year 262, Gallienus, his son and successor, in other respects no reputable emperor, proved a sincere friend to the Christians, stopped the persecution by edicts, and had the condescension to give the bishops his letters of license to return to their pastoral charges. Here follows one of them, preserved by Eusebius. Quote, the emperor, Caesar Galenius, to Dionysius, I suppose the bishop of Alexandria, then in exile, Pinna, Demetrius, with the rest of the bishops, the benefit of our favour we command to be published through the world, and I have therefore ordered every one to withdraw from such places as are devoted to religious uses, so that you may make use of the authority of my edict against any molestation, and I have some time since granted what you may now freely enjoy. Wherefore, Cyrenius, the governor of the province, will observe the rescript which I have sent. End quote. He directed also another edict to other bishops, by which he restored to them the places in which they buried their dead. Were it needful at this day to refute the rash calumnies of Tacitus and others against the Christians, one might appeal to these two edicts of Galenius. It is impossible that either of them could have taken place had it not been undeniable that the Christians, even to the time beyond the middle of the third century, were men of probity and worthy of protection of government. As it is impossible to avoid this conclusion, the deepest stain rests on the characters of Trajan, Decius, and Valerian, men highly respected in secular history for treating with savage ferocity subjects of the best characters. But God, who has the hearts of all men in his hand, provided a protector for them in Galenius after an unexampled course of heavy persecution for the three last reigns. Galenius seems himself to have been more like a modern than an ancient sovereign, a man of taste, indolence and philosophy, disposed to cherish everything that looked like knowledge and liberty of thinking, by no means so kind and generous in his constant practice as his profession might seem to promise, the slave of his passions, and led away by every sudden feeling that seized his imagination, yet too philosophical to persecute. And Christians, as a set of new philosophers, found a complete toleration under a prince whose conscience seems to have set him free from the influence of any religion. End of chapter 16. Chapter 17 of The History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From the reign of Galenius to the end of the century. The general history of the Church of Christ for the remaining forty years affords no great quantity of materials. After having collected them into this chapter in order, it may be proper to reserve to a distinct consideration the lives of some particular persons and other matters which belong not to the thread of history. We behold now a new scene, Christians legally tolerated under a pagan government for forty years. The example of Galenius was followed by the successive emperors to the end of the century, violated only in one instance, the effect of which was presently dissipated by the hand of providence. This is not a scene for the growth of grace and holiness. In no time since the Apostle was there ever so great a decay, nor can we show much of any very lively Christianity in all this period. Those are, however, ill-informed in the nature of things who suppose that there was literally no persecution all this time. Christians are never, in the best times, without their share of it, nor is it in the power of the best governments to protect men of godliness from the malice of the world in all cases. We saw an instance of this in the reign of Commodus, see another under the reign of Galenus. At Caesarea in Palestine there was one Marinus, a soldier of great bravery, of noble family and very opulent. The office of centurion being vacant, Marinus was called to it. Another soldier came before the tribunal and said that by the laws Marinus was incapacitated because he was a Christian and did not do sacrifice to the emperors, but that he himself as next in rank ought to have it. Archaeus, the governor, asked Marinus what was his religion, on which he confessed himself a Christian. The governor gave him three hours' space to deliberate. Upon this, Theotechnes, bishop of Caesarea, called Marinus from the tribunal, takes him by the hand and leads him to the church, shows him the sword that hung by his side and a New Testament which he pulled out of his pocket, and bids him choose which of the two he liked best. Marinus, stretching out his right hand, takes up the Holy Scripture. Hold fast, then, said Theotechnes. Cleave to God, and what you have chosen you shall enjoy, being strengthened by him, and depart in peace. 
After he had returned thence, he was, by the crier's voice, ordered to appear again at the bar, the time of three hours being expired. There he manfully confessed the faith of Christ, heard the sentence of condemnation, and was beheaded. Without more acquaintance with the particular institutes of Roman law on this subject, it is not easy to reconcile this proceeding with the Edict of Galenius. Perhaps the act of Achaeus was illegal, or some particular military law might stand against the martyr. The fact, however, rests on the best authority, and the profession of arms had still those among them who loved Jesus since the days of Cornelius. The greatest luminary in the church at this time was Dionysius of Alexandria, his works are lost, but a few extracts of them preserved by Eusebius have been given, and some few more may here be introduced. Speaking of the Sabellian heresy, which had now made its appearance, he says, quote, As many brethren have sent their books and disputations in writing to me concerning the impious doctrine lately sown at Pentapolis in Ptolemaeus, containing many blasphemies against the Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and also much infidelity concerning his only begotten Son, the first begotten of every creature, and the word incarnate, and also senseless ignorance of the Holy Ghost, some of them I have transcribed and sent the copies to you. End quote. This is the first account of the origin of Sabellianism, a plausible corruption no doubt, perhaps the most so of all those which oppose the mystery of the Trinity, but, like all the rest, it fails for want of scripture evidence, and shows itself only to be a weak attempt to lower to human reason what was never meant to be amenable to its tribunal. The careful distinctions of Dionysius in recounting the persons of the Trinity were very proper in speaking of an heresy which confounds the persons, and leaves them nothing of those distinct characters on which the nature of the gospel so much depends. This bishop also delivers his sentiments in the controversy concerning the rebaptizing of heretics against the practice, and he condemns with great severity the novation schism, because, says he, quote, it charges the most loving and merciful God with unmercifulness, end quote. Yet in the former subject he confesses himself staggered, for the present at least, in his opinion, by a certain fact, quote, when the brethren were gathered together, a certain person allowed to be sound in the faith, an ancient minister of the clergy, before my time, being present when some were baptized, and hearing the interrogatories and responses, came to me weeping and wailing, and falling prostrate at my feet, protested that the baptism which he had received, being heretical, could not be the true baptism, and had no agreement with that which was in use among us, being full of impiety and blasphemy. He owned that the distress of his conscience was extreme, that he does not presume to lift up his eyes to God, because he had been baptized with profane words and rites. He begged, therefore, to be baptized, which I does not do, but told him that frequent communion many times administered might suffice him. When he had heard thanksgiving sounded in the church, and sung to it Amen, when he had been present at the Lord's table, and had stretched forth his hand to receive the holy food, and had communicated, and of a long time had been partaker of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, I durst not rebaptize him, but bade him be of good cheer and of a sure faith, and boldly approach to the communion of saints. Notwithstanding all this, the man mourneth continually, his horror keeps him from the Lord's table, and he scarce with much entreaty can join in the prayers of the church. End quote. We have no farther account of this matter. The man was one of those whom there is no reason to believe the God of grace would in due time relieve. The detestation of heresy, and the marked distinction of true Christianity from it, were as yet in some circumstances carried into an extreme. Discipline was hitherto not neglected in the church. On the whole it was, as I have observed, excessive even to superstition. Satan's temptations are ever ready to drive into despair truly penitent and contrite spirits, the whole story breathes a spirit the very antipode to the licentious boldness of our times, and marks the peculiar character of the piety of the age of Dionysius, sincere but mixed with superstition. The celebration of the feast of Easter and of other holy days forms the subject of another of his epistles. It will suffice just to have mentioned this. Dionysius had now returned from exile to Alexandria, and found it involved in the horrors of a civil war. On the feast of Easter as if he was still in banishment, he wrote to his people, who were in another part of the city, with which he could have no intercourse. Writing to Herax, an Egyptian bishop at some distance, he says, quote, It is not to be wondered at that it is difficult for me to converse by epistles with those at a distance, when I find myself here precluded from having any intercourse with my own bowels. I am constrained to write to them, though citizens of the same church, and how my writings may be conveyed to them seems difficult. 
A man may more easily travel from east to west than from Alexandria to Alexandria. The middle road of this city is more impassable than the vast wilderness which the Israelites wandered through in two generations. End quote. He goes on to describe the miseries of war and bloodshed, of plagues and diseases, with which Alexandria at that time abounded, and complains that the people still repented not of their sins. Writing to the brethren, he says, quote, Now everything is full of lamentations. Every one does nothing but mourn and howl through the city because of the multitude of corpses and the daily deaths. Many of our brethren, because of their great love and brotherly charity, sparing not themselves, cleaved one to another, visited the sick without fear or caution, and attended upon them diligently. And in doing these things, they lost their own lives, by catching the infection, and voluntarily transferred the sorrows of others upon themselves. In this manner the best of our brethren departed this life, of whom some were presbyters, some deacons highly reverenced by the common people. End quote. He then goes on to observe with what care and affection the Christians attended the funerals of their friends, while the pagans in the same city, through fear of catching the infection, deserted and neglected theirs. Undoubtedly, he describes here a strong picture of the charity of Christians and of the selfishness of other men. It belongs to the true Christianity to produce such fruits, though in some respects they might be carried farther than real Christian prudence would vindicate. But every lover of Jesus is refreshed to find the certain marks of his spirit and presence among his people. There was one Nepos, an Egyptian bishop, who taught that the millennium was to commence after the resurrection and described the happiness of saints as much consisting in corporeal enjoyments. Dionysius thought the notion dangerous, yet his candor inclined him to entertain a good opinion of Nepos on the whole. He commends his faith, his diligence, his skill in holy scripture, and his agreeable psalmody, with which many of the brethren were delighted. As, however, he thought his opinions dangerous, he opposed them. When he was at Arsenoita, he spent three days with the brethren infected with the views of Nepos, and explained the subjects. He speaks with much commendation of the candor and docility of the people, particularly of Carassian, their leader, who owned himself brought over to the sentiments of Dionysius. The authority of Dionysius seems to have quashed the opinions of Nepos in the bud. The consequence of an injudicious and unscriptural view of the millennium, rejected and refuted by a bishop of candor, judgment, and authority, was that the doctrine itself continued for ages much out of repute. The learned reader need not be told with how much clearer light the doctrine has been revived and confirmed in our days. Dionysius, finding how much use had been made of the revelation of St. John in support of the doctrine of the millennium, gives his thoughts on the book, confessing with much modesty his ignorance of its scope, owning that he did not understand, though he reverenced it. The subtlety and restless spirit of those who corrupted the doctrine of the Trinity have ever had this advantage, that while they, without fear or scruple, could say what they please, its defenders are reduced to the necessity either of leaving the field to them entirely, or of exposing themselves to the specious charge of human inventions, or even of some heresy opposite to that which they are opposing. This last was the case of Dionysius on account of his opposition to Sabellianism. The scantiness of our ideas, and the extreme difficulty of clothing with proper expressions, those very inadequate ones which we have on a subject so profound, naturally expose us to this charge, from which yet the charitable zeal of those who see through the designs of heretics, and who love truth, mixed with some necessary confusion, above error, though it wear the garb of simplicity, will not be disposed to shrink on a proper occasion. Sibelius had taken pains to confound the persons of the father and the son, Dionysius showed, by unequivocal testimony, that the Father was not the same as the Son, nor the Son the same as the Father. Dionysius, Bishop of Rome, being informed of these things, assembled a council in which the doctrine attributed to his namesake of Alexandria was disapproved, and wrote to him with a view to give him an opportunity of explaining himself. The Bishop of Alexandria, with great clearness, candor, and moderation, explained himself at large in a work which he entitled A Refutation and Apology. In the small remains of this work it appears that he held the consubstantiality of the Son with the Father, and he described the Trinity in unity, equally steering clear of the rock of Sabellianism, which confounds the persons, and that of Arianism, which divides the substance. And it appears that his testimony may be added to that of the primitive fathers all along on this subject. Quote, the Father, says he, cannot be separated from the Son as he is the Father. For that name at the same time establishes the relation 
Neither can the Son be separated from the Father, for the word Father implies the union, and the Spirit is in their hands, because it cannot exist without Him who sends it to Him who bears it. Thus we understand the indivisible unity of the Trinity, and we comprehend the Trinity in the unity without any diminution. End quote. This account was satisfactory to the whole church and was allowed to contain the sense of Christians on the doctrine. In the year 264, the heresy of Paul of Samosata began to be famous, and a degeneracy, both in principle and practice, hitherto very uncommon within the pale of Christianity, attracted the notice of all who wished well to the souls of men. Paul was the Bishop of Antioch. It gives one no very high idea of the state of ecclesiastical discipline in that renowned church, that such a man should ever have been placed at its head at all. But it is no new thing for even sincere Christians to be dazzled with the parts and eloquence of corrupt men. The ideas of this man seem to have been perfectly secular, and Zenobia of Pamria, who at that time styled herself Queen of the East, and reigned over a large part of the empire, which had been torn from the indolent hands of Galenus, desired his instructions in Christianity. It does not appear that her motives had anything in them beyond philosophical curiosity. The master and the scholar were well suited to each other, and Paul taught her his own conceptions of Jesus Christ, that he was by nature a common man as we are. The disorders of his life and the heterodoxy of his doctrine could no longer be endured. There is, in fact, more necessary connection between these two than the world is ready to believe, because holiness can only be the effect of Christian truth. The bishops met at Antioch to consider his case, among these particularly, Familian of Caesarea in Cappadocia, Gregory Thaumaturgus, and Athenodorus, who were brethren and bishops in Pontus, and Theoctenes of Caesarea in Palestine. A number of ministers and deacons besides met together on the occasion. In several sessions the case of Paul was argued. Familian seems to have presided, and Paul was induced to recant, and gave such appearances of sincerity that Familian and the council believed him. The matter slept therefore for the present, and Paul continued in his bishopric. It was in this year 264 and the 12th of Galenius that Dionysius of Alexandria died after having held the sea seventeen years. He had been invited to the council, but pleaded in excuse his great age and infirmities. He, however, sent a letter to the council containing his advice, and addressed the church of Antioch without taking any notice of her bishop. This was the last service paid by this great and good man to the Church of Christ, after having gone through a variety of hardships and distinguished himself by his steady piety in the cause of Christ. His having been a pupil of Origen in his younger years was no great advantage to his theological knowledge, but there are in him the strongest marks of unquestionable good sense and moderation, as well as of genuine piety, and it is to be regretted that our materials concerning him are so defective. Galenius, having reigned fifteen years, Claudius succeeded, and after a reign of two years in which he continued the protector of Christians, Aurelian became emperor. Under him a second council was convened, concerning Paul of Samosata. His dissimulation was apparent, and the same intolerable corruption appearing both in his doctrine and in his morals, it behoved the friends of Christ to show that all regard for his person and precepts was not lost in the Christian world. Seventy bishops appeared at the synod, among whom Theoctenes of Caesarea in Palestine was still one of the principal. They waited some time for the arrival of Familian of Cappadocia, who had been invited, and was on his way notwithstanding his great age, but he died at Tarsus in the year 269. He had been one of the greatest luminaries of the age, and so had Gregory Thaumaturgus of Pontus, who died in the interval between the first and second council. It was not in the power of every one who really believed and loved the truth as it is in Jesus to confute and expose in a proper manner the artifices of Paul. Whoever has seen the pains taken at this day by men of Paul's persuasion to cover their ideas under a cloud of ambiguous expressions and to represent themselves when attacked as meaning the same thing with real Christians while at other times they take all possible pains to undermine the very fundamental doctrines of the gospel will not be surprised that Paul artful, eloquent, and deceitful as he was, should be able to give a specious colour to his ideas. But there was one Malchian, a presbyter in the council, who added to the soundness of Christian faith great skill in the art of reasoning, having been a long time governor of the School of Humanity at Antioch. His talents were of service on this occasion, his disputation against Paul was preserved in writing to the time of Eusebius, and he so pressed the ambiguous Paul that he made him to declare himself and show what he really was. There needed no more to condemn him. 
all the bishops agreed to his deposition and exclusion from the Christian church. No fact in church history is more certain than this, and the demonstration is clear from thence that Socinianism in the year 269 was not suffered to exist within the pale of the Christian church. I use that term because it is now well understood, and it fairly expresses the ideas of Paul. In truth, no injury was done to the man. He had certainly no more right to Christian preferment than a traitor has to hold any office in any government, and to oblige him to speak out what he really held was no more than what justice required. Truth and openness are essential to the character of all teachers. He who is void of them deserves to be without scholars or hearers. At the same time, I cannot help seeing that the doctrine, usually called Trinitarian, was universal in the church in these times. Dionysius, Familian, Gregory, Theogdenes, seventy bishops, and the whole Christian world were unanimous in it, and this unanimity may fairly be traced upward to the apostles. Paul being deposed, and a new bishop being chosen in his room, an epistle was written by the council to Dionysius of Rome and Maximus of Alexandria, and sent abroad through the Roman world in which they explained their own labour in this business, the perverse duplicity of Paul and the objections against him. The chief part of this, from Eusebius, will deserve to be transcribed as the fairest account of the business. Quote, to Dionysius and Maximus, and all our fellow bishops and elders and deacons throughout the world, and to the whole universal church, Hellenus, Hymenaeus, Theophilus, Theoctenes, etc., with all the other bishops who with us inhabit the neighbouring cities and preside over the nations, together with the presbyters and deacons and holy churches of God, to the beloved brethren in the Lord, send greeting. We have called many bishops from far to heal this deadly and poisonous doctrine, as Dionysius at Alexandria and Familian at Caesarea in Cappadocia, men blessed in the Lord, one of whom, writing hither to Antioch, vouchsafed not once to salute the author of error, for he wrote not to his person but to the whole congregation, the copy of which we have annexed. But Familian came twice and condemned this strange doctrine. The second time he came as far as Tarsus, but while we assemble, while we summon him and wait for his coming, he departed this life. At the first he was poor and had no inheritance derived from his parents or acquired by any regular profession, yet is the man grown excessively rich by sacrilege, extortion and iniquity. He deceived the brethren by his pretended patronage, imposed on their easiness, obliged them to make him presents to be delivered from him, and thus he turned godliness into gain. He was full of vanity and fond of secular dignities, and would rather be called Ducenarius, footnote, an officer of the revenue, he probably held this office under Zenobia, in footnote, than bishop. He has been used to walk in a pompous manner through the streets, reading letters and indicting publicly, maintaining about him a great troop to guard his person, and much scandal has accrued to the faith from his conduct. In church assemblies he used theatrical artifices to strike the imagination and procure applause to himself by surprising the simple. He constructed for himself a tribunal and throne set on high, not as became a disciple of Jesus Christ, and he had a private closet like the secular magistrates, to which he gave the same name. When he harangued the people, he struck his hand upon his thigh and his feet upon his tribunal. If any did not applaud him, as is usual in the theatre, by clapping their hands and shaking their handkerchiefs, who did not cry out and rise up the usual custom of his partisans, he expressed his displeasure, reproving and reviling those who, sensible that they were in the house of God, behaved with decency and sobriety. The deceased expositors of holy scripture he openly inveighed against, like a sophist and impostor extolling himself. The hymns made in honour of Jesus Christ he suppressed, as the compositions of modern authors, and ordered others to be sung by women in his own praise in the church on Easter day, which caused horror in the hearers, and he encouraged, as far as in him lay, similar practices in the neighbouring bishops. He refused to acknowledge the Son of God to have come down from heaven. Nor shall this be barely asserted, but proved out of the commentaries published by us to the world, especially where he saith that Christ Jesus is of the earth. Yet his admirers affirm him to be an angel come down from heaven, to which flatteries he gives all possible encouragement. He has women, his private associates, as they are called in Antioch. His priests and deacons have the same. Their crimes have been proved, but he conceals them and prevents them from accusing himself. He even enriches them to engage them the more strongly to his interests. We know, dear brethren, that the bishop and all the clergy ought to give the people an example of all good works, and we are not ignorant how many have fallen by indulging this evil custom of keeping private women, and many again are subject to suspicion and slander. 
admitting therefore that he hath committed no actual crime, he ought at least to be afraid of the suspicion arising from such a conduct, for fear of giving offence or a bad example to any. For how can he reprove another, or warn him not to converse with a woman for fear of stumbling, as it is written, He who hath already divorced one woman, and keeps two with him, both handsome and in the flower of their age, and whom he carries about wherever he goes, at the same time living in a delicate and luxurious manner. All sigh for these things in secret indignation, but tremble at his power, and dare not accuse him. Severe censures would doubtless be due to him, were he our dearest friend, and perfectly orthodox in his sentiments, but he who hath renounced Christian mysteries lies out of the reach of our censures. Necessity constraining us, we have expelled from the church the adversary of God, and placed in his room Domnus, a man adorned with all gifts required by a bishop, son of Demetrian of worthy memory, the predecessor of Paul. End quote. It is fashionable at present to despise all religious counsels whatever, I suppose because it is fashionable to despise religion, for on all subjects which are esteemed of moment, common sense hath ever dictated to mankind to hold counsels, and politics, agriculture, and the fine arts have their counsels continually. Not to be carried away by the torrent of the times, I think, to be an historian's duty. Men who follow fashion will gain the reputation of being sensible and judicious, without either learning, industry, or reflection. This makes the temptation so strong. I shall venture, however, to affirm that all religious councils are not foolish, because many have been so. That at Jerusalem was worth more than all the wealth and power of the Roman Empire. In this way, also, we have seen Cyprian to have served the church substantially, though in one instance he failed, and the council which dictated the letter concerning Paul will deserve, under God, the thanks of the Church of Christ to the end of the world. Circumstanced as Paul was, superior in artifice, eloquence, and capacity, supported by civil power, and uncontrolled in his own diocese, nothing seemed so likely to weaken his influence and encourage the true disciples of Christ as the concurrent testimony of the Christian world assembled against him and though it may be difficult for the softness of sceptical politeness to relish the blunt tone of the council, there seem to me evident marks of the fear of God, Christian gravity, and conscientious regard to the truth in their proceedings. Common, no doubt, must rumours have been of Paul's actual lewdness in Antioch, but for want of specific proof the council check themselves and assert no more than what they know. True, they did no more than they ought, but had they been overheated with malice they would have exaggerated, it is grievous to see this first instance of a Christian bishop so shamefully secular, and that on the most authentic evidence. But it is pleasant to see so many showing a becoming zeal for truth and holiness. Dionysius of Rome died also this year. His successor Felix wrote an epistle to Maximus of Alexandria in which he speaks thus, probably on account of Paul's heresy. Quote, we believe that our Saviour Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary, we believe that he himself is the eternal God and the Word, and not a man whom God hath taken into himself, so as that man should be distinct from him. For the Son of God, being perfect God, was also made perfect man, for being incarnate of the Virgin. End quote. For two or three years Paul supported himself in the possession of the mother church of Antioch, and of the Episcopal house, and of course of so much of the revenues as depended not on voluntary contributions of the people by the favour of Zenobia a party which he doubtless had among the people, but the horror which Socinianism, then at least, excited through the Christian world as well as the flagitiousness of his life, rendered it impossible that he should have had the hearts of the Christians at Antioch at large, and Zenobia being conquered by the Emperor Aurelian, a change took place, the Christians complained, Aurelian, looking on Rome and Italy as in all things a guide to the rest of the world, ordered that the controversy should be decided according to the sentiments of their bishops. Of course, Paul was fully expelled, and we hear no more of him in history. Aurelian hitherto had been the friend of Christians, but pagan superstition and its abettors drove him at length into measures of persecution. The Christians were in full expectation of sanguinary treatment when his death prevented his designs in the year 275. Tacitus, the successor of Aurelian after a short reign, left the empire to Probus, in whose second year, A.D. 277, appeared the monstrous heresy of Manes, whose fundamental principle was to account for the origin of evil by the admission of two first causes independent of each other. But I write not a history of heresies. It has been performed but too accurately by many, while we have very scanty information of the progress of true religion. 
this heresy continued long to infest the church, and necessity will oblige me hereafter, if this work be continued, to notice it more distinctly. Eusebius gives us here the names and characters of several bishops, who successively held several sees. He speaks highly of the learning and philosophy of some, and of the moral good qualities of others. Of Pamphilius, a minister in Caesarea of Palestine, he speaks with all the ardour of affection, but the best thing he asserts of him is that he suffered much in persecution, and was martyred at last. But this must have been in Diocletian's persecution, the time of which begins just after the limits prescribed to this volume. After Probus, Carus, and his two sons, Diocletian began to reign in year 284. For about eighteen years this emperor was extremely indulgent to the Christians. His wife Prisca and daughter Valeria were Christians in some sense secretly, the eunuch of his palace and his most important officers were Christians, and with their wives and families openly professed the gospel. Christians held honourable offices in various parts of the empire, innumerable crowds attended Christian worship, the old buildings could no longer receive them, and in all cities wide and large edifices were erected. If Christ's kingdom had been of this world, and its strength and beauty were to be measured by secular prosperity, we should here fix the era of its greatness." but, on the contrary, the era of its decline must be dated during the Pacific time of Diocletian. During this whole century, the work of God in purity and power had been declining. The connection with philosophers had been one of the principal causes. Outward peace and secular advantages now completed the corruption. Discipline, which had been too strict, was now relaxed exceedingly. Bishops and people were in a state of malice, and quarrels without end were fermented one among another and ambition and covetousness had now the ascendancy pretty generally in the Christian church. Some there doubtless were who mourned in secret and strove in vain to stop the abounding torrent of evil. The truth of this account seems much confirmed by the extreme dearth of real Christian excellencies from the death of Dionysius. None seem, for the space of thirty years, to have risen in the room of Cyprian, Familian, Gregory, and Dionysius. No bishop or pastor of eminence for piety, zeal, and labours appeared, Christian worship was yet constantly attended to, the number of nominal converts was increasing, but the faith of Christ itself appeared now an ordinary business, and here ended, as far as appears, that great first outpouring of the Spirit of God, which began at the day of Pentecost. Human depravity spread a general decay of godliness through the church, and one generation of men elapsed with hardly any proofs of the spiritual presence of Christ with his church. The observation of Eusebius, who honestly confesses this declension, is judicious. Quote, the heavy hand of God's judgments began softly, little by little, to visit us after this wanted manner, so that the persecution which was raised against us took its first rise from the Christians who were in military service. But we were not at all moved with his hand, nor took any pains to return to God, but heaped sin upon sin, thinking like careless Epicureans that God cared not for, nor would ever visit us for our sins and our pretended shepherds, laying aside the rule of godliness, practised among themselves contention and division. End quote. He goes on to observe that the dreadful persecution of Diocletian was then inflicted on the church as a just punishment and the most proper chastisement for their iniquities. Toward the end of the century, Diocletian practising the superstitious rites of divination and understanding or guessing from the ill success of his sacrifices, that the present of a Christian servant who made on his forehead the sign of the cross was the cause, ordered not only those who were present but all in his palace to sacrifice, or in case of refusal to be scourged with whips. He wrote also to the officers of his armies to constrain all the soldiers to sacrifice or to discharge the disobedient from the service. This is what Eusebius alludes to in the foregoing passage, and many resigned rather than sacrifice. For Christian truth was not yet lost, nor was the decay universal. Very few were put to death on this account. The story of Marcellus is remarkable. Mr. Gibbon has undertaken to justify his death, representing him as punished purely for desertion and military disobedience, in his usual manner suppressing or disguising facts. But the truth is, his death was the effect of a partial persecution, and his conscience was not burdened merely with being a soldier. It was no uncommon thing for Christians to serve in the armies at that time, but with the introduction of new rules subversive of Christianity. For those who ordered Christian soldiers to sacrifice knew that in fact they ordered them to renounce Christianity. It was in the year 298 at Tangier in Mauritiana, while everyone was employed in feasting and sacrifices, that Marcellus the centurion took off his belt, threw down his vine branch and his arms, and added, quote, 
I will not fight any longer under the banner of your emperor, or serve your gods of wood and stone. If the condition of a soldier is such that he is obliged to sacrifice to gods and emperors, I abandon the vine branch and the belt and quit the service. End quote. Quote, we plainly see the cause, says Fleury, that forced the Christians to desert, they being obliged to partake in idolatrous worship. End quote. The man was ordered to be beheaded, and one Cassianus, the register, who was to take down the sentence, cried out aloud that he was shocked at its injustice. Marcellus smiled for joy, foreseeing that Cassianus would be his fellow martyr, as in fact he was martyred also a month after. When I read this story toward the conclusion of Gibbon's first volume, I thought by his narrative that Marcellus had suffered on principles of modern Quakerism. I might have added this also to the list of his perversions, had it then attracted my attention. I need add no further remarks. Every reader who pays the least attention to candour and common sense sees the principles for which Marcellus suffered. It seems these preliminaries to the persecution, with which the next century opens, did not affect the minds of Christians in general, nor was the spirit of prayer stirred up among them, a certain sign of long and obstinate decay in godliness. Yet there must have been a deep, secret departure from the lively faith of the gospel. Originism and the learning and philosophy connected with it were extremely fashionable. We may justly conclude, then, that the sermons of Christian pastors had more in general of a moral and philosophical cast than anything purely Christian. In truth, justification by faith and hearty conviction of sin and the Spirit's influences, I hear little or nothing of all this season. Morals, I doubt not, were preached, but Christian men continued in life immoral and scandalous. The state of the Church of England from Charles the Second down to the middle of the last reign, full of party and faction and animosities and love of the world, yet adorned with learning and full of morality in its public ministrations, seems very much to resemble that of the Christian Church in manners and piety from the death of Dionysius to the end of the century. In one instance there was a great difference— Superstition was much stronger in the ancient church, but being enlisted in the service of self-righteousness and the faith of Christ and the love of God being much buried under it, this diversity does not affect the general likeness. God, who had exercised long patience, declared at length in the course of his providence, Because I have purged thee, and thou wast not purged, thou shalt not be purged from thy filthiness any more, till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. But this scene, which introduced quite a new face on the church, and was quickly followed by several surprising revolutions, belongs to the next century. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of The History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some account of Gregory Thaumaturgus, Theognostus, and Dionysius of Rome. These three persons are all whom I can find belonging to the third century, to whom sufficient justice has not been done already. Of the two last, indeed, I have scarce anything to say. Of the first, more is recorded. His life was written by Gregory of Nyssen, and though some allowance must be made for the growth of superstitious credulity in his days, yet that all the miraculous powers ascribed to Gregory are fictitious, it would be unreasonable to assert. The concurrent testimony of antiquity and the very name of Thaumaturgus, footnote, wonder worker, end footnote, evince the contrary. I shall endeavour to steer as clear of errors on both sides as I can in putting down everything that may seem valuable concerning this great man. A small account of him is in Eusebius. Cave and Fleury have also collected the most material things of him from Gregory Nissen's narrative, and from the former I shall chiefly collect the account. He was born at Neo-Caesarea, the metropolis of Cappadocia. His father, zealous for paganism, took care to educate him in idolatry and the learning of the Gentile world. He lost his father when he was fourteen years of age. His mother took care to complete his education and that of his brother, Athenodorus, afterwards a Christian bishop, as well as himself. He travelled to Alexandria to learn the Platonic philosophy, where he was equally remarkable for strictness of life and close attention to his studies. He afterwards put himself under the tuition of the renowned Origen, who then taught at Caesarea in Palestine, with his brother Athenodorus and Familian, a Cappadocian gentleman, with whom he contracted an intimate friendship. This is the Cappadocian bishop, whom we have repeatedly had occasion to mention. 
With Origen, the two brothers continued five years and were persuaded by him to study the Holy Scriptures, and no doubt is to be made, but that the most assiduous pains were urged by that zealous teacher to ground them in the belief of Christianity. On his departure, he delivered an eloquent speech in praise of Origen before a numerous auditory, a testimony at once of his gratitude and powers of rhetoric. There is still extant a letter written by Origen to him after he had left him, in which he exhorts him to apply his knowledge to the promotion of Christianity. The best thing in it is that he advises him to pray fervently and seriously for the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Being now returned to Neo-Caesarea, he gave himself much to prayer and retirement, and no doubt was in secret, prepared and disciplined for the important work to which he was soon after called. Neo-Caesarea was large and populous, but full of idolatry, the very seat of Satan, so that Christianity scarce could gain any entrance into it. Phaedimus, bishop of Amasi, a neighbouring city, grieved to see its situation, and hoping much from the piety and capacity of young Gregory, took pains to engage him in the work of the ministry there. Gregory, from pure modesty, took pains to elude his designs, but was at length prevailed on to accept the charge. The scene was arduous. He had a church to found before he could govern it, there being not above seventeen professors of Christianity there. I do not believe the vision which his namesake of Nissen tells of his receiving a creed from John the Evangelist and the Virgin Mary. He seems to have been imposed on by the superstitious spirit then too prevalent, but, as he assures us, the original, written with his own hand, was preserved in the church of Neo-Caesarea in his time, and this is a matter of fact of which any person might judge, as the creed itself contains nothing but what is very agreeable to the language of the fathers of the third century, and we have already seen the exact pains which they took in guarding the doctrine of the Trinity against heresies, I apprehend it to be really his, though when the reader has considered it, he will not be surprised at the industry with which in our times its credit has been impeached. And the whole will deserve to be set down at length, because the orthodoxy of Gregory has been unreasonably called in question against the express testimony of Eusebius, who, we have seen above, represents him as one of the opposers of Paul of Samosata at the First Council. Quote, there is one God, the Father of the living word, of the subsisting wisdom and power, and of the eternal express image, perfect, the Father of the perfect, the Father of the only begotten Son, one Lord alone of alone, God of God, the character and image of the deity, the energetic word, the wisdom comprehensive of the system of the universe, and the power that made all creation, the true Son of the true Father, the invisible of the invisible, the incorruptible of the incorruptible, the immortal of the immortal, the eternal of the eternal, and one Holy Ghost, having his subsistence of God, manifested through the Son to men, the image of the Son, the perfect life of the perfect, the source of life, the holy fountain, sanctification, and the supplier of sanctification, in whom is manifested God the Father, who is above all and in all, and God the Son, who is through all, a perfect trinity, in glory, eternity, and kingdom, not separated, not divided. End quote. Notwithstanding the prejudices which his idolatrous countrymen must have had against him, Musonius, a person of consequence in the city, received him, and in a very little time his preaching was attended with so great success that he had a numerous congregation. The situation of Gregory, so like that of the primitive Christian preachers in the midst of idolatry, renders it exceedingly probable that he was, as they were, favoured with miraculous gifts. For these the Lord bestowed in abundance where the name of Jesus had as yet gained no admission, and it is certain that miracles had not ceased in the church. Gregory Nissen lived himself within less than a hundred years after our Gregory, and both he and his brother, the famous Basil, speak of his miracles without the least doubt. Their aged grandmother, Macrina, who taught them in their youth, had in her younger years been a hearer of Gregory. Basil particularly observes that she told them the very words which she had heard from him, and assures us that the Gentiles, on account of the miracles which he performed, used to call him a second Moses. The existence of his miraculous powers, with reasonable persons, seems then unquestionable. It is only to be regretted that the few particular instances which have come down to us are not the best chosen, but that he cured the sick, healed the diseased, and expelled devils, and that thus God wrought by him for the good of souls, and to pave the way for the propagation of the gospel, as it is in itself very credible, so has it the testimony of men worthy to be believed. Gregory continued successfully employed at Neo-Caesarea till the persecution of Decius. 
swords and axes, fire, wild beasts, stakes and engines to distend limbs, iron chairs made red-hot, frames of timber set up straight in which the bodies of the tortured were racked with nails that tore off the flesh. These and a variety of other inventions were used. But the Decian persecution in general was before described. Pontus and Cappadocia seemed to have had their full share. Relations, in the most unnatural manner, betrayed one another. The woods were full of vagabonds, and the towns were empty, and private houses, deprived of their Christian inhabitants, became jails for the reception of prisoners, the public prisons not sufficing for that purpose. In this terrible situation of things, Gregory, considering that his new converts could scarce be strong enough to stand their ground and be faithful, advised them to flee, and to encourage them in it he set them the example. Many of his people suffered, but God restored them at length to peace, and Gregory again returned to exhilarate their minds with his pastoral labours. In the reign of Galenius, the Christians suffered extremely from the ravages of barbarous nations, which gave occasion to Gregory's canonical epistle, still extant, in which rules of a wholesome, penitential, and disciplinarian nature are delivered, but there is no need to particularise them. The last service of his which is recorded is the part which he took in the first council concerning Paul of Samosata. He died not long after. A little before his death he made a strict inquiry whether there were any in the city and neighbourhood still strangers to Christianity, and being there told there were about seventeen in all, he sighed and, lifting up his eyes to heaven, appealed to God how much it troubled him that any of his fellow townsmen should remain unacquainted with salvation, yet that his thankfulness was due to God, that when at first he had found only seventeen Christians, he had left only seventeen idolaters. Having prayed for the conversion of infidels and the edification of the faithful, he peaceably gave up his soul to God. He was an evangelical man in his whole life, as Basil says. In his devotion he showed the greatest reverence. Yea and nay were the usual measures of his communication. How desirable that those who professed to love Jesus uniformly practiced the same. He never allowed himself to call his brother a fool. No anger or bitterness proceeded out of his mouth. Slander and calumny, as directly opposite to Christianity, he peculiarly hated and avoided. Lies and falsehood, envy and pride, he abhorred. Zealous he was against all corruptions, and Sabellianism, which long after in Basil's time reared up its head, was, he tells us, silenced by the remembrance of what he had taught and left among them. On the whole, the reader will with me regret that antiquity has left us such scanty memorials of a man so much honoured of God, so eminently holy and little inferior in utility among mankind to any from the Apostles' days to his own times. For it is not to be conceived that so great and almost universal a change in the religious profession of the citizens of Neo-Caesarea could have taken place without a marvellous outpouring of the Holy Spirit in that place. And how instructive and edifying would the narrative have been, were we distinctly informed of its rise and progress. Certainly the essentials of the gospel must have been preached in much clearness and purity. In no particular instance was the divine influence ever more apparent since the apostolic age. Theognostus of Alexandria is an author whose time it is not easy to fix with precision, though it must be certain that he is later than Origen and must belong to the third century. He platonizes after the manner of Origen in some parts of his writings, yet is he cited by Athanasius as a witness of the Son's consubstantiality with the Father. Quote, For as the Son is not diminished, says he, though it produces rays continually, so likewise the Father is not diminished in begetting the Son, who is his image. End quote. It is certain that this is Trinitarian language, and though neither Theognostus nor Gregory, nor some others of the ancient fathers spake always of the persons of the blessed trinity with so much exactness as afterwards was done, it would be an extreme want of candour to rank them with Arians, Sabellians, or the like, when there is clear proof that the foundation of their doctrine was really trinitarian. It cannot be expected that men should speak always with the same care on a point before there be an urgent call for it, as afterwards when contrary heresies were formed. The want of attending to this just distinction has nursed several unreasonable cavils in those who eagerly catch at every straw to support heretical notions. Nothing is known of the life of this man, of his eloquence and capacity. The proofs are clear and strong. The injustice of the attempts made to invalidate the proofs of the antiquity and uninterrupted preservation of the doctrine of the Trinity within the three first centuries requires me to mention one instance more, which added to the many already mentioned, will, I think, authorize me to draw this conclusion that, during the first three hundred years, 
though the doctrine of the Trinity in unity was variously opposed, yet the whole Christian Church, constantly united in preserving and maintaining it, even from the Apostles' days, as the proper sphere within which all the truth and holiness and consolation of genuine Christianity lies, and exclusive of which one may defy its boldest enemies to produce a single instance of any real progress in piety, made in any place where the name of Christ was known. We have before observed that Dionysius of Alexandria, for his zeal against Sabellianism, was suspected of Arianism, and that he fully exculpated himself. A Roman synod had been convened on the account, and Dionysius of Rome, in the name of the synod, wrote a letter in which he proves that the word was not created, but begotten of the Father from all eternity, and distinctly explains the mystery of the Trinity. Such extreme nicety of caution in steering clear of two rocks, like those of Sabellianism and Arianism, in which it must be confessed the road is very narrow and very straight, demonstrates that the exact doctrine of the Trinity in unity, with which so much clearness as to the thing, though necessarily with perfect obscurity as to the manner of the thing, discovers itself everywhere in the Scriptures, was even then understood with precision and maintained with firmness throughout the Church of Christ. End of chapter 18chapter 19 of the history of the church of christ century 3 by joseph milner this librivox recording is in the public domain the further extension of the gospel in this century it would fall exactly within the design of this work to explain this at large the power of real christianity is always the strongest and the clearest in the infancy of things Exactly contrary to the process in secular arts and sciences, the improvements of following ages are so many deprivations. But we must be content with such materials as we have, and let the reader supply from his own meditations, as much as he can, whatever he may think defective in the following scanty account. In the reign of Decius, and in the middle of his persecution, about the year 250, the gospel, which had hitherto been chiefly confined to the neighbourhood of Lyon and Vienne, was considerably extended in France. Saturninus was the first bishop of Toulouse, and at the same time several other churches were founded, as at Tours, Arles, Nabon, and Paris. The bishops of Toulouse and Paris afterwards suffered for the faith of Christ, but they left churches, in all probability, very flourishing in piety. And France in general was blessed with the light of salvation. Germany was also, in the course of this century, favoured with the same blessing, especially those parts of it which are in the neighbourhood of France. Cologne, Treves, and Metz particularly were evangelised. Of the British Isles little is recorded, and that little so obscure and uncertain that we rather believe that the divine light must have penetrated into our own country by this time, from the natural course of things and analogy, than from any positive, unexceptionable testimony. The Goths being settled in Thrace during the miserable confusions of this century, some teachers from Asia went to preach the gospel among them. Their holy lives and miraculous powers were much respected by those barbarians, and many of them, from a state perfectly savage, were brought into the light and comfort of Christianity. The goodness of God made the temporal miseries which afflicted mankind in the reign of Galenus, subservient to the unspeakably more important concerns of his creatures. The barbarians who ravaged Asia carried away with them into captivity several bishops who healed diseases, expelled evil spirits in the name of Christ, and preached Christianity. The barbarians heard with respect and attention, and numbers of them were converted. This is all that I can collect of the extension of the gospel among the barbarian ravagers. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of the History of the Church of Christ, Century 3, by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A short view of the external state of the Church in the 3rd century. It is the duty of Christians to shine as lights in the world in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. That this was actually the case even in the 3rd century, though much less so than in the two former, and with very rapid diminution of its glory toward the latter end of it, the course of the foregoing narrative has, I trust, made apparent. Those with whom the idea of the state of the rest of mankind is familiar will see this in the strongest light. For three centuries, luxury and every abominable vice that can be conceived had been increasing in the Roman Empire. 
there want not lamentable proofs that the severe satires of Juvenal were but too well founded. All flesh had corrupted their way. With the loss of civil liberty, even the old Roman virtues of public spirit and magnanimity, though no better than splendid sins in their nature, as Augustine says, had vanished. Civil broils and distractions continually prevailed for the greatest part of this time, and increased the quantity of vice and misery. The best time was doubtless during the reigns of Trajan, Adrian, and the Antonines. But what was the virtue of those times? Even the most scandalous and unnatural vices were practised without remorse. Men of rank either lived atheistically or were sunk in the deepest superstition. The vulgar were perfectly ignorant, the rich domineered over the poor and wallowed in immense opulence, while the provinces groaned under their tyranny. Philosophers prated about virtue, without either understanding or practising it, and by far the largest part of mankind, the slaves and the poor, were in remediless indigence, and no methods at all were studied for their convenience or relief. In the meantime, the pleasures of men, the stage and the amphitheatre, were full of obscenity, savageness and cruelty. This was the Roman world, we know much less of the rest of the globe. It was, however, sunk in ferocious wickedness and ignorance, much below those nations that bowed under the yoke of the Caesars. Behold, in the midst of all this chaos arose out of Judea a light of doctrine and practice singularly distinct from the whole of it. A number of persons chiefly of low life, the disciples of Jesus of Nazareth, live as men ought to do, with a proper contempt of this vain life, with the sincerest and most steady ambition for another. True philosophers, if real love of wisdom consist, as it must, in the justest views and worship of their Maker, and an actual acquaintance with Him in real moderation of their passions and desires, and in unfeigned benevolence to all, even to their enemies. How is it possible that all this could be of man? It was the work of God. This outpouring of his Holy Spirit lasted for three centuries, debased indeed towards the end of that period, but not extinguished. This people, diverse from all others, must have a government and an external order among themselves. I am not going to involve myself in the endless mazes of controversy on this point, nor do I see any certain divine rule on the subject. It might, and it naturally would be, various in various places. Men may serve God acceptably under very different modes, yet I think I see some rude outlines of what most commonly obtained in the primitive ages, whence a sketch may be drawn extremely different from the most, if not from all the modes which now prevail in the Christian world. The first teachers, the apostles, who planted the first churches, ordained successors, as far as appears, without any consultation of the people. It was not to be expected that any set of persons after them should be regarded as their equals, nor was it reasonable that it should be so. Undoubtedly the choice of bishops devolved on the people. Their appearance to vote on these occasions, their sometimes forcing of persons to accept the office against their will, and the determination of Pope Leo long after, against forcing a bishop on a people against their consent, demonstrate this. The persons to be elected to this office were very strictly examined. Public notice was given that any one might inform against them if they were vicious and immoral. The judgment of life was left to the people, that of doctrine belonged more to the other bishops who ordained them. For the power of ordination belonged properly to bishops alone, though presbyters, a second order of men who seemed to me distinct all along from them, concurred with them and with the people. The same power of electing in some degree, and in some instances, the people had with respect to these presbyters, but the case is by no means so uniformly clear, and in the lower offices of the church the bishop acted still more according to his discretion. The use of deacons, the third order in the church, is well known. These three obtained very early in the primitive churches. The epistles of Ignatius, I build only on those parts that are undoubtedly genuine, demonstrate this, and in general the distinction of these offices was admitted through the Christian world. Yet if a Christian people were grown very heretical, the bishops thought themselves bound in duty to provide for the instruction of the smaller number, who, in their judgment, loved the truth, as it is in Jesus, by both electing and ordaining a bishop for them. Likewise, in sending missionaries to the barbarous nations, it would be absurd to suppose that they waited for the choice of the people, they deputed and ordained, whom they approved of, for that end. There were a number of lower officers, doorkeepers, subdeacons, acolyths, or attendants, readers, who by degrees grew up in the Christian church. These appear in the third century. 
a much more candid and true account of them may be given than what has been imposed on us with sufficient malignity. It could not be to administer to the pride and sloth of the higher clergy that these offices were instituted. Christians increased in number, and more laborers were required. Besides, as they had not then any seminaries, the serving of the church in these lower offices, I have the pleasure to see the judicious Calvin unite with Bingham in his sentiments here, was made an introductory step to the higher offices. And this was their most important use. The authority of the bishop was by no means unlimited, but it was very great. Nothing could be done in the church without him. The extent of his diocese was called parukia. Some of these dioceses had a greater, others a less number of churches which belonged to them. The diocese of Rome had above forty churches before the end of the third century, as Opatus observes, and this agrees very well with the account before stated that under Cornelius the bishop there were forty-six priests. Cornelius himself must have ministered particularly at the chief or mother church. Unpreaching prelates were then unknown. The priests, of course, must have supplied among them the service of the other churches, but in these times distinct parishes, with presbyters allotted to them, were not known in cities. It appears that the bishop sent them successively to minister according to his discretion, but the neighbouring villages which were annexed to bishoprics could not be thus supplied. They had even then stated parish priests who acted under the authority of the bishop. That bishops were not mere congregational pastors seems evident from the nature of things as well as the concurrent testimony of all antiquity. There were seven bishops who belonged to the seven churches of Asia called angels in the book of Revelations. It is absurd to suppose that the great church of Ephesus, in the decline of St. John's life, should be only a single congregation, and most probably the same is true of all the rest. Supposing the Christian brethren to consist of five hundred men, they, their families and servants and occasional hearers, would make an assembly large enough for any human voice. But the Christians of Ephesus consisted of many thousands, more probably. So did the Church of Jerusalem. The Church of Antioch in Chrysostom's time consisted of an hundred thousand. I should not wonder if it had half that number in the latter end of the third century. Yet it is certain that dioceses were much smaller than in after times. The vast extension of them proved very inconvenient to the cause of godliness. Archbishop Cranmer wished to correct this evil in our national church, and wanted neither zeal nor judgment, but that and many other good things slept with the English reformers. The choice of bishops, and in part at least of presbyters by the people, is a custom which seems naturally to have grown out of the circumstances of the church at that time. The first bishops and presbyters were appointed by the apostles themselves, nor could I ever find the least vestige in scripture of their appointment by the people. There was not a sufficient judgment in any for this trust, the world being at that time pagan or Jewish, or at least infant in Christianity. Apostolical wisdom and authority under God supplied the want in the next succession of bishops. As the judgment of the people matured, and especially as the grace of God was strong among them, they were rendered more fit for the appointment. A precedent was set, not scriptural indeed, but of very high antiquity, and the practice continued during at least the first three centuries. On the other hand, I do not find that the people had any power in deposing a bishop, if we may judge from the well-authenticated case of Paul of Samosata. The cognizance of the crimes of bishops was left to a council or synod of neighbouring bishops and presbyters, and in that, as well as all material affairs which concern the church in general, the authority of such councils was held very great from early times, nor does it appear that the Christian laity had any direction in them. I have given this brief sketch of primitive ecclesiastical government as it appears to me. I mean neither to provoke nor invite any controversy on this contentious subject, but only to give a general view of the first government of Christian people. I wonder not at the controversies which have been started on the subject. Something may be said for episcopacy, for presbytery, for independency. To me it seems an unhappy prejudice to look on any one of the forms as of divine right and scriptural authority. Circumstances will make different modes more proper in one place and at one time than at another. If the reader sees the subject in the light in which it appears to me, he will be in no danger of bigotry, but will see much reason for moderation and latitudinarian indifference. And I would it were so with all Christians that our zeal might be employed and spent on what is really divine and essentially scriptural. 
so balanced are the arguments for the three forms of church government that the independent plan seems to me to have no general foundation either in scripture or antiquity in any one instance the presbyterian to be scriptural and primitive so far as the institution of the clergy is concerned but defective for want of a bishop the episcopal form to have obtained in all the primitive churches without exception only what effectually checks the pride of those who are fond of the pomp of hierarchy ancient episcopacy had no secular mixtures and appendages the pastoral character of bishops together with the smallness of their dioceses always adapted to pastoral inspection made them more similar to the presbyterian hierarchy in fine the share of the people in christian government though never on the plan of independent congregations gives yet some plausible colour to independency the discipline of the primitive church was very strict it even degenerated as has been observed into excessive severity a clergyman once deposed for flagitiousness was never restored to his order this might be right another custom which prevailed at length cannot be vindicated a person once ejected for his vices from the church might be restored on a relapse being again ejected he could never be favoured with church communion though by no means supposed to be necessarily excluded from the mercy of god in christ their care against heresies has been abundantly shown and their zeal against viciousness of practice was equal to this though it was carried to too great a length and was mixed with superstition yet how beautiful does it appear how demonstrative of the power and reality of godliness among them in comparison of the licentiousness of our times christian assemblies were then frequented with great constancy and the eucharist was generally administered whenever they met for public worship but greater proofs even than these of their superior regard to god and everything that is really good remain yet to be mentioned their liberality to the indigent was wonderful there was nothing like it at that time in the world the jews were a very selfish hard-hearted people the gentiles lived in luxury and splendour if they could but care for the poor seems to have made no part of their jurisprudence nor to have been at all a fashionable virtue i never could learn that philosophers while they have harangued on virtue either recommend much or practised any kindness to the bulk of mankind the slaves and the vulgar indeed their own precepts are directed to the higher ranks and they seem to forget that these were of the human species an hospital an almshouse or any provision of that kind for the poor was unknown in the pagan and philosophic world but when the religion of him who is no respecter of persons began to prevail the barbarous spirit of aristocracy lost its dominion among christians while it still prevailed in the manners of the rest of mankind Christians felt themselves all sinners, all in the sight of God on a level, necessitated to keep up and preserve still a due subordination of ranks, and whatever is wholesome in government, the Christian master found his slave before God, his equal redeemed by the same blood of God made man. The pride of birth, station, and quality was crushed. They made it their business to relieve the miserable. The pagans admired their brotherly love we have seen above a thousand and fifty widows and impotent persons maintained by the liberality of the roman church under cornelius we have seen the active charity of the archdeacon laurentius in finding out and assisting miserable objects punished with a fiery death the very spirit and taste of christians with the frugality and simplicity of their lives and manners enabled them abundantly to help the necessitous while the rest of the world persecuted and philosophers themselves dependent on the great and looking on the poor as nothing reasoned against them o god of all grace whose tender mercies are over all thy works this must be thy religion which humbled and sweetened the hearts of men which taught them practically to regard all men as brethren and no delight in doing good to all without distinction of persons but the most singularly striking characteristic of this people has not yet been noticed though they had a regular polity guarded by great strictness of discipline distinguished into a number of communities each administered by a bishop presbyters and deacons and concentrated by general councils held from time to time they neither had nor strove to obtain the least secular support of any kind they lay exposed to the rage of the whole world around them incited by its natural enmity against god and love of sin and finding itself condemned by these upstarts as deservedly obnoxious to the divine displeasure the whole roman world embraced thousands of discordant sects and parties 
These all tolerated one another because all agreed to treat sin with lenity and to allow one another's religion to be right on the whole. It was impossible for Christians to do this, hence the spirit of persecution was excited, and whoever at this day lives in the same sincere hostility against all sin and in the exercises of the same charity, patience and heavenly mindedness as they did, will, undesignedly yet unquestionably, excite the wrath of the rest of mankind, just in the same manner. But how precarious their state in society was, on this account, is evident. They had not the least legal or secular aid against persecution. Obliged, like the rest of the subjects of the Roman Empire, to contribute to the general defence and to serve in the Roman armies when called on, as much as others, they had no civil privileges. If an emperor chose to persecute, they were perfectly defenceless and had no political resource against oppression. What could be the reason of this? Shall we say their circumstances were, during the first three hundred years, too low and their means too weak to encourage them to attempt anything of this kind? This has been said by those who are not willing to allow that their passiveness under injuries proceeded from principle. But suppose now that they thought it right to resist the powers that be, and those who resist do not receive to themselves damnation, but merit the tribute of applause for supporting the natural rights of man, then, as no people on earth were ever more unjustly treated, they would naturally feel their injuries as other men do, and admitting them too weak and inconsiderable in the first century to have attempted anything, surely in the second, and much more in the third, their thousands and tens of thousands must have been capable of shaking the foundations of the empire. So far from being without means, they seem to have much greater than many who have disturbed the repose of kingdoms. Here is imperium in imperio, a regular, well-united phalanx of men, inured to frugal habits and a variety of hardships, not a mere mob of levellers, but men taught to obey their religious governors, and submitting to great strictness of discipline. Among their governors, if history had not informed us so, we are sure there must have been some men of genius, fortitude and capacity, who already had exercised their talents in the art of government, and possessed that eloquence which inflames the passions of the lower sort. Cyprian of Carthage is undoubtedly one of these. The same courage, capacity, discretion and activity which made him an oracle over half the Roman Empire among Christians, would, had it been exerted in a military line, have been formidable to the throne of the Caesars. Their brethren in the Roman armies might have taught them military discipline. The riches which a number of them possessed might have purchased arms and military stores. Those captive bishops who gained so strong an ascendant over the ignorant, barbarous nations might have easily effected an alliance between them and those of the Christian name. The reader sees the consequence. I do not say they would have prevailed in the end. Nothing is more uncertain than the issue of war. But supposing them to have thought resistance lawful, amidst the distractions of the Roman Empire from within and from without, they had both temptations and probabilities sufficiently strong to have excited a rebellion, such as any other people would have done who in knowledge and civilization were not inferior to those among whom they lived. The conclusion seems undeniable. If a set of men are very unjustly treated, have probable means of redressing themselves by force, and think it lawful to use those means, they will do so, of course. On the contrary, it appears not from a few passages here and there only, but from the whole tenor of their writings, and, what is still more, from their uniform practice, without a single exception, that they thought it unchristian to seek this mode of relief. Patience and prayer and charity were their only arms. Nor do you find a single instance of a Christian intermeddling with the politics of his time. Must we not then say that they understood the rules laid down in the thirteenth chapter to the Romans, and other parts of the New Testament, in literal manner? That they thought it wrong to revenge injuries, public as well as private, and referred themselves wholly to him who hath said, Vengeance is mine? I believe we have no other alternative. This was the sum of Christian politics, and in this light what an advantage this spirit proved to them, in making them feel themselves strangers and pilgrims on earth, in causing them to long for the heavenly state, in deadening their affections to the world, and in exercising them in faith and charity, is not hard to conceive, and whenever real Christians in our times shall more fully emancipate themselves from the ambitious notions with which the present habits and prejudices of men infect them, and through divine grace catch the spirit of the primitive believers in this point, they will then see a beauty in the New Testament principles on this subject, of which they have now little idea. 
the love of the world will cease so strongly to entangle them, and primitive, apostolic faith and practice may again visit the earth in its genuine simplicity. The monastic spirit, I have already observed, had begun to appear during the Decian persecution. About the year 270 lived Anthony the Egyptian, the first founder of these communities. Athanasius has written his life. A modern, who is sensible of ancient fashionable absurdities and insensible of present ones, would be tempted to think that he must have been a very weak person who could write it without considering that posterity, quick-sighted to the follies of our age, may be under the same temptation to judge in the same manner of great men in our times. In truth, Athanasius was a man of solid sense and capacity, but these are no defence against modish errors, and unhappily the monkish superstition was growing into high admiration. Anthony, it seems, perverting a few texts of scripture, took upon him to live in solitude. His austerities were excessive, and ridiculous stories are told of his contests with the devil, not worth reading. Only I see in them a dangerous spirit of self-righteousness, pride and vainglory, by which this same Anthony was encouraged in his progress, and which will lead a man very far in external shows of holiness, while there is little of the reality. It is probable that his life, as it is recorded by Athanasius, might, as superstition grew more and more reputable, appear admirable in the eyes of many much better men than Anthony himself. We shall leave Anthony still alive, propagating the monastic spirit and extending its influence not only into the next century but for many ages after, and conclude this view of the state of the third century with expressing our regret that the faith and love of the gospel received, towards the close of it, a dreadful blow from the encouragement of this unchristian practice. End of chapter 20《Chapter 21 of The History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Testimonies to the Church of Christ from its enemies. The fastidious indifference, at least, if not the virulent enmity shown to the gospel by the great men of Greece and Rome during the three first centuries, leaves one little reason to expect much account of Christians through the channel of their writings. A few cursory, sarcastic, and ill-informed reflections are all that can be found, in our days, concerning more modern revivals and propagation of evangelical truth and godliness in writers of polite estimation. Something, however, of this sort is to be gleaned up, which may throw some light on the state of religion in the second and third centuries. One writer, indeed, Celsus, particularly in the extracts of him preserved by Origen, will show us perhaps more than all the rest put together. Dr. Lardner has established abundantly in this point for the purpose of establishing the general credibility of the gospel. My views in throwing together a few quotations must be for a different purpose, to illustrate the character of real Christians and point out some of the effects of the work of the Holy Spirit upon them. Lardner's collections will, however, be serviceable to my plan as well as to his own. In the former part of the second century flourished the Stoic philosopher Epictetus. Arian has published his discourses. In one passage he occasionally speaks of, quote, the Galileans as indifferent to sufferings from madness or from habit, end quote. These Galileans are obviously Christians. From what cause they were indifferent to sufferings we shall be willing to learn from those who better understand the subject. Indeed, they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods because they knew in themselves that they had in heaven a better and enduring substance. Christian faith and hope afford motives truly deserving a better name than madness or habit. But the fact is attested by this prejudiced philosopher that Christians were then exposed to singular sufferings, and that they bore them with a composure and serenity so astonishing that philosophers knew not how to account for their patience. Strengthened they were indeed with might by the glorious power of their God to all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. In the same century... Apuleius, a ludicrous author, in his Metamorphosis, speaks of a baker, a good sort of man, troubled with a bad wife, possessed of every vice, perverse, a drunkard, lewd, a follower of vain observances, who pretended that the deity was only one. I suppose Apuleius would not have noticed her other crimes, had she not been guilty of this last. See the difference which Christianity has made in the world. Through Europe, the character of any man's understanding would be much impeached at present, who should seriously assert the plurality of gods. 
The belief in the divine unity is, by a polite author of the second century, classed with an assemblage of vices. What have you been doing, philosophers, that you never could rid mankind of polytheism, which every philosopher now despises? But let the philosopher know that God has effected this by the gospel. This baker's wife is evidently a Christian, therefore loaded with reproaches probably unjust. Her husband is as plainly a pagan, therefore a good sort of man, as the world generally allows its followers to be. If he were of the world, the world would love you as its own. The extracts from Celsus, who wrote in the latter end of the second century, preserved in Origen's work against him, are very valuable in the light which I have stated. Take a few of them, and consider what may justly be inferred from them concerning the nature of the gospel, and the characters of its professors. I shall select a few, partly from my own observations, and partly as Dr. Lardner has given us them in his collections. A particular reference to each of them will be needless. The reader must be prepared to hear bitter things. A more spiteful calumniator hardly ever existed, but he may serve a purpose which he never intended. Quote, if they say, do not examine, and the like, in their usual manner, it is, however, incumbent on them to teach what those things are which they assert, and whence they are derived. Wisdom in life is a bad thing, but folly is good. Christ was privately educated and served for hire in Egypt, got acquainted with miraculous arts there, returned, and for those miracles declared himself God. The apostles were infamous men, publicans, and abandoned mariners. Why should you, when an infant, be carried into Egypt, lest you should be murdered? God should not fear being put to death. You say that God was sent to sinners, but why not to those who were free from sin? What harm is it not to have sinned? You encourage sinners because you are not able to persuade any really good men, therefore you open the doors to the most wicked and abandoned. Some of them say, Do not examine, but believe, and thy faith shall save thee. These are our institutions, speaking of Christians with a sneer. Let not any man of learning come here, nor any wise man, nor any man of prudence, for these things are reckoned evil by us, but whoever is unlearned, ignorant, and silly, let him come without fear. Thus they own that they can gain only the foolish, the vulgar, the stupid slaves, women, and children. They who conversed with him when alive, and heard his voice, and followed him as their master, when they saw him under punishment and dying, were so far from dying with him, or for him, or being induced to despise sufferings, that they denied that they were his disciples, but now you die with him. He had no reason to fear any mortal now after he died, and, as you say, he was a god. He persuaded only twelve abandoned sailors and publicans, and did not persuade even all these. At first, when they were but few, they agreed, but when they became a multitude, they were rent again and again, and each will have their own factions, for factious spirits they had from the beginning. They are now so split into different sects that they have only the name left them in common. All wise men are excluded from the doctrine of their faith. They call to it only fools and men of a servile spirit. End quote. He frequently upbraids Christians for reckoning him who had a mortal body to be God, and looking on themselves as pious on that account. Quote, the preachers of their divine word only attempt to persuade fools, mean and senseless persons, slaves, women, and children. What harm can there be in being learned, well informed, and both in being and appearing a man of knowledge? What obstacle can this be to the knowledge of God? Must it not be an advantage? We see these itinerants showing readily their tricks to the vulgar, but not approaching the assemblies of wise men, nor daring there to show themselves, but wherever they see boys, a crowd of slaves or ignorant men, there they thrust in themselves and show off their doctrine. You may see weavers, tailors, and fullers, illiterate and rustic men in their houses, but not daring to utter a word before persons of age, experience, and respectability, but when they get hold of boys privately, and silly women, they recount wonderful things, that they must not mind their fathers or their tutors, but obey them, as their fathers and guardians are quite ignorant and in the dark, but themselves alone have the true wisdom." and if the children obey them, they pronounce them happy, and direct them to leave their fathers and tutors, and go with the women and their playfellows into the chambers of the females, or into a tailor's or fuller's shop, that they may learn perfection. 
In other mysteries, the crier uses to say, whoever has clean hands and a good conscience and a good life, let him come in. But let us hear whom they call. Whoever is a sinner, a fool, an infant, a lost wretch, the kingdom of God will receive him. An unjust man, if he humble himself for his crimes, God will receive him. But a just man, who has proceeded in a course of virtue from the beginning, if he look up to him, he will not be received. End quote. He compares a Christian doctor to a quack who promises to heal the sick on the condition that they keep from intelligent practitioners lest his ignorance be detected. Quote, you will hear them, though differing so widely from one another and abusing one another so foully, making that boast, the world is crucified to me and I to the world. The same things are better said by the Greeks and without the imperious denunciation of God or the Son of God. If one sort introduce one doctrine, another, another, and all join in saying, Believe, if you would be saved, or depart. What are they to do who desire really to be saved? Are they to determine by the throw of a dice? Where are they to turn themselves, or whom to believe? Do you not see that any man that will may carry you away and crucify you and your demon? As you say, the Son of God gives you no help. End quote. But enough of Celsus. He would not deserve a moment's attention were it not for the light which he throws on the history of the Christians of his own times, that is, of the second century. It appears evident that there was then a singular sort of persons subject to all manner of ill treatment from the rest of the world, and who might be hunted down at pleasure by violence or by calumny. Celsus insults them on account of their defenceless condition. Had they resisted evil with evil, his malignity would have taught him to reproach their turbulence and seditiousness. Undoubtedly, then, they were a meek, quiet, peaceable, inoffensive people. It appears also that they worshipped a person named Jesus, who had been crucified at Jerusalem and worshipped him as God, and Celsus derides their folly on that account. In his view of things, that the same person should be both God and man was the greatest inconsistency. Their doctrine concerning Christ appears to him foolish beyond measure, fit only for the understanding of fools, and beneath the regard of wise men." Even from his loose and sarcastic views of it, one may conclude that they laid great stress on faith, that the exercise of it was connected with salvation, but that this exercise in its whole nature was contrary to all that was esteemed wise and great in the world. It was also a great stumbling block to Celsus that men the most wicked and abandoned might be saved by faith in Jesus, and that men's confidence in moral virtues was a bar to their salvation, nor does it appear that the number of converts among the wise or great was large. The lower ranks of men were best disposed to receive it, and the bulk of Christian professors consisted of these. From these premises, with a careful study of the sacred volume, any man, possessed of a humble spirit, may see what the religion was which Celsus so vehemently reprobates. It could not be the doctrine of common morality. He owns indeed they taught this, though he says that the philosophers taught it better, one may appeal to any person almost at this day, whether Christian morals are not immensely superior to anything that is to be learned from Plato, Tully, or Seneca. It has been the fashion to extol the moral part of Scripture, I fear with an insidious eye to the doctrinal. What that was in Celsus's days, he himself in a measure tells us, quote, Christ crucified, the living and true God, the only saviour of sinful men, the necessity of renouncing our own wisdom and righteousness, salvation through believing alone, dependence on our supposed goodness, ruinous and fatal, end quote. It is certain that moral doctrine, had that been the main part of the Christian scheme, would not so much have provoked the enmity of Celsus. The peculiar doctrines of the gospel, man's fallen state, justification by Jesus Christ alone, divine illumination and influence, these which excite the ill will of man by nature now as much as then, these were plainly the doctrines which occasioned such misrepresentation and abuse as that we have seen. If the reader were to dip into some controversial pamphlets published against the revival of godliness in our own times, he would see a strong conformity of taste and sentiment between Celsus and many who call themselves Christian pastors. Circumstances vary, the dresses of religious profession will alter in the world's course of things, the undiscerning will be thence liable to form a wrong estimate but there is no new thing under the sun. That which in our times has been derided as enthusiasm was thus treated in the second century, and he who pleases may see in England the same sort of persons living by the faith of the Son of God, derided by persons of the same stamp as Celsus. 
and I add to the remarks made on him by others, as giving a good testimony to the miracles and facts of the gospel, that he testifies also the work of the Spirit of God in his day, and shows us what sort of doctrine was preached and professed by Christians at that time. Lucian of Samosata was a contemporary of Celsus. He has already been mentioned as throwing considerable light on the history of Christians in the story of Peregrinus. The delusion into which this hypocritical Christian was suffered to fall after his apostasy deserves to be noticed as a warning to those who use the name of Jesus for a cloak to sinister pursuits. He publicly burned himself in the sight of all Greece soon after the Olympic Games were over. He did it to gain himself a name, and he had his reward. Heathen authors speak honourably of him. The lustre of his philosophic life and ostentatious suicide expatiated, in the eyes of men of this world, the guilt and infamy of his juvenile profession of the gospel. A statue was erected to him at Parium in Mysia, which was supposed to be oracular. The depth of iniquity in a Christian view may seem the perfection of virtue in a philosophical. The Lord seeth not as man seeth. Lucian tells us also of one Alexander, a false prophet, who deluded mankind by oracular falsehoods. Some Epicureans detected and exposed his fallacies, which made him declare that Pontus was full of atheists and Christians who had the assurance to raise slanderous stories against him. And he excited the people to drive them away with stones. He appointed mysterious rites like those of Athens, and on the same day of the solemnity, proclamation was made as at Athens. Quote, if any Epicurean... Christian or atheist, be come hither as a spy upon these mysteries, let him depart with all speed, and a happy initiation to those who believe in God. End quote. Then they thrust the people away, he going before and saying, Away with the Christians. Then the multitude cried out again, Away with the Epicureans. We see here again that there is nothing new under the sun. A fervent or artful supporter of old pagan superstitions finds himself opposed by two sorts of people, the most opposite to one another possible. Epicurean sceptics, men of no religious principle, and Christian believers. It is so at this day. A Christian and a sceptic would unite to discountenance papal superstitions, but how different a spirit, the one with compassion and gravity, the other with carelessness and levity, and with how different a design, the former to establish the true worship of God, the latter to support universal profaneness. The author Lucian himself was an Epicurean, as full of wit as of profaneness, his dialogues abound in sarcastic insinuations against the fashionable idolatry. He did not know that he was cooperating with Christians in subverting the abominations which had subsisted for so many ages. His writings were doubtless of use in this respect, and who knows how serviceable, under God, the present fashionable spirit of depreciating and lowering popery may be to the general establishment of Christianity, though nothing be farther from the thoughts of those political sceptics who are engaged in it. There is a dialogue called Philopatris, ascribed to Lucian, but probably written by some other person somewhat later. Doubtless it is of high antiquity. It ridicules the doctrine of the Trinity. Quote, 1331, the Most High God, Son of the Father, the Spirit proceeding from the Father. End quote. Such are the expressions in the dialogue. He speaks also of a quote, beggarly, sorrowful company of people. End quote. He insinuates their disaffection to government that they wished for bad news and delighted in public calamities. Some of them fasted ten whole days without eating, and they spent whole nights in singing hymns. Who does not see in all this the language of an enemy describing men of holy lives and mortified affections worshipping the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and elevated in their desires and spirit above the world, that is, real Christians? Aristides the Sophist another contemporary of Celsus, speaks with indignation against some persons of his day, whom he observes in manners to be not unlike the impious people in Palestine, for they acknowledge not the gods, they differ from the Greeks and all good men, dexterous in subverting houses and disturbing families, contributing nothing to public festivals but dwelling in corners, they are wonderfully wise. Thus, when men are out of humour with any persons, they compare them to Christians, who were thus made the off-scouring of all things. Their singular abstinence from all reigning vices and follies, and their steady adherence to the worship of the living God, appears from hence, and we have here an additional testimony to the strength of the divine operations on their minds. Much about the same time, Galen, the famous physician, gave testimony to the firmness and perseverance of Christians. 
Quote, it is easier, says he, to convince the disciples of Moses and Christ than physicians and philosophers who are addicted to particular sects, end quote, so that their fortitude or obstinacy was proverbial at that time, and they were a people then well known in the world. Plotinus was one of the most celebrated disciples of the new Platonic school in this century, the genius of which, as formed by Ammonius, has been before described. He had studied under Ammonius, and by the strength of his parts, the multiplicity of his literary acquisitions, and the gravity of his manners, attained a very high reputation in the world. He imitated Socrates in his pretensions to a communion with a devil, and was by his disciples looked on as something celestial. Persons of the greatest quality revered him. The emperor Galenius himself was once on the point of giving him a ruined city in Campania, in which he might settle a platonic republic. The man seems, to his dying day, to have supported his philosophic reveries. Quote, I am still in expectation, says he, as he was just dying, and that which is divine in us I am endeavouring to rejoin to the divine part of the universe. End quote. Undoubtedly, he alluded to the idea of, quote, God being the soul of the universe, end quote, that pantheistic compound of pride and atheistic absurdity, which was the proper creed of most of the ancient philosophers, and was even more impious than all the fables of vulgar paganism. The oracle of Apollo, we are told, after his death, informed his admirers that his soul was there in the Elysian fields with Plato and Pythagoras, such were the artifices by which Satan and his human followers endeavoured to raise up rivals to the Christians. In a work professedly illustrating the operations of the Spirit of God, it seems proper to notice the contrasts, or rather the counterfeits, by which the Spirit of Falsehood endeavoured to support the declining cause of idolatry. Its vulgar and gross scenes were in part abandoned, and a more refined habit was given to it by philosophy, pretending to wisdom and virtue in a high degree, but holiness it could not produce, because humility and the faith of Jesus were not there. Pride was its dominant feature, and while thousands found, even in this life, the salutary benefits of Christianity, philosophers prated concerning virtue and did nothing either for the honour of God or the good of mankind. One of the most studious and laborious disciples of Plotinus was Amelius. It is evident from a passage of Eusebius that he made attempts to unite something of Christianity with Platonism, just as we have seen Origen, who was of the same school, mix something of the latter with the former, to the great prejudice of the gospel. Quote, this was the word, says he, by whom, he being himself eternal, were made all things that are, the same whom the barbarian affirms to have been in the place and dignity of a principle, and to be with God, and to be God, by whom all things were made, and in whom everything that was made has its life and being, who, descending into body and putting on flesh, took the form of man, though he even then gave proof of the majesty of his nature, nay, and after his dissolution he was deified again, and is God, the same he was before he descended into body and flesh and man. End quote. This may be called no mean testimony to St. John's Gospel, for he is doubtless the barbarian here mentioned. The ideas of Christianity, it seems, in some loose ambiguous manner, were admitted by these philosophers, and incorporated into their system, just as a modern Swedenborg, a Rousseau, and a Bolingbroke are not unwilling to ennoble their compositions with some sublime Christian sentiments, confusedly understood, while yet they stand aloof from the society of Christians as no better than barbarians, and make not, in their own case, the least approach to the faith and love of Jesus. Thus Longinus, also, a scholar of the same school and well acquainted with Plotinus, has enriched his treatise on the sublime with a quotation from the first chapter of Genesis, and calls Moses a man of no mean character. A fragment of his also, which has been preserved, and which I see no reason to doubt the authenticity, speaks of Paul of Tarsus as one of the first orators, who, he observes, was the first supporter of a doctrine not demonstrated. The passage seems to carry internal proofs of its genuineness. It has been said that it has been forged by some Christian, but why should any Christian be charged with a crime on mere presumption? What temptation could there be for it? Against a mere fancy, in addition to the authority of the manuscript of the Gospels from which the passage was taken, I shall venture to place the character of Longinus himself, a judicious critic, if ever there was one in the world, very capable of seeing the beauties of St. Paul's compositions by the excellency of his taste, of confessing them from the candour of his temper, 
and of overlooking what ought principally to have fixed his attention from his entire indifference to religion. I may add also that the style is exactly like his, rather nervous than elegant. We see hence how well Christians were known in the third century, what respect their doctrine even then obtained in the world from those who could not bear the thought of embracing it for themselves. Porphyry is the last unwilling witness for Christians whom I shall mention within the third century. Indeed, there is a work bearing his name, entitled The Philosophy of Oracles, which appears to have been written in the time of Constantine, or after the civil establishment of Christianity. There are in it very strong testimonies in favour of the gospel. But as its date is evidently beyond the period before us, the consideration of it properly belongs to the history of the next century. This man was born at Tyre in Phoenicia, was a scholar of Plotinus, and, like the rest of that school, maintained a gravity of manners and entered vigorously into Platonic refinements, but in acrimony against Christians he far exceeded them all. He took much pains to overturn the gospel, and it must be confessed his learning and acuteness were considerable. The very few fragments extant of his works give one indeed no great opportunity to judge of the extent of his capacity or of the depth of his judgment, but from the serious pains taken by the ancient Christians to confute him we may conclude that his abilities were of a far higher order than those of Celsus. In a passage preserved by Eusebius, he censures the famous origin for leaving Gentilism and embracing the barbarian temerity, that is, the gospel. That he is wrong in the fact is certain. Origen was brought up under Christian parents, but I had almost said he deserved the reproach for paying such extravagant respect to the enemies of Christianity. Porphyry allows him to have been a great proficient in philosophy and says that he was very conversant with Plato, Longinus, and the works of the Pythagoreans and Stoics, that he learnt from these the allegorical method of explaining the Greek mysteries, and by forced interpretations, inconsistent in themselves and unsuitable to those writings, applied it to the Jewish scriptures. Fas est et aposte doceri. The fanciful mode of origin in interpreting scripture is here justly condemned by Porphyry. The Ammonian scheme is allowed here by him to be unsuitable to those writings. Origen was wrong in making such attempts. Let the word of God stand simple and alone, and let philosophers be left to their own inventions. The enmity of Porphyry is not abated by the complacence of philosophizing Christians, and their concessions make no converts to evangelical truth. His objections to the book of Daniel, though they show him a strong but ineffectual adversary to Christianity, fall not within our design. The same may be said of various cavils which he uttered against many passages in the Gospels, a sufficient specimen of which spirit we have seen in Celsus. The same ingenuity and malevolence failed him not in forming plausible objections, wherever he seemed to have an opportunity. The censure which St. Paul, in the epistle to the Galatians, has left upon St. Peter, engaged his attention, and induced him, from an occasional difference between the apostles, to form an argument against the whole of their religion. I have had opportunity above to give my thoughts on the subject. I may add here that the very clear testimony which St. Peter gives to the inspired character of St. Paul, towards the conclusion of his second epistle, at the same time that it demonstrates the harmony of the apostles, reminds one of the fairest monuments of St. Peter's humility and candor. These things appear as so many testimonies to the character of Christians from enemies. Surely truth and wisdom and goodness may well be presumed to be with those whom their adversaries assault with such frivolous objections. On account of an epidemical disorder raging in a certain city, Porphyry observes, quote, Men wonder now that distempers have seized the city so many years, Escapulus and the other gods no longer dwelling among them, for since Jesus was honoured, no one has received any public benefit from the gods. End quote. What a testimony is this to the great progress of Christianity in his day? Malevolence confesses while she complains. Quote, Matrons and women, says Porphyry, compose their senate, they rule in the churches, and the priestly order is disposed of according to their good pleasure. End quote. The falsity of this is notorious, but the testimony here given by the mouth of an enemy to the piety of women is perfectly agreeable to the accounts of the New Testament and the history of all revivals of godliness in every age, in none of which women had the government, in all, by their piety, a great personal concern. There is neither male nor female, but ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Quote, if Christ be the way of salvation, the truth and the life, 
and they only who believe in him shall be saved, what became of the men who lived before his coming. End quote. The reader has often heard similar objections made in our days. The Christians preached then the same doctrine of salvation only by Christ, which is now stigmatized as uncharitable. The same may be said of the everlasting punishment of unbelievers. One passage more shall close the subject of Porphyry. Quote, a person asked Apollo how to make his wife relinquish Christianity. It is easier, perhaps, replied the oracle, to write on water or to fly into the air than to reclaim her, leave her in her folly, to him, in a faint, mournful voice, the dead God who publicly suffered death from judges of singular wisdom. End quote. This is a story told by Porphyry, a memorable testimony of the constancy of Christians. It appears also that they were accustomed to worship Jesus as God, and that they were not ashamed of this, notwithstanding the ignominy of his cross. The testimony given here, to the wisdom of Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate, will not so readily be admitted. The enemies of vital godliness in our days may see from these testimonies laid together that their ancient brethren, in infidelity, have been beforehand with them in all their most material objections, what was the doctrine, spirit, and conduct of real Christians appears from their testimony, and the work of the Spirit of God on the hearts of men, in attaching them to Jesus and in divorcing them from all that the world delights in, is as evident as the malignity of our apostate nature in hating and opposing it. End of chapter 21《Chapter 22 of the History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Connection between the Doctrine and Practice of Primitive Christians. I am sensible that many parts of the foregoing history will appear very reprehensible to some in point of candor. Why such solicitude to prove men Trinitarians in opinion? Why so strict an eye kept up all along on the doctrines commonly called evangelical by certain persons? What signify opinions if men's practice be right? Why is not all the stress of commendation laid on holiness of life, integrity, and charity? The language is specious, but is chargeable with this notion that it supposes that there is no real connection between doctrine and practice. It must not be admitted by a Christian, however fashionable the sentiment be, that one sort of opinions is as good as another with respect to influence on the practice. The scripture connects sanctification with belief of the truth. Our Lord himself prays that his disciples may be sanctified through the truth. The blood of Christ purges the conscience from dead works to serve the living God, and a right faith in Jesus overcomes the world. St. John challenges men to prove that they can overcome the world by any other way, and in the chapter now alluded to, he is very particular in describing what that faith is. In fine, Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. If this zeal for good works be the effect of his redemption, it should be conceived that persons who disbelieve the doctrines essentially concerned in his redemption can possibly have any good zeal for good works, unless it be supposed that men should be able to attain a certain end without the use of, and even with an aversion to, the means which God has appointed for that purpose. The peculiar doctrines of the gospel are original sin, justification by the grace of Jesus Christ, his Godhead and atonement, the divinity and efficacious influences of the Holy Ghost. We appeal to the scriptures for the proof of this assertion. If it cannot be proven from thence, let it be considered as not proved at all, the tradition of the church, were it more uniform than it is, can never sufficiently demonstrate it. But it surely should move the minds of those who in our times oppose these doctrines with all their might, to observe that these doctrines have been held from the primitive times by men allowed to be the wisest and most upright. They may well be incited to allow some doubts whether their own sentiments be right, and to grant that a zeal for these doctrines may deserve a better name than mere speculative religion, when the scripture itself declares its connection with practice, and the history of Christian antiquity exemplifies that connection. It is submitted to the consideration of the reader whether these reflections do not sufficiently answer the objection with respect to candor. Two things have been shown to have uniformly obtained during the three first centuries. First, that there were all along a number of persons bearing the Christian name, whose lives proved them to be the excellent of the earth and secondly, that as far as appears, the character of genuine virtue belonged exclusively to men who espoused the peculiar doctrines of the gospel. 
from the Apostles down to Ignatius, Polycarp, and Irenaeus, to the age of Origen, both these assertions are demonstrable by the clearest evidence. Origen alone, of all persons of superior reputation in the Church, has been suspected as deficient in point of orthodoxy. Were these suspicions swelled into a certain proof, the discredit which his philosophic mixtures have brought on his character and the censures which so many wise and good men have so freely passed on him, as unsound in the faith, would rather prove our assertion of the uniformity of Christian belief in these articles than the contrary. But that Origen, on the whole, believed these doctrines is sufficiently proved by express passages of his works, and his well-known, curious, and adventurous spirit of inquiry, in subjects in which he never meant to be positive, will account for his ambiguities. I cannot allow Dionysius of Alexandria to be an exception to my position merely because he was once suspected of being heretical. His well-known explanation of himself sufficiently confutes the surmise. The Cyprianic age is full of the most luminous proofs. Even the treatise of Novation, the first dissenter on the Trinity, is itself a strong argument. An elaborate and minute treatise on a subject written by an innovator, against whom I have freely owned the best men of those times were much too censorious, would doubtless have been branded with peculiar infamy in the Church, had it contained any sentiments contrary to the apostolical faith. Its deviation from truth would have been marked with peculiar asperity, but it is universally allowed that the Novations held the same doctrines as the general church, and differed only in point of discipline. What greater proof can be desired than such an uniformity? Perhaps the case of Paul of Samosata may illustrate the subject still more forcibly. A bishop was, by the concurrent voice of the whole Christian church, degraded and expelled because he opposed these doctrines. The excellent lives of men of orthodox views are evident in these times of true godliness. I cannot see any proofs of such excellence in other persons who call themselves Christians. I know the scantiness of historical materials. I can make some allowance for the prejudices of writers, and none but the orthodox of those times have come down to us. But it seems impossible to reject the repeated testimony of such a man as Irenaeus to the wickedness of heretics. Paul of Samosata is well known, and men of real holiness and virtue can scarce be entirely hid in any age in which they exist. We have been told indeed great things of Ebionites, and they have been set up as the true standard of primitive orthodoxy, but it seems scarce possible for any man of learning who has a disposition to examine things fairly and candidly to lay any weight on such an opinion. Who is this Ebion? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? What if it can be proved that he and his party believed exactly as some persons do who call themselves rational Christians at this day, and thought as they did of Christ himself, of St. Paul, and of all Christian doctrines? Is an obscure person to be made a standard of doctrine, of whom we know only a few lines, and whose very existence is but faintly proved, and whose sect, though it certainly had an early existence, was condemned by all Christian churches and even by Origen himself as heretical? It is certain that the Ebionites, in not receiving St. Paul's epistles, as Origen tells us, acted consistently. But what are we to think of men who rejected thirteen epistles of the New Testament, of whose divine authority there never was any doubt among Christians? And though the epistle to the Hebrews has proofs of divine inspiration abundantly sufficient, yet were one to admit for a moment that it was only the work of some pious person of very high antiquity in the Church, and held in very great estimation, who that weighs things in the balance of truth would not admit its authority vastly to exceed that of the Ebionites. In a regular argumentative treatise backed by the concurrent voice of the Old and New Testament, we see certain doctrines enlarged on abundantly, which, by an obscure sect, of whom we know next to nothing, are barely denied. Is affirmation to stand good in preference to reasoning? It is allowed that in weighing historical evidence, the concurrent voice of the best writers ought to stand good against the single testimony of particular persons. It is on this ground that the testimony of Ctesias on Persian affairs is looked on as romantic. The account of the death of Cyrus, as slain by Tomorus, the Scythian queen, has no credit because of the superior credibility of Xenophon, and he would be thought a weak critic in his history who should in our days assert that Charlemagne, with all his peerage, fell by Fontarabia. Milton, as a poet, may be allowed to say this on the evidence of romances, but sober history, which asserts in general the contrary, must be believed. 
on such weak ground seems to me to stand the authority of the Ebionites in matters of Christian doctrine. But perhaps the reader may see the force of these things in a stronger, at least a more useful light, if we attend a little to the nature of things. Sentiments, when really and thoroughly imbibed, cannot be destitute of practical influence. If there be a favourite point in Scripture, it is the recommendation of humility. The humble, with all their imperfections, must be admitted into heaven, the proud, with all the virtue compatible with pride, must be excluded. Those doctrines, therefore, which support humility must be divine, those which nourish pride must be earthly or even diabolical. Now the evangelical doctrines just mentioned are all of the former sort. The more they are relished and admired, the more do they direct the mind to honour God, to feel even infinite obligation to Him, to entertain the lowest ideas of ourselves, to confound the pride of intellect, of riches, of virtue, of everything human, to sing salvation to God and to the Lamb, to confess our desert of destruction and to ascribe our deliverance from it to the atoning blood, this is the employment of heaven. The taste and temper adapted to it must be formed here on earth by grace, and the whole work of the Spirit, which we have seen exemplified in three centuries, is to produce and support these dispositions. And in the words and actions of holy men we have seen this effect, they believed heartily the truth of doctrines the most humiliating. They were poor in spirit, patient under the severest treatment and the most cruel injuries, because they were conscious of deserving much worse, contented in the meanest circumstances, because they felt the beauty of his condescension, who, though he was rich, became poor for their sakes, and who has provided for them sure and eternal riches. They were serene and confident in God, because they viewed him as their father through the grace of Christ, full of charity because they knew the love of God in Christ, in honour preferring others to themselves because they were ever conscious of their own depravity. In fine, they gladly endured reproach for Christ's sake because they knew his kingdom was not of this world. Now take from these men the peculiar doctrines of the gospel and all the motives and springs of Christian action within them are annihilated. Morals may remain and whatever is reputable in social life, but that which is properly of a pious and humble nature is no more. For whoever feels himself daily to be helpless, corrupt, and unworthy, whose hope of divine favour cannot exist for a moment, but under the belief of a most stupendous grace, who is compelled to pray by the voice of constant internal necessity, and who experiences the answer of prayer by repeated supernatural aids, must be induced to the constant exercise of humble thoughts with respect to himself, and of grateful thoughts with respect to his Maker. It is easy to see what a foundation is laid for meekness, gentleness, modesty, submission to the will of God, and of genuine compassion for the most wicked and most injurious, he himself being a child of wrath by nature, as well as they. Nor is there a virtue for which the primitive Christians were so renowned, but it may be traced up to these principles. It has been said, indeed, that the sense of gratitude to God may be as strong in the minds of those who think better of human nature in its present state, because they must own they are indebted to God for their natural powers and faculties. But the very feelings of our nature contradict the position. Something like humility may be produced, where men are every moment sensible of their dependent condition by experience. Not so, where men admit it in general theory, but are not led by experience to an habitual sense of it. One might ask whether a parent would expect to find a more grateful conduct in his children if made completely independent, or well supplied indeed, but kept continually sensible of dependence on himself. The influence of anti-evangelical doctrines on the practice is but too evident. Those who espouse them, if preserved in rectitude of moral conduct, are among ourselves at this day the proudest of men. Even when they attempt to be humble, the power of pride breaks forth and bears down all before it. They feel sufficient for anything, no subject of religion is too hard for their understandings, in all disputable questions they are sure to decide in that way which most gratifies vainglory and self-conceit. The ministers of this stamp, however low and limited in capacity and education, are continually exercising the most unbounded and often the most ridiculous arrogance. They are apt to wonder that the common people have no ears for them. They do not consider that they themselves have no voice for the people. The views of God, of Christ, and human nature which they exhibit suit not the vulgar taste. They contradict experience, and it is not to be wondered at that those of their hearers who have any reasonable modesty and the least tincture of humility cannot relish their discourses because the only food which is adapted to the taste of a miserable sinner is not ministered to them. Deserted by the populace, they betake themselves to the great. 
the favour of a few of the higher rank, compensates to them the want of regard from the multitude, and if they cannot boast of numerous congregations, they console themselves at least with the thought that theirs are genteel. Politics, the affairs of nations, the reformation of states, these are to them the grand scenes which agitate their passions. To instruct ministers of states is their ambition, to bring souls to Christ is left to those whom they deem enthusiasts, nor does any pathos appear in any of their writings and orations, except in the support of civil liberty, a valuable subject indeed, but with them ever carried to excess, and even when treated in its best manner, belonging rather to statesmen than divines. Whoever has observed these men may see them evidently haughty, overbearing, impatient of contradiction, men of all others the least fitted to suffer persecution for the cross of Christ, though exceedingly prone to enlarge on the iniquity of it, and arrogantly boasting of the sincerity of their religion, in an age when they are not likely to undergo any fiery trial that may be the test of it. Are these the Christians of the three first centuries? Were they such men as these whom Celsus scorned? No, surely. If they were, their worldly ambitious spirit might easily have found some of the many pretenders to the Roman Empire with whom they might have united. We should have seen Christians active in politics, bargaining with different competitors for the empire, and insisting on some communication of temporal powers and privileges to themselves. Men so void of heavenly ambition would have displayed that which is of the earth, and had Ebion's religious sentiments been then as prevalent as now, the humble, meek, charitable, passive Christians would not have adorned the historic page, but the turbulent, aspiring political sons of Arius and Sosinus would have been the predominant characters in the foregoing narrative. End of chapter 22 End of the History of the Church of Christ, Century 3 by Joseph Milner